Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour. Gunsmoke, brought to you by L and M Filters. This is it. L and M is best. Stands out from all the rest. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful. And a little lonely. <laughs> Bell? Yes? I'm Jim Buck. I'm driving the stage from here on into Dodge. Oh. What happened to the other driver? I always spell him here. He told me to look out for you. Oh, that's kind of him. And kind of you, too. You're awful young to be traveling alone. I'm 17. Well, now I take it back. Are we about ready to leave? As soon as I get the other passenger away from that bar over there. They told me I'd be alone on the rest of the trip. Well, miss, I don't know this fella. Says his name's Bassett. But if he's drunk, I promise you he ain't riding. How do you expect anybody to ride sober <laughs> hey, if you're driving, Jim? Marshal Dillon, what are you doing in Pawnee? Oh, I had some business up this way, but I'd sure like to get back to Dodge. Uh, you got any room? Sure have. Oh, uh, this here's Marshal Dillon, Miss Bell. How do you do, Marshal? Miss Bell? It's Linda. <laughs> All right, Linda. Uh, when are you leaving, Jim? Soon's I round up that Bassett fella. Well, get him, whoever he is. Huh? And drive easy, will you, Jim? I wore out a horse getting this far, and I sure need some sleep. I'm glad you're riding with us, Marshal. I don't like the looks of that fella Bassett. But you two climb in now. We'll pull out of here in five minutes. <laughs> sleep. Oh, I am, huh? And I'm pretty tired. Well, that's too bad. Now, it's going to be a long ride, so why don't you just sit there and look out the window, huh? Because <laughs> I'd rather look at this 
pretty little girl here. Now, come on, honey. Have a drink. No, I... Hey, Jim. Uh, Jim, pull up, will you? What for? You heard me. Pull up. Okay, Marshal. Pull up. What do you think you're doing? What's your trouble, Marshal? There's no trouble. Your friend Bassett here wants to ride up on the box with you. What? He wants somebody to talk to, Jim. Are you crazy? He's waiting for you, Bassett. I'm staying where I am. You're holding us up. Now you get moving. All right. I will. You're like you broke my arm. You should have left your gun where it was. All right, now get outside. Hurry it up. I'm going. But you're going to wish you'd never seen me. I'm wishing that already. Give me a hand, driver. I'm sorry for the delay, Linda. No, it was worth it, though. Maybe now we can both get a little sleep, huh? Well, I can certainly yeah. use... What'd you say? I said I can certainly use some. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I feel as though I hadn't slept since I left St. Louis. Oh, you come a long way, huh? Oh, it'll be worth it once I reach Dodge. How's that so? I'm meeting my fiancé there, Marshal. Oh, well, maybe I know him. Oh, he hasn't been there long. His name's Lou Paxson. Lou Paxson, huh? Yeah, well, what does he do? Well, I don't really know. I met him in St. Louis. It was only for a few days. Uh Uh-huh. I see. Marshal. What? What? If you promise to keep it a secret, I'll tell you something. Okay, I promise. I ran away from home. My parents think I'm too young to get married. Oh? Well, how old are you, Linda? Seventeen. Do you think that's too young? Well, I don't know, Linda. I guess that depends on what you're like and what this fellow Paxson's like. Oh, oh, he's a wonderful man. He's so strong and so handsome. Uh Uh-huh. You'll see when you meet him. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it will. Marshal? Yeah. Are there a lot of men in Dodge like that man, Bassett? Oh, why do you ask, Linda? Well, he frightens me. He's not going to forget what you did to him just now. Oh, well, you let me worry about Bassett, huh? I don't like him. Well, I don't like him either, but uh, why don't we forget about him and try to get a little sleep, huh? This is it, L&M filters, it stands out from all the rest. Miracle tip, much more flavor, L&M's got everything. It's the best. Yes, L&M's got everything. Superior filtration, superior taste, superior filtration because of L&M's superior filter. White, all white, pure white. The purest tip that ever touched your lips. Superior taste because of l and superior tobaccos. Tasty, full of flavor, and light, and mild. No doubt about it, l and is America's best filter tip cigarette. This is it, l and filters. l and has got everything. It's the best. Oh, 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 oh. 
find him, all right. You want me to give you a hand? Yes, thank you. Okay. There we go. Hello, Mr. Dillon. Oh, hello, Chester. Oh, Linda, this is Chester Proudfoot. How do you do, Chester? How do you do, Miss... Uh, it's Linda Bell, Chester, but she likes it simple. Oh, you look good. There he is, Marshal. There he is. Huh? No. No. Linda. Hey, how come she knows him? Why, do you? Yes, sir, Lou. Oh, Linda. Oh, Lou, I made it, and I never thought I would. Oh, I knew you would. No, oh, it might have been bad, too, except for Marshal Dillon here. Oh, you're Marshal Dillon. Yeah, that's right. Lou, it was that man right over there. He was what? trying to make me drink with him and everything. You, you... Which man? He's coming this way. Him. Marshal? Where? His name's Bassett, Lou. He was annoying me. Don't you worry about him, Lynn. Ah, so this is who the little girl was coming to see. She's my fiancée. Well, I'll be darned. I mean, she didn't say she was coming here to get married. Well, it's true. Sure. What do you want, Bassett? Uh, you got my gun in your belt. You aim to steal it? Hey, you aim to sell it? What do you mean by that? You look like a gunman to me. Where are you from? Wichita. Now, what are you going to do about that? Here, catch it. <laughs> You didn't have to throw it at me. And I wanted to see how you handled it. You move pretty fast when you're sober. What are you prodding me for, Marshal? You aim to stay here long? No. Not long. Good. And while you are here, I'm going to be watching you. That won't bother me. Well, well, Marshal, uh... I got to thank you for taking care of Linda. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Now, I don't know who that Bassett fella is, but he shouldn't have been bothering her. No, that's right. Well, come on, Linda, we'll get your stuff. They got a room for you over to the Dodge house. All right, Lou. Marshal, I, I hope I'll see you again. You too, Chester. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Linda. We, we'll see you. So long, Linda. Bye. Come on, Linda. My, that Paxson acts kind of funny, don't he? He's trying to hide something, Chester. He is? Yeah, he and Bassett didn't handle that very well. What do you mean? They know each other. You think so? Yeah, it was pretty clear. But they don't want anybody to know it. Well, why? What do you know about Lou Paxson, Chester? Nothing. I just seen him around. Uh-huh. Any idea what his game is? No, sir. I don't, none at all. Well, maybe we'll find out now. I expect he's just been waiting for Bassett to get here. Something it seems a lot longer than that to me. <laughs> I also heard what happened on the stage. Oh, uh -huh. you did? Yeah. Linda told me. Linda? Now, how come you know her? She's sitting right over there. What? Well, it kind of surprised me, too. But Paxson brought her in this afternoon and made Sam give her a job. Sam didn't like the idea much. She's only 17, Matt. Yeah, I know, Kitty. What's this Paxson up to, anyway? Well, I don't know, and I don't care. But you got to get that girl out of here. This is a terrible place for her. That's not my affair, Kitty. Since you're the only one that can do it, it is your affair. Oh, now, Kitty, I, I can't interfere in a thing like this. Why? Because nobody's stolen anything or killed anybody? Because there's no law against it? 
Is that why? Uh, no, that isn't the why, but... Uh... But nothing. You know what can happen to that little girl. Look at her, Matt. She's scared half to death right now. You wait till midnight. Wait till it starts to get really rough in here. You know what some of these horn-handed, drunken, wild men are likely to do? You can't let it happen, Matt. You gotta get her out of here, and if you're any kind of a man at all, you'll do it right now. Well? Well, Kitty, I... All right, ask her to come over here, huh? Sometimes I get a feeling that maybe you're not all bad, Matt Dillon. Yeah, I'll bring it back. Here we are. Ah, oh, hello, Linda. Kitty said you wanted to see me, Marshall. Yeah, that's right. Uh, sit down, won't you? All right. You don't have to be scared of the marshal, Linda. Oh, I'm not really. But, well, tonight I feel scared of everybody. Uh, then why do you stay here, Linda? Lou says I've got to. Why? He says it's to keep me out of the way. Oh? Uh-huh. Out of the way of what? I don't know. But if I'm here, he knows where I am and he can always come to find me. But I don't like it here, Marshal. I'm not used to men like these. Linda, I want you to go back to your room, and I want you to stay there. Oh, I can't, Marshal. Lou'd get angry. You don't have to tell him about it. But he'll find out. He'll find out, all right, Linda. As soon as I explain things to Sam here, he'll find out from me. At the end of the hall. There goes that fellow Bassett. Yeah. I didn't know he had a room here. Well, that could be Paxson's room he came out of. Number 12, ain't it? By golly, you're right, it is. Now, listen here, I... Oh. I thought it was someone else. Bassett's gone, Paxson. What do you want, Marshal? I want to talk to you. Oh. What about? Why did you pretend you didn't know Bassett at the stage this morning? I don't know him. Well, he just walked out of your room. I mean, I didn't know him. I didn't know him this morning. You're lying. Now, Bassett's a gunman, Paxson. What's your business with him? I got no business with him, Marshal. We were talking, is all. Uh huh. About how much are you going to pay him? I got nothing to do with him, I tell you. All right. Now, I don't know who you're after, but this time I'm going to stop the trouble before it starts. Chester, hmm? when's the next stage leave? Uh, n- not till the day after tomorrow, Mr. Dillon. But there's a Santa Fe out in the morning. I'll be there to see that you're on it, no, Jackson. No, I can't leave, Mar. Marshal, you've got no right to make these. You're leave. leaving, and you're leaving alone. What? A man who'll put an innocent 17-year-old girl to work in the Long Branch isn't going to keep her if I can stop it. I got her out of there, Paxton, and I told Sam she's not to come back. Well, I, I got... I got good reason for her being there. Oh, and what are they? Well, it's none of your business. You... Marshal, you're interfering in something. You've got no right. As far as Linda's concerned, maybe I am, but I'm doing it anyway. That you and Bassett are different. And I'm going to run him out of town tomorrow, too. You're making a mistake, Dylan. If I am, you can stop it. What's that mean? Start talking. No. Okay. Come on, Chester. Thousands of smokers who are changing to L&M every day. To the millions who now smoke L&M, here is your assurance. 
L&M gives superior filtration because of its superior filter. Superior taste because of L&M's superior tobaccos. Yes, L&M tobaccos are tasty, full of flavor, and light, and mild. And L&M's superior filter is the purest tip that ever touched your lips. It's white, all white. Truly the miracle tip, because when it's added to L&M's superior tobacco, it actually tones up the taste actually improves your enjoyment of this great cigarette. Yes, L&M's got everything. Superior taste, superior tobacco, superior filter. That's why it's America's best filter tip cigarette. Try L&M today. Oh, come in, Doc. Come on in. Said, you know, it's nearly midnight. Well, now, when did I start going to bed at midnight? Well, you should. A man needs to sleep. <laughs> then what are you doing up? <laughs> I'm looking for somebody to argue with. Well, I'm your man. Start up. Yeah. Oh. What? Sounds like somebody beat us to it. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Uh, that came from right down the street. Down by the Alpha Gans. Yeah, it sounded like it. Over here, Chester. What happened, Chester? Lou Paxson. They shot him. He went into the back room at the Alifaganza wearing a mask and carrying a gun in his hand, but they shot him before he could run off with any money. He didn't even try to shoot back. Oh, is he hurt bad, Chester? I, I don't know, Doc. I didn't wait to see. Well, I'll go see that he's taken up to my office. Give him a hand, Chester. Yes, I'll come up there in a few minutes. Well, where are you going? Now, there's a man across the street I want to have a little talk with. Where? Oh. Bassett. Yeah, that's right. Evening, Marshal. What are you doing here, Bassett? Watching. Watching for what? Not for anything. Just watching. You working with Lou Paxson? Why? He just got shot. Dead? Why don't you go find out? Hmm. Ain't nothing to me, Marshal. You know, Bassett, I was going to run you out of town tomorrow, but now I think I'll keep you around till I find out what this is all about. I ain't done a thing. And you're not going to because I'm going to lock you up right now. I've never been in jail in my life, Marshal. A lot of men haven't, even men like you. But you're going now. No. No, I ain't. You leave your gun alone. Then get out of here and leave me alone. There's been one shooting already. That's enough. Now I'll take your gun, Bassett. Not likely. <laughs> He missed you. He was in too much of a hurry, Chester. Is he dead? He died standing. I knew there'd be trouble. I just had to wait and see what happened. Go get Linda and bring her up to docks, will you? Yes, sir. How is he, Doc? He's not good, man. One bullet in the neck, another in the chest. I'm sorry, Paxson. There isn't much I can do for you. No. No, I can't live this way. Not for long. Paxson, Chester's gone for Linda. She'll be here directly. Yeah, poor little girl. 
How did you expect to hold up the Alafraganza like that? Was Bassett supposed to help you? Him? No. He was just waiting for the money. What? I'll tell you, it don't matter. It's what he come here for. We robbed a stage up north. And I run off and I spent the money in St. Louis. And he followed me here. He found me. And no wonder you didn't want to tell me what it was all about. He said he was going to hurt Linda if I didn't get the money. So I figured she was safer where there was a crowd around. Bassett's dead, Paxson. Is he? So am I. Just a moment. gone, Matt. Oh, that's probably Linda. You better keep her out of here. Yeah. Uh, Chester, wait in there, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, what are you going to tell her, Matt? I'm going to tell her the truth, Doc. The whole story. Oh, that would be awful hard on her, wouldn't it? Finding out what kind of a man Paxson was. No, you could spare her that. Linda got off easy, Doc. Married to an outlaw, she'd have been in real trouble. But all this won't do her any good at all if I don't send her home a lot smarter than she left. And that's what I'm going to do. And now our star, William Conrad. Thank you, George. You know what I like about L&M's is they're mild and mighty easy on the draw. When you get right down to it, no filter stacks up with L&M's pure white miracle tip for quality or effectiveness. Darn good smoke. See for yourself. l and M stands out from all the rest. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Eleanor Tannen, Vic Perrin, Lawrence Dobkin, and Paul Dubois. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Put a smile in your smoking. Next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember, only Chesterfield is made the modern way with Accuray. This amazing quality detective electronically checks and controls the making of your Chesterfield, giving a uniformity and smoking quality never possible before. For the first time, you get a perfect smoke column from end to end. From the first puff, to the last puff. Chesterfield smokes smoother. Chesterfield smokes cooler. Chesterfield is best for you. Next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember, Chesterfield is made the modern way with Accuray. Put a smile in your smoking, just give them a try. Light up a Chesterfield, they satisfy. Remember, listen again next week for another transcribed story of the Western Frontier. It's America growing west in the 1870s. It's Gunsmoke, brought to you by L&M Filters.
Gunsmoke. Brought to you by L&M Filters. Make today your big red letter day. Change to L&M. Superior taste. Superior filter. America's best filter tip cigarette. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Don't you open the door? Maybe you'll find out, Chester. I never heard of nobody knocking on this door before. It's Major Harris, Mr. Dillon, from Fort Dodge. Uh, come in, Major. Marshal Dillon. Sit down, sit down. I'll stand, thanks. Marshal, last Saturday, two United States Army soldiers were murdered while driving a supply wagon from here to Fort Dodge. The government payroll was stolen. And you seem to have taken no interest whatsoever in the matter. Well, now, Major, protecting the Army isn't exactly my job. The Army can protect itself, Marshal. Then how come there were only two soldiers carrying your payroll? Where was the rest of your Army? On maneuvers. On maneuvers? In my command, troops remain in garrison as little as possible. And you were asking for trouble, Major, knowing there was a payroll coming in. Marshal, the arrival of the payroll was secret. Even the two men carrying it didn't know what it was. Somebody knew. Yes, they did. Marshal, I regard this crime as a demonstration of your inability to control these Dodge City ruffians. What? I mean it. And if no arrests are made in the matter, I'll give these bad men of yours a taste of martial law. We'll see how they like that. Now, wait a minute, this Major. This town will be patrolled 24 hours a day. Look, Major, you don't know these men. You run the army in here and they'll fight. There'll be trouble. Bad trouble. They brought it on themselves. No. You made a mistake and you've got to find somebody to blame it on. I want whoever committed those murders. And I want that money, Marshal, within a week. And if any more crimes are committed against the Army meantime, we'll take this town over at once. Good day, gentlemen. Hello, Matt. Evening, Kitty. Marshal Dillon, Jenny. Matt, this is Jenny Lane. Ah, how do you do, Jenny? Pleased to meet you, Marshal. Sit down, Matt. Ah. You're new in Dodge, aren't you, Jenny? Oh, I've been here most of a month now. Oh, she's only been working at the Long Branch about a week, Matt. Ah, how do you like it? Fine, but I'm kind of worried now. Oh? It's this Army business everybody's talking about. Will it be bad, Marshal? Yeah, it could be. You think it'll happen? Might, especially if there's any more trouble. Say, Jenny... Has your corporal been in? Yeah, he was, earlier. Well, how do the soldiers feel about all this? Huh, well, he says they sure aren't anxious to mix it with all these gunmen and buffalo hunters and the like. Huh. But he's not my corporal, Kitty. He's just a lonely kid. Huh, he's not so lonely. He spends more time here than he does at the fort. How does he manage it, anyway? Well, they made him a clerk, a sort of a bookkeeper. His time's pretty much his own. Well, he's lucky. Good, safe job, too. Yeah, I suppose it is. Well, I, I better get busy. I'm glad to have met you, Marshal. Glad to have met you, Jenny. I'll see you again. Sure. Nice girl. Mm-hmm. Where's she from, Kitty? Uh, Hayes City, last. Huh. 
What, uh, what's the name of this corporal who's been sniffing around? Stark. Corporal Stark's all I ever heard. Now, what else do you know about Jenny, huh? Oh, she doesn't talk much about herself, man. Well, uh, maybe you can get her to, huh? All right. I'll try. Meantime, I'm going to wire the sheriff in Hayes City. He might know something. You must have some reason for all this interest, Matt. No, I haven't, Kitty. But I might find a reason for him through. Today, your big red letter day, your L and M red letter day, superior taste and filter. It's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day. Change to L and M today. L and M's got everything. Superior taste and superior filter. Get L and M today. This is it. L and M superior taste and filter. Superior taste from tobaccos especially selected for filter smoking. Tobaccos that are richer, tastier. Light and mild. And L&M's superior filter is white, pure white. Truly the miracle tip, because when it's added to L&M tobaccos, it actually improves your enjoyment of this great cigarette. Next time you buy cigarettes, look for the big red letters L&M. Smoke L&M filters, America's best filter tip cigarette. L&M's got everything, get L&M today. I got it, Mr. Dillon. Just come in. Oh, what? Uh, the answer to that telegraph you sent to Hayes City last night. Oh? Uh-huh. Here. Oh, uh-huh. thanks. I don't know what it says or anything. Yeah. Jenny Lane left Hayes about a month ago with a stranger called Nate Brand. Nothing against girl, but believe Brand a wild one. Regards, Clint Adams. Never heard of no Nate Brand. No, neither have I. What's she doing? Hiding him somewhere? Oh, uh, Matt. Yeah, what is it, Doc? Trouble. Oh, what kind of trouble? A shooting. Out behind the Texas Trail. What? It's bad, Matt. It's real bad. Well, the shooting's always bad, Doc. Yes, but this one's going to lead to a lot more shooting. Somebody just killed a soldier. <laughs> There's no crowd around here. There isn't a man in sight. No. Uh, Who told you about this, Doc? The bartender. He said he heard a shot and went out back and found him. He sure looks dead, all right. He's dead. Is that all the bartender had to say? That's about all. Except that when he went back into the saloon and told everybody there about it, they, they didn't move a hair. Well, I guess maybe they was thinking about the army taking over Dodge. Yes, Why didn't the bartender come to me first? Well, I don't know, Matt, but I've got the feeling that maybe nobody knows whether you're going to be on their side or, or the army's. Yeah, they never do trust me, do they? Chester. Yes, sir? Give Doc a hand here. I'm riding out to Fort Dodge. <laughs> Hello, Major. What brings you to Fort Dodge, Marshal? Murder. What? Murder. A soldier? Uh Uh-huh. Who? I don't know. Some private. Dodge City, of course. That's right. Have you arrested the murderer? Nobody saw it happen, Major. I see. Well, Marshal, you leave me no choice. Wait a minute, Major. I didn't ride out here just to bring you the news. I want something from you. 
from me. I want you to keep all the soldiers out of Dodge for the next 48 hours. Put it off limits. That's not exactly what I had in mind. Listen, Major, Dodge City's an armed camp. It's full of men who fought Indians, who fought the war between the states, who fought each other ever since they could spit. They'll fight you next. They'll make you hate it. They can't fight the army. They can and they will. And a lot of men will die on both sides. But I'll make you a deal, Major. A deal? You give me 48 hours and I'll find your killers. You better take it. Because it'll get you out of a lot of trouble. All right. But I want the criminals delivered here. To me. Sure. But I might have to kill them to get them here. Matt! Oh, Matt! Ah, hello, Doc. I've been waiting for you to get back. Oh, anything more happened? Not yet, but I found a letter on that soldier. His name was Ravitch. Oh, anything else? Yes. I dug the bullet out of him, Matt. And you know something? I haven't seen lead like that since I mustered out in 65. Oh, what do you mean, Doc? That soldier was shot with a cavalry pistol. He was? I'd swear to it. Thanks, Doc. I'll see you later. Well, well now, well, where are you going? Into the long branch. I want to talk to a friend of mine. I've been expecting you, Matt. Oh, uh, have you, Kitty? Chester was in a while ago. He told me about that telegram from Hay City. Look, Kitty, i got to work fast. There's going to be a war around here soon. I found out a couple of interesting things, Matt. One is Jenny's been seen riding horseback at night towards the Arkansas down by Brandy Bend. Oh? It might have something to do with that man she left Hay City with, Nate Brand. Yeah. I think he's hiding out down near Brandy Bend. Any idea why? Corporal Stark and Jenny went for a ride one night. When was that? The night before that army payroll was robbed. Uh -huh. Where's Jenny now, Kitty? Over at Delmonico's having supper. Kitty. What? I'm the only one who can ever thank you for it, but uh, <laughs> I think you just saved an awful lot of lives. Evening, Jenny. Well, hello, Marshal. Won't you sit down? You uh, sure Corporal Stark won't mind? <laughs> Don't be silly. Besides, he's out at the fort. Now, when did you see him last? Oh, about noon, I guess. Uh-huh. Anybody with him? Private Ravitch. Uh, Corporal Stark didn't shoot him, Marshal. They were good friends. They worked together in the bookkeeping office. I see. That's a pretty good job, isn't it? Handling expenses... Figuring out the payroll, things like that. Oh, I, I don't know. He never talked about it much. Also, he'd be in a good spot to know when to expect payroll money in, wouldn't he? Even when it was kept secret? You'd have to ask him, Marshal. But, uh... <laughs> this isn't why you found me here, is it? <laughs> no, of course not, Jenny. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you look, uh, real pretty tonight. <laughs> well, thank you, Marshal. You really mean that? Sure. Right? Sure, I mean it. Uh, Marshal, I have to work late tonight, but uh, I can get off tomorrow. I know it's bold of me, but couldn't we uh, maybe take a ride together? There'll be a moon. Oh, uh, where would we ride to, Jenny? Oh, I don't know. Anywhere. Maybe down along the Arkansas. I know. Let's ride down toward Brandy Bend. All right, Jenny. We'll ride down toward Brandy Bend. Make today your big red letter day, your L and M red letter day. Superior taste and filter, it's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day. Change to L and M today. L and M's got everything. Superior taste and superior filter. Get L and M today. 
This is it. L&M, superior taste and filter. Superior taste from tobaccos especially selected for filter smoking. Tobaccos that are richer, tastier, light and mild. And L&M's superior filter is white, pure white. Truly the miracle tip, because when it's added to L&M tobaccos, it actually improves your enjoyment of this great cigarette. Next time you buy cigarettes, look for the big red letters L&M. Smoke L&M filters. America's best filter tip cigarette. L&M's got everything. Get L&M today. The idea of a moonlight ride by the river with as pretty a girl as Jenny Lane was fine. Except that it was going to end with a man dead. Either me or her friend, Nate Brand. She was obviously leading me into an ambush. And there wasn't a thing I could do but go cheerfully along. I met her the next night. We started out. But a mile or so before we got to Brandy Bend, I pulled up and suggested we dismount and let the horses blow a little. They won't run away, will they? The horses? No. Now, don't worry. Ah, here's a good place to sit. What's the matter? You nervous, Jenny? No. No, of course not. Ah, sit down. Take it easy, then. All right. This better? Sure. Yeah, it's a nice night, isn't it? Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> You're not even looking at it. Is something on your mind, Jenny? No. Why should there be? Why, you tell me. That's nothing, Marshal. Really. Let me ask you something, Jenny. Did you ever see a man killed? What? Why'd you say that? What, did you? Yeah, once in the saloon. Uh, tell me, did he uh, have a fair chance? Of course, he even drew first. Then you never saw a man shot in the back or uh, ambushed, huh? What are you driving at, Marshal? Oh, I'm just thinking about people, Jenny. Like, sometimes a person isn't really bad. He just falls into bad company. What's that got to do with me? And I think it sort of goes against your grain, the idea of a man being killed without a fair chance. Why'd you come with me, Marshal? Uh, somebody had to. I suppose you know about everything. I think Private Ravage got killed by Corporal Stark because he found out about the payroll deal between you and Stark and Nate Brand. Sure. Well, what are you going to do now? I'm going to ride to Brandy Bend with you. But why? Because I'm gambling that you're still decent enough inside to let me have that fair chance I was talking about. That's quite a gamble, Marshal. Yeah. But we'll ride slow. And you'll have a little time to think about it. <laughs> Make a nice camp down here. Plenty of wood. Get your water right out of the river there. It's real nice, don't you think, Jenny? Man could hide out real easy down here. Marshal. I could be safe here, even while the army was trying to move into Dodge, and a lot of men were being killed over it. Yeah, it's real peaceful down here. Marshal, I can't do it. All right, tell me, Jenny. That big cottonwood up ahead. On the left. Okay. Now, keep moving. When we get close, I'm going to ride ahead fast. You stay back out of gunfire. All right. Yeah, it sure is pretty down here, Jenny. Maybe someday we can come down and go fishing, huh? Oh, this river's full of catfish. You ever eat a real catfish dinner? That can be mighty good if we're small enough. All right, stay back, Jenny. Jenny! 
He's dead, Jenny. Oh, God, no. I had to do it. I know. I'll be all right, Marshal. Sure. He killed your horse. I'll show you where he hid his and the payroll money. Okay, Jenny. Then you can take me back to jail. Yeah. But there's one thing, Jenny. What you did tonight's going to get you out of jail real soon. Because I'm going to see you get your chance, too. And now our star, William Conrad. I'm telling you, the day you changed to L&M... Well, that's the day. Your big red letter day. No filter stacks up with L&M's pure white miracle tip. And I know you'll go for L&M's taste. Superior taste you get from L&M's superior tobaccos. Richer, tastier tobaccos. Next time, look for those big red letters on the L&M pack. <laughs> Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Ray Kemper. Featured in the cast were Virginia Christine and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. If you want tomorrow's better cigarette today, next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember, only Chesterfield is made the modern way with Accuray. You'll notice how fresh and good Chesterfield's made with Accuray taste, how smooth they are, and how they satisfy. So buy Chesterfield today. Smoother, cooler, best for you. Recently, many of your cards and letters have requested an evening time for Gunsmoke Radio. In response to these requests, the makers of Chesterfield and L&M Filters will now also bring you Gunsmoke every Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So now you can take your choice and hear Gunsmoke transcribed at the time that is most convenient, either on Sunday evenings or Saturday at this time. And remember... The makers of Chesterfield and L&M Filters also present Gunsmoke for your enjoyment on television. Tonight, watch an entirely different Gunsmoke show on the CBS Television Network. Check your local TV listings for time and channel. Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield, made the modern way with Accuray, smoother, cooler, best for you. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Guns.
Smoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Chester? Chester? Good evening, Miss Kitty. Well, you were going straight to the bar without even saying hello. Well, I figured you was kindly busy. <laughs> oh, I'm busy telling Andy here about Dodge. Andy, this is Chester Proudfoot. He's one of the people you ought to know. This is Andy Hill, Chester. I Pleased do. to meet you, Chester. Well, sit down. Sit down. Thank you. Chester works for Marshal Dillon, Andy. Well, that ought to be a good job. Oh, it's a fine job. If you like long hours and poor pay. <laughs> <laughs> he spends quite a few of those long hours sitting around the depot waiting for the Santa Fe to come in, Andy. <laughs> well, I just so Mr. Dillon will know where I'm at if he wants me for anything. Uh, Kitty. Yeah, sure. Your name, Kitty? I'm busy, mister. He told me your name. Now I'm going to buy you a drink. Come on over the bar. Back to your hogs, mister. You're spoiling the air. I'll have no talk from a woman of your kind. <laughs> All right, you get out of here, mister. Get out. You putting me out? You ain't even armed. Well, I'll find me a gun quick enough. Hey, mister. How about me? I'm armed. You're too young to be wearing a gun. Take it off. You do it. You take it off. I sure will. From there. You want to die, don't you? No. No. I don't want anybody to die. Now, you get out of here. I'm going to put a bullet in you. You can't do it, mister. Don't try it. I'll show you. I told him he couldn't do it. Wait. You killed him, Andy. He was looking for a fight. I don't even know who he is. I've never seen him before. Oh, there's Matt. Who? Marshal Dillon, Andy. Oh. Did you kill this man? I did it. It was self-defense, Matt. Andy had to shoot him. That's the truth, Mr. Dillon. If that man was treating Miss Kitty awful bad, and I didn't have no gun, and Andy stood up to him. Get some help and carry him out of here, Chester. Yes, sir. Uh, a couple of you men, give me a hand here. Kitty, let's step over here. Yeah. You and Andy, is it? Andy Hill, Marshal. You should have seen it, Matt. That man had his gun almost out before Andy even started to draw. So you're pretty fast, huh, Andy? I'm alive. Where are you from? I told you my name. It don't matter where I'm from. What are you doing in Dodge? Marshal, I come here looking for a job, an honest job. He told me the same thing, Matt. I believe him. Why would I be lying? Well, the way Kitty described it, you're mighty handy with a gun for a man who's looking for an honest job. All right, I'll move on. I wouldn't have a chance here with you against me. Matt. Don't worry about it, Miss Kitty. I'll make out someplace else. Wait a minute, Andy. Yeah? Go over to the stage office. That's for Jim Buck. What for? He's a driver. He's looking for a man to ride shotgun. Tell him I sent you. Thanks, Marshal. I'll go over right away. So long. You see, Matt? He did mean it. Yeah, he wants a job, all right. But he's hiding something, Kitty. When a man hides something, that's usually bad. But I got a feeling about him, Matt. I think he's all right. Well, I hope so, Kitty. Won't be so good if I've recommended an outlaw to protect the sage. Put a smile in your smoking. It's as easy as ABC. Because Chesterfields made with Accuray are A. Always milder. B. Better tasting. C. Cooler smoking. Yes, a Chesterfield is always milder. That's because Accuray controls your Chesterfield in the making. 
gives it a more even distribution of fine tobaccos that burn more evenly, smoke much milder. A Chesterfield is better tasting. That's because an Accuray Chesterfield draws more easily, lets you enjoy all the wonderful flavor. And a Chesterfield is cooler smoking. 14% more perfectly packed than cigarettes made without Accuray. You enjoy cooler smoking pleasure. No hot spots. No hard draw. So the next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember, an Accuray Chesterfield is A, always milder. B, better tasting. C, cooler smoking. Put a smile in your smoking, just give them a try. Chesterfield's best for you. They satisfy. I didn't see Andy again that night, but I ran into Jim Buck. And he told me that he'd hired him and that they were leaving for Hayes City the next morning. It was two days before they were due back, before I'd find out if I'd made a mistake or not. And I waited. In the evening they were due, I was over at the stage office. Of course, the stage was late, over an hour late. But it finally came. And Andy was up on the box next to Jim. They pulled up, and Jim jumped down and ran over to me. Marshal, Marshal, you arrest him. Arrest who? Andy Hill, that's who. If I hadn't heard how good he is with a gun, I'd have taken him myself. I'd have shot him dead. Now, wait a minute, Jim. What's the trouble? He's mad at me, Marshal. Mad at you? You ought to be tarred and feathered. Why don't one of you tell me what this is all about? We was held up, Marshal. Held up by heaven, and this so-called shotgun man sat there like an owl on a rafter. Sat there and didn't nut. Is that true, Andy? Why well, kill a man for nothing, Marshal? For nothing? The treasure box was empty and we carried no passengers this trip. He didn't get a thing. You didn't know that box was empty till I told you afterwards. I knew it before we left Hayes City, Jim. I figured I ought to know what I was guarding, so I found out. Sure. And for all I know, you was in cahoots with that bandit. Maybe you and him were partners. There's no proof of that, Jim. Well, I ain't hiring a man who won't fight. You're fired, Andy. I never want to see you again. I'm sorry, Marshal. I guess I've disappointed you. Because you didn't want to kill a man for nothing. That's right. There uh, wasn't any other reason, was there, Andy? You think I was in on it, too? I didn't say that. Good night, Marshal. Andy. Andy. Yeah, maybe I did make a mistake. <laughs> I wasn't sure about Andy that night, but the next few days changed my mind again. He went all over town looking for a job. He tried everybody and everything, but nothing came of it. And finally, I heard that he got discouraged and quit trying. I had a long talk with Jim Buck, and at the end, he said he was sorry he'd lost his temper. But he still wouldn't rehire Andy. And that was that. Until one night about a week later, Doc and I were having a beer over at the Texas trailer. From what I've seen of him, Matt, Andy's got a lot of pride. Maybe too much pride, Doc. No, he's young. He's feeling his blood. <laughs> oh, my, we were all like that once. Now, there's more to it than that. Well, what? I don't know, Doc. Andy doesn't talk much. Especially to me. Well, maybe he doesn't trust the law. Well, most people around here don't. Yep. Come on, get away from him. Oh. Now what? That's Andy. He's drunk. Who's that following him? Who is that, man? I'm trying to think, Doc. I've seen his face. Maybe it was his picture. I said I don't want to drink with you. No drink. Oh, there's going to be a fight now. Yeah, stick around, Doc. We may need you. man won't drink with Take it any way you like. Andy, I could kill you. You know, you're drunk. Try it. Hold it, Andy. Stay out of this, Marshal. He's right. You're too drunk to fight. Am I? Watch me. No. Hey. What'd you do that for, Marshal? To keep you from killing him, Carrick. Know my name? I heard Andy say it, but I don't want to hear it again. 
And I don't want to see you again. You find your horse and you ride him out of town, Carrick, and you keep on riding him. Now you get moving while you got a chance. Hmm. Now, Chester. You should have arrested him, Mr. Dillon. He started the whole trouble. Yeah, maybe. But right now, get Andy's gone and take him to jail. He can sleep it off there. Yes, sir, I will. Well, you didn't need me after all, man. Doc, that's the first time I ever turned an outlaw loose. What's that? Carrick. I saw his picture the other day on some new circlers, the law in Oklahoma Territory. I'd like to have him back. Well, then why didn't you arrest him? Andy's wanted with him. There's no picture, but I remember the description now. Carrick for murder, Andy for robbery. They were partners. You let a murderer go? No, not exactly, Doc. Carrick needs Andy for a partner. That's why he came here. And that's why he'll come back. If he comes back, you're going to have two outlaws to deal with. Yeah, maybe. But it's Andy who's going to have to decide that. He's still got a choice to make, Doc. All I'm doing is giving him the chance to make it. Why should you risk facing a pack of trouble to help a man you hardly know, man? A man who hardly knew me went out of his way once, Doc. Maybe I'm kind of paying him back. Oh. Well, I still say you... You must have a lot of faith in him. No, not a lot, Doc. Just enough to take a gamble. The next morning, it looked like a bad gamble. And he came out of his cell sullen and angry. And when I gave him his gun back, he took it and left without a word. Later, Chester reported that he'd ridden out of town. And it was several days before I heard of him again. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? Andy Hill's back in town. Oh? Jim Buck told me. Well, how does Jim Buck know? He's standing out there on the boardwalk talking to him. I went up and said hello to him, and you know what Jim told me? He's gone and hired Andy to ride shotgun for him again. He has? Yes, he has. He was kindly laughing about it. He said Andy spent most of the morning arguing him into it. Said anybody who could talk that good and that long deserved a job. <laughs> I guess he ain't mad at Andy no more, huh? Chester, Jim's bringing a shipment of gold back from Hayes City next trip. Mm hmm. You're thinking maybe Andy knows about it. Him and Carrick both. Yeah, maybe. What's that? It's a circular from Oklahoma with Carrick's picture on it and Andy's description. Oh, what are you going to do with it? I'll be back directly. Hello, Andy. What do you want, Marshal? Where's Jim Buck? He went over to the stage office. I hear you're riding shotgun for him again. Any objections, Marshal? Andy, if I had everything on my mind the way you have, I don't think I'd be friendly with the law either. What do you mean by that? Here, take a look at this. Hmm? Now, wait a minute, Andy. I didn't come to arrest you, so don't make me kill you. What? I wanted you to see that circler. I didn't think you and Carrick knew it was out. I don't understand you, Marshal. It was Carrick who held up the stage last time when you were riding shotgun. Wasn't it? It had nothing to do with me. I didn't know he was in the country. But you didn't shoot because you didn't want to kill a man for nothing, especially a former partner, huh? Okay, Marshal. I think your partner's again, Andy. I think you got this one planned. You won't take me alive, Marshal. I told you I didn't come here to arrest you. Why not? Because I think a man who wants it deserves a chance, Andy. You haven't had yours. Not yet. Well, maybe I'm wrong giving it to you, but I'm going to do it. What do you mean? The stage goes to Hayes tomorrow. 
It'll be back Thursday. I'm going to be waiting for it, Andy. Waiting real hard. Yes, put a smile in your smoking. It's as easy as ABC, because Chesterfields made with Accuray are A, always milder, B, better tasting, C, cooler smoking. Yes, a Chesterfield is always milder. That's because Accuray controls your Chesterfield in the making, gives it a more even distribution of fine tobaccos that burn more evenly, smoke much milder. A Chesterfield is better tasting. That's because an Accuray Chesterfield draws more easily. Let's you enjoy all the wonderful flavor. And a Chesterfield is cooler smoking. 14% more perfectly packed than cigarettes made without Accuray. You enjoy cooler smoking pleasure. No hot spots. No hard draw. So the next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember, an Accuray Chesterfield is A, always milder. B, better tasting. C, cooler smoking. Put a smile in your smoking, just give them a try. Should have been here an hour ago, Mr. Dillon. It's already dark. That's often late, Chester. Why does it have to be late this time? Are you worried? Yes, sir. And so are you. Well, it's like putting your whole stake on one turn of the card. Yes, sir. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. It made it. The stage made it. Yeah, the stage did, Chester. But there's no shotgun messenger. Oh, my golly, you're right. Where's Andy? Oh! Oh! Where's Andy, Jim? I don't know where he is. I ain't seen him since we got to Hayes. You mean he quit, Jim? I'd call it that. Well, did he tell you he was quitting? He told me nothing. He just disappeared. Serves me right for hiring him again. I got work to do. I guess he figured he'd get as far as Hayes without you after him, and then him and Perry could run from there. If... What are you looking at? That rider coming up the street, Chester. Leading that pack horse? It's not a pack horse. There's a body tied across the saddle, and that's Andy leading it. My golly, you're right. Now what's he gone and done? I will ask you. Hello, Marshal. Hello, Andy. That's Carrick I got there, Marshal. You kill him? I killed him. No witnesses. No way to prove who drew first. Jim Buck told me you ran off up in Hayes City. Jim might have got shot if I hadn't. Oh? Carrick was going to hold up the stage again, Marshal, and I decided not to let him do it. But I figured if I tried to fight him while I was sitting up there next to Jim, it'd go bad. So you rode back to meet Carrick alone, huh? Yeah. I left the night we got to Hayes. I found him and told him I was through for good. He got scared and went for his gun. But, like I say, I can't prove it was self-defense. Maybe I shouldn't have come back. Nobody's going to believe an outlaw. Just a... Yes, sir. Give Andy a hand with Carrick's body. I got some work to do. Where are you going? I'm going to write to the law in Oklahoma Territory. I'm going to let them know they can withdraw that wanted circular on Carrick. But what about Andy and that robbery charge? 
after I tell him how he brought in Carrick and how hard he's trying to go straight. I think they won't be too hard on him. In a moment, our star, William Conrad. If you want tomorrow's better cigarette today, next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember, only Chesterfield is made the modern way with Accuray. You'll notice how fresh and good Chesterfield's made with Accuray taste, how smooth they are, and how they satisfy. So buy Chesterfield today. Smoother, cooler, best for you. You know, on the frontier, there were all kinds. Buffalo hunters, trail drivers, spoilers, saddle bums. And there were lawmen, good and bad. Well, our story next week concerns a lawman's death. Until then, good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards, Harry Bartell, Barney Phillips, and Lawrence Tobkin. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Make today your big red letter day, your L and M red letter day. Superior taste and filter, it's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day. Change to L and M today. L and M's got everything. Superior taste and superior filter. Get L and M today. This is it. L and M. Superior taste and filter. Superior taste from richer tobaccos. Tastier, light and mild. Superior filter. It's white, pure white. Added to L&M tobaccos, this miracle tip actually improves your enjoyment. Look for the big red letters. Smoke L&M, America's best. L&M's got everything. Get L&M today. Be sure and listen to another transcribed story of the Old West on Gunsmoke. Next week at this same time. Smoke, brought to you by Chesterfield. To put a smile in your smoking, always buy Chesterfield. Made the modern way with Accuray. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, 
starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. scared me. Oh, you were concentrating mighty hard on something in that window. Uh, Mr. Jonas has some new lady's shoes on display. You see them? Oh, yeah. Those narrow, square-toed ones, Matt. Which pair do you like best, the lace or the button? Well, tell me. <laughs> well, I don't know, Kitty. They're both fine. Well, you got to decide one or the other, Oh, Matt. no, I don't have to decide either. I'm not in the market for ladies' shoes. Huh. Well, neither am I. <laughs> what? Look at those prices. Two dollars and sixty-five cents for a pair of shoes? Did you ever hear such a thing? Kitty, I only stopped to say hello, not to <laughs> argue about ladies' shoes. Well, I still think somebody ought to complain to Mr. Jonas. Well, it's not my job. I got enough trouble as it is. Well, I'm going in and tell Mr. Jonas what I think of his prices. <laughs> Have a good time, Kitty. You bet I will. Ah, oh, hello, Chester. Uh, Mr. Dillon, uh, this here is Mr. Trumbull. Uh-huh. He come over to the office looking for you. How do you do? Marshal Dillon, you're a stranger here, Mr. Trumbull? First time in Dodge, Marshal. First time. Oh, well, what do you want to see me about? I want a badge, Marshal. I want you to make me a deputy. A deputy? Now, you look here, Mr. Dillon. Never mind, Dillon. Chester. Good. What do you want to be a deputy for, Mr. Trumbull? Well, I'm leading a party of immigrants up onto the south fork of the Pawnee. Oh, uh-huh. I thought you were new to this part of the country. Well, I've got maps, Marshal. Good maps. Furnished me by the Santa Fe Railroad. You work for the railroad? No, sir. I work for these immigrants. It's like this, Marshal. I got some ten families together, and I arranged to buy five sections of railroad land for them, about 30 miles northeast of here. I made all the legal arrangements, and I'm guiding them in. I see. Uh, what's that got to do with your wanting to be deputized? Well, I thought it might be a good idea just to... In case there's any squabbling when we get there. You know, over who gets which land, that sort of thing. Uh-huh. And most parties draw straws before they ever see the land, Mr. Trumbull. Haven't yours? Well, yes. Sure, of course. Oh, then why should there be any trouble? Well, <laughs> one of the men's having a little wife trouble, Marshal. You know how it is. Well, maybe I better ride out with you. No, oh, no, that won't be necessary. Everything will probably work out fine. Yeah, sure. Uh, where are these pilgrims of yours? Well, we're in camp down by the Arkansas. We're pulling out in the morning. Well, I thank you anyway, Marshal. Goodbye, Chester. Goodbye. Well, that man sure has got a lot of gall. Yeah, he's some confused, Chester. How do you mean? He can't seem to decide if there's going to be any trouble or not. Yeah, maybe we can find out for him. Come on. This year, this easy way Give Chesterfields this year So bright and gay Wrapped and ready They're the best to buy Cartons of Chesterfields They satisfy This Christmas Give everyone Chesterfields Chesterfields are easy to give Because they come ready to give In a bright red special holiday carton That's wrapped in its own colorful Christmas ribbon Everyone enjoys Chesterfield's smoother, cooler smoking pleasure. So, to all your friends this year, say, Merry Christmas with cartons of Chesterfields. No wrapping, no tying. They're easy to give because they come ready to give. Chesterfields, in the bright red special holiday carton. Wrapped and ready, they're the best to buy. 
gardens of Chesterfields, they satisfy. Chester and I saddled up and rode down to the Arkansas. It was easy to find the immigrant camp. A dozen wagons were scattered through the cottonwoods, and there were campfires everywhere. But the people themselves were all gathered together in a big circle. We rode up to them, but nobody paid any attention to us. And then I saw why. In the middle of the circle stood two men and a woman. The men were bare to the waist and each was pressing his left forearm against the others, while the woman was binding their arms tightly together with a stout piece of cloth. In their right hands, the men held boy knives. What in the world are they up to, Mr. Dillon? Now, that's a way of fighting, Chester. Tied together like that, one of them has to die, maybe both of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you stay here with the horses. All right, sir. Will you stand aside, please? Let me through here. Huh? Make that knot tight, Sidney. Do you have to go through with this? No man messes around with my wife. He didn't mean nothing by it. We was talking, that's all. Now get out of the way, Sidney. You ready, Keppert? You're a fool, Calhoun. But I'm ready. All right, hold it, you men. Stay out of this, mister. I'm a lawman, Calhoun. I don't like this kind of fighting. Now drop those knives. Both of you. I mean it. Here's mine, Marshal. Now, right now, yours, Calhoun. Well, can't fight none of our men. All right, you, Sidney. Take one of those knives and cut them loose. All right. Next time, I'll shoot you on sight, Keppert. I told you you're a fool, Calhoun. For keeping you away from my wife? Why don't you find one of your own? Wait a minute, Calhoun. I don't want any shooting. Now, I'm warning you. 30 miles isn't far from Dodge, and I'll come take you both back to jail if I hear any more about this. Now, you get back to your own wagons. All of you get back to your wagons. The party's over. Chester! Chester! Yeah, now where did he go to? Chester! Chester, I'm coming, Mr. Dillon. Now, where have you been? No worries. No worries, huh? Well, I was only talking to a fellow over there. Huh? Now, that's Trumbull. Yes, sir. Now, what were you talking to him about? Nothing. I was just finishing a little talk we started the other day. It wasn't nothing important. Oh. Uh-huh. Are uh, you hiding something, Chester? Why, what would I be hiding? <laughs> I don't know. But I guess you'll tell me when you want to. Yes, sir. All right, let's get back to Dodge. <laughs> Chester. Yes, sir. If you have to pace the room like that, will you take your boots off? I'll sit down. You know, two days of this is about all I can stand. Yes, sir. Oh, hello, Matt. Chester. Hello, Doc. Ah, uh, Doc, I think I got a patient for you. Oh, well, now, you don't look sick to me. <laughs> no, but I'm going to be if you don't find some way to calm Chester down. He hasn't been able to sit still for two days. He has Well, well, now, what's the trouble, Chester? Nothing, Doc. I feel fine. Well, then why can't you sit still? It's sick people who have to sit still, not well ones. Hey, well, that depends on what you're sick with. I <laughs> ain't sick with nothing, I tell you. You know, Doc, I think he's got a wormy brain. Forevermore. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm trying to settle my mind up about something. Now, are you satisfied? Are you? No. I ain't got the money. I don't know where to get it. <laughs> well, just, well, money for what? For to pay Trumbull with. Now, do you owe Trumbull money, Chester? No, sir. Not yet. No, not yet. 
All right, I'll tell you. But you both got to promise not to tell nobody else about it. Trumbull says if anybody heard, I'd probably get beat out. But you'd get beat out of what, Chester? Land. Free If land. it's free, what do you need money for? For Trumbull to fix it up for me. Look, if, if I give him $50 for his trouble, he's got a way to arrange for the railroad to give me a half section of land. He showed it to me on his map the other day. I showed what to you? Yeah. Where my half section would be. <laughs> Gracious. I'll show you the thing. Ah, that's good. Now, the south fork of the Pawnee Island is like this yeah. on here. Yeah, that's right. Yes, it is. And, and these immigrants is about five sections laying right next to each other. Right about Wait here. a minute, Chester. Did you say right next to each other? Yes, sir. That's what Trumbull said. Now, my half section lays on the end here. Chester, and... come on. Come on. Ain't you interested in this? Yeah. Interested enough to ride out there. And don't worry about your $50. You're not going to need it. It was just after sunset when we hit the South Fork of the Pawnee. And a half hour later, we spotted the first immigrant wagon. A man was working nearby, trying to shape the foundation for a cabin from some red cedar he snaked up from the river. We got down and walked over to him. It was Keppert, the man Calhoun was about to fight for chasing his wife. Hello, Marshal. Hello, Keppert. Uh, this is Chester Proudfoot. Glad to know you. Well, what are you doing out here, Marshal? There ain't been no trouble. Yeah, Keppert, I'm afraid there has been. What do you mean? Hey, look yonder. That fellow coming sure is in a hurry, ain't he? That's Calhoun. He's got a rifle. I better get mine. No, you stand where you are, Keppert. Well, he might shoot me. You saw what he was like. He'll have to shoot me first. Keppert! Well, now what's the trouble, Calhoun? I'm looking for my wife, Sidney. If she was here, you'd see her, wouldn't you? Maybe she's down by the river. You can look there, too, if you want. What's the marshal doing here? He was about to tell me. And then he can tell me, too. I came here to tell all of you, but I want to ask you something first. What? Do any of you have bills of sale from the railroad for this land you're on? Uh, no. No, not yet, Marshal. Trumbull just gave us a receipt and said the railroad would send us a bill of sale. Uh-huh. But you've already paid. Sure. Each man gave Trumbull $400 for a half section. And 25 on top of that for his services. That's right. What are you asking for, Marshal? I understand these sections lie right next to each other. Huh? They do for a fact. What's wrong with that? Well, I guess you don't know it, but when the government granted land to the railroad, it only granted alternate sections. Every other one. So the railroad couldn't sell sections lying right next to each other, could it? No. No, it couldn't. Yeah. Maybe that's why Trumbull hasn't given you any bills of sale. There aren't any. He robbed us. Where is he now? I don't know. I ain't seen him since last night. Well, then I think we better start looking for him. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, what is it, Kevin? I got something to say. It's mostly to Calhoun. Oh, you two can settle your problems later. No, Marshal, we got to settle them right now. You'll see why. Now, listen to me, Calhoun. I ain't a man for much talking, there, especially about women. But the way things are, I got to say it. Say what? Your wife, Sidney. I never went near her. Never once. Now, that's a lie. No. No, it's the truth. I hate to tell you this, Calhoun, but it was her that come after me. What? I told her not to. I told her to stay away. I even said I'd show her up what she is if I had to, but I didn't do it. Not till now, I didn't. What are you saying? When did you see her last, Calhoun? At noon, when I come in for my dinner. Yeah. I saw her about two o'clock. Where? I was downriver, about a mile, sitting quiet in a clump of elder, taking a little rest. Your wife rode by on the other bank. She was headed in the direction of Dodge. She was with a man. With a man? What man? Trumbull. Smoking.
smoking with a smile with Chesterfield. Yes, put a smile in your smoking. It's as easy as ABC. Because Chesterfield's made with Accuray are A, always milder. B, better tasting. C, cooler smoking. Yes, a Chesterfield is always milder. Accuray controls your Chesterfield in the making. Gives it a more even distribution of fine tobaccos that burn more evenly. Smoke much milder. A Chesterfield is better tasting. An Accuray Chesterfield draws more easily. Let's you enjoy all the flavor. And the Chesterfield is cooler smoking. 14% more perfectly packed than cigarettes made without Accuray. You enjoy cooler smoking. No hot spots. No hard draw. So always buy Chesterfield. Put a smile in your smoking. Just give them a try. Light up a Chesterfield. They satisfy. still there, Mr. Dillon. Way past midnight, it ought to be leaving in a minute. Now run up and tell the engineer to hold it, will you, Chester? All right, sir. Marshal. Yeah? Look, coming out of the depot. It's Trumbull and my wife. Yeah, they don't see us. They ain't even looking this way. You let me take him, Marshal. No. He's rightfully no, mine. No, Calhoun. You might get excited and shoot him before he draws. I'll handle this. You two stay back out of the light. Hey, Trumbull. Marshal. Evening, ma'am. What do you want, Marshal? I want to talk to you. Don't have time. That train's about to leave. It's not going to leave. Anyway, you're not taking it. Oh. You're interfering because of Sydney here. Well, she's going with me, Marshal, and that's no business of yours. I'm arresting you for robbery, Trumbull. What? Give me your gun. No. I said give it to me. You know the way, Sidna. You killed him. You killed him. Jim! Is he dead, Marshal? Yeah. Keppard, see if he's got the money on him, huh? I sure will, Marshal. I, I, I didn't mean nothing, Jim. He, he, he made me go with him. It, was, it wasn't my fault. You believe me, don't you, Jim? I don't even want to talk to you. But it's true. I found it. Here it is, Marshal. Yeah. Should be over $4,000 there. Good. We'll count it later and give it back to everybody. Marshal. Yeah, what, Calhoun? I'd like mine now. Yeah, well, all right. Here. $425. Thanks. Sidney, take this money. What for? Take it. But why? That's all the money I got in the world. I don't figure I owe you nothing now. What are you saying, Jim? You know what I'm saying. Yeah, sure. I know. So long, Jim. Goodbye. Calhoun. What, Kevin? I got some money coming back. I'll lend you half of it. After all I've done to you. Well, can't blame you much for that. I've been a fool, Keppert. You was right. No, that's over and done. But I can't take your money. That wouldn't be right, now, would it, Marshal? Ah, you can decide about that tomorrow, Calhoun. We'll ride out and bring those other people back into Dodge. What for? So they can file for government land at the land office here. Free land. Should have done that in the first place. You know, I know of a fine section north of here that uh, I'd kind of like to file on myself. Why don't you? Well, one man couldn't handle it. It'd take two men to prove it up, you know. Two good men. Uh, 
I might show it to you sometime if uh, you're interested. moment, our star, William Conrad. Remember, friends, this Christmas, give everyone Chesterfields. Chesterfields are easy to give because they come ready to give in a bright red special holiday carton that's wrapped in its own colorful Christmas ribbon. Everyone enjoys Chesterfields' smoother, cooler smoking pleasure. So to all your friends, this year, say Merry Christmas with cartons of Chesterfields. No wrapping, no tying. They're easy to give because they come ready to give. Chesterfields, in the bright red special holiday carton. You know, there were a lot of ways for a man to die on the frontier. But on our next gun smoke, a man dies the worst way of all. Needlessly. But that was the West. Good night. <laughs> Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Vivi Janis, Vic Perrin, and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Make Christmas their red letter day, their L&M red letter day. Give them the Christmas cart and full of America's best. Yes, give L&M's on Christmas Day to friends who smoke the builder way. L&M's got everything the gift for Christmas Day. This is it. For Christmas, L&M filters and the handsome Christmas carton. No fuss with ribbons or paper. It's all wrapped and ready to give. This Christmas, give L&M Christmas cartons. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke. to you by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. 
transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Chester, you going out on a sick call? I don't usually carry my bag when I'm going for a beer. <laughs> Why, did you want something? Oh, no, no, no. I, I just thought I'd stop by. Well, you can walk with me at the stable if you want to. I'm going out to Jake Morrison's. His boy has the ague. Oh, now, ain't that a shame. Seems like everybody's getting the ague these days. Had a touch myself last week. Oh, I so? You know, most folks swear by Osgood's Caligog. But I found me some new stuff. Mm. Professor Curtis's original Mameluke liniment. Mameluke? Uh, mm-hmm. Look, it says right here on the bottle what it's good for. Uh, guaranteed to cure cramps, pains in the joints, mm-hmm. sore throat, frosted feet, mm. rheumatism, lumbago, old sores, bites of insects and reptiles, mange, salt, rheum, dysentery, diora, and cholera. Well... A regular medical arsenal all in one bottle. Hmm. And it's doing you good, is it? Well, of course, Doc. Well, then how come you're still walking around like a buffalo with ring bone? Well, maybe I still got just... Oh, a so you come to me for some free advice now, didn't you? Well, I'll just give you some free advice. Chester, stop eating all that salt pork and dried beans. What? And put some fresh greens in your stomach. Why? And stay away from the saloons for a few days. Oh, now, Doc. A little whiskey and sugar never... Oh, a little buddy, whiskey. I... Oh, and most important, take all those patent medicines you've got and use them for cleaning your boots. Oh, They're I... just the thing to kind of toughen up the leather. And as far as I'm concerned now, Chester, you can... You... What's the matter, Doc? Doc, what is it? Something about that fellow that just rode by? Yes, Chester. Well, you were staring like you seen a ghost. You go ahead, Chester. I'm going back to the office. The office? What for? To get my gun. Your gun? Why? I'm going to kill that man. more pleasure, packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. The more perfectly packed your cigarette, the more taste and mildness are released for you. Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, has an open, easy draw that unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobaccos. Now, Accuray ensures an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild yet they satisfy the most. <laughs> Dillon. Yeah, what's the trouble, Chester? You better come on out the plaza. Maybe you can stop him. I'll stop who? Doc, he's going to kill a man. Doc? Doc, yes, sir. 
He's gone and got his old army walker and strapped it to his belt, and he's marching up Front Street looking for the fellow, whoever he is. All right, let's go. I tried my best to stop him, but he wouldn't listen. Oh, you should have saw his face, Mr. Dillon. He means business. I never seen Doc like this. Who was the fellow, Chester? I never seen him before. Well, you know what it's all about? No, sir, but I do know one thing. I'd hate to have to face that old walker pistol, even if it is an old cap and ball. Why, it'd blow a hole clean through a buffalo. Nice. Oh, wait a minute. It's Kitty at the door of the long branch. She's waving. He must be down there. Yeah, come on. Matt, it's Doc. Is he in there, Kitty? Yeah, and he's got a gun. He's threatening some man. Yeah. All right, thanks, Kitty. And if you won't come outside, I'll, I'll kill you where you stand. I told you I'm not going to fight you. That's up to you. But I'm going to kill you whether you defend yourself or not. Doc. That's enough. Matt, you stay out of this. Happens to be my business, Doc, when a man threatens another man in this town. When the other man doesn't want to fight, won't defend himself, it could turn out to be murder. You think I don't know that? You must want to kill him pretty bad. I've wanted to for a lot of years. Why? I've got good reasons, Matt. But you won't tell me, huh? No. All right, what about you? I could say I don't know. But I'm just a stranger passing through town. But I know. There's no good reason for murder. I guess he thinks there is. Do you? Not many men would say yes to that, now would they, Marshal? But you won't defend yourself, huh? I won't draw with him, no. If he's going to shoot me, he'll have to take the consequences. I'm not a fighting man, Marshal. I'm a miner. Me and my partner here, we're just traveling through Dodge. We don't want any trouble. That's right, Marshal. We made our strike out in Arizona Territory, and we're headed back for St. Louis. Oh, well, we was just minding our own business, having a quiet drink when this fella comes along. What's your name? Clem Maddow. This is Ben Bartlett, my partner. And we don't want no trouble. You won't have any. Go on back to your drinks. I'm going to kill him one way or the other, Matt. And you can't stop me. Look, Doc, you're taking an awful lot for granted. Maybe you think I won't throw you in jail for threatening murder. Maybe you think because you're the town's only doctor that you can get away Matt, with... listen. No, you listen to me. You're forgetting a lot you ought to remember, Doc. For instance, your position in this town. You ought to be setting an example instead of acting like an ordinary gun hand. And more important, your responsibility... Another man's life may be his own risk, but yours belongs to this whole town. And a good many lives depend on you. So you calm down and you put that gun away. <laughs> hey, you sure told the old fool off. You I shut up! Didn't... Huh? Not a... I don't know anything about you. Maybe you're what you say, but if Doc doesn't like you, that's good enough for me. So you get out of Dodge while you got a whole skin. And you stay out. Why should we? We got a right... And you take your partner with you, Maddow, because I don't like him. Sure, Marshal. We was going on tomorrow anyways. We'll right on tonight, as soon as we stock up on some grub. All right. Where did Doc go, Chester? Well, up the street, probably back to the office, like you said to me. Matt, him. look on his face when he went out. Yeah, I know, Kitty. Well, I'm going up there. Matt, you had to do it. Yeah. I'll see you later, Kitty. Yeah, sure. Mr. Dillon, that Maddo, he, he didn't seem like such a bad fellow. No, he didn't, Chester. I'd sooner be bad of that partner of his, that Bartlett. That one seemed like he could be a hard case, all right, without half trying. But Maddow wouldn't even defend himself. No. But I don't think that was because he was afraid to. No, well, that's true. Seemed more like he just didn't want to fight Doc. Didn't seem mad at all, like Doc. More like he was sad. Maybe a man with a guilty conscience, Chester. Mm. You yeah, know, I guess so, Mr. Dillon. Uh, you better go on over to the office, Chester, huh? Uh, I want to go up alone. Yes, sir.
Так. А так. didn't show up at Del Monco's for his supper and it's way past his usual time. I've been watching the office and his light ain't come on. Of course, he could be sitting up there in the dark. I just tried again. He's not there. All right. Mr. Dillon, you don't reckon he might have just left town? Run away? Because of what I said? Not Doc. He's too bullheaded for that. Most likely he's out there somewhere with that old pistol of his looking for Maddo. I'm afraid you're right. Doggone it, I don't know what this town would do without Doc. He can be awful irritating at times and all, but... Hey, that, that was a shot. Yeah, come on. Marshal! Marshal! Over here! It's that Bartlett, Mr. Dillon. It's Clem, Marshal. I think he's dead. All right. Everybody stay back. Give me that lantern, will you? He was shot in the back, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. It looks mighty bad. He said he'd kill him, and he's done it. Did you say who did it, Bartlett? No. We was loading horses, and I just turned to go back into the store for another load, and I heard the shot. Anybody else around to see it? Why, no, but... After all, Marshal can't be much doubt who did it, can there? Everybody in town heard him threaten to kill Clem. You know, just because the man's a doctor doesn't give him any right to go around murdering people. That's enough, Bartlett. The important thing right now is to try to save this man's life. Where are we take him at, Mr. Dillon? There's only one place, Chester. Yes, sir. Now, where have you been, Doc? I was down by the stable. And I heard a shot. It's matter. He's still alive. But he was shot in the back. Oh. I see. <laughs> As if you didn't know. Doc, I can understand you getting into a fair fight, but not shooting a man in the back. Why, you just gonna let him walk away like that, Marshal? Doc! He's going to die if he doesn't get attention right away, and you're the only doctor in town. You're going to let him die? Where do you think I was going, Matt? Bring him up to the office. I'll have everything ready. <laughs> more pleasure, packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. The more perfectly packed your cigarette, the more taste and mildness are released for you. Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, has an open, easy draw that unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobaccos. Now, Accuray ensures an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips. Mild, yet deeply satisfying. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. <laughs>
going to pull through, Doc? I don't know. I've done all I can. Yeah. Good. You really didn't have to stand here and watch, man. Yeah, I know I didn't, Doc. That's not why I stayed. I thought maybe I could help. And I wanted this. Uh, the bullet? Yeah, that's right. You see, Doc, I knew you didn't shoot Maddo, but I had to be able to prove it. How did you know? Because Maddo was shot in the back. I... I, I tried to tell you out there, Doc, only you, you didn't understand. Oh. But you did have me kind of worried when you started to walk away from him. Why, it... It never occurred to me to walk away from him. Oh. I guess being a doctor is a lot more important than any personal grudge. Well, I reckon I'm under suspicion, aren't I? Doc, uh, look at this forty-five bullet. Took it out of Maddo's chest. Now, I couldn't have been shot from that old pistol of yours, could it? No, no, no. I guess it couldn't. And... Well, then who did it? Well, that's not hard to figure. Oh, Bartlett, Chester, you can come in now. How is he, Marshal? I think he's going to be all right. He ain't going to die? Say, that's mighty fine. Well, I was plenty scared with this man operating and all. You needn't have worried. He's a doctor and a good one. You see, he didn't shoot your partner. He didn't? No, we have the proof for that. Uh, who did? Now, there's only one other man in town who'd have had any reason to. A coward who saw a golden opportunity to double his takings of a mining strike by shooting his partner in the back. You just keep your hands away from your belt, Bartlett. Well, I... Uh, want me to get his gun, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, Chester. Well, you're a crazy marshal. You can't prove this. I think we can, Bartlett. Anyway, we'll just wait and see. All right, take him down and lock him up, Chester. Yes, sir. Come on, you... Looks like Maddo's going to come, too. Yes, maybe. His color's better. You know, it's funny. I, I don't hate him anymore. You mind telling me why you ever did? Uh, it happened a long time ago. It had to do with a girl we were both pretty fond of. She chose Maddo, but he jilted her. She drowned herself. I swore I'd kill him. And I carried that hate in my heart all these years. That's not good for a man. No, it's not, Doc. Well, you brought me to my senses, Matt, in that saloon. Thank you. Well, I looked all over for you afterwards. Well, I guess I was out of Jake Morrison's. I, I remembered I had to treat his boy for the ague, so, so I did. <laughs> Doc. Oh, yes. Yes, Clint. Yeah, now you just take it easy. That's right. You lie still. You're going to be all right. Doc, I wanted to tell you I'm awful sorry for what happened. Maybe sorrier than you. I loved her. I would have come back if I could have. Well, I guess I never even thought of that. Well, we've both been sorry too long. It's all over now. Thanks. Now you just go on to sleep. You get your rest there now. And the world will look a lot better to you tomorrow. That's it. That's it. Well, good night, Doctor. Good night, man. moment, our star, William Conrad. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. 
Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed, unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobaccos. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Firm and pleasing to the lips, Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. Our cowboys, with six months' trail pay, made the frontier a good place for a crooked gambler. Next week, one comes to town and gets cured of his bad habits the hard way. And that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The special music for Gunsmoke was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin and John Daner. Farley Bear is Chester, Howard McNair is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Make today your big red letter day, your L&M red letter day. Superior taste and filter, it's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day, change to L&M today. L&M's got everything. Superior taste. And superior filter. Get L&M today. This is it. L&M, superior taste and filter. L&M, America's best filter tip cigarette. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story of the Western Frontier when Matt Dillon, Chester Proudfoot, Doc, and Kitty, together with all the other hard-living citizens of Dodge, will be with you once more. It's America growing west in the 1870s. It's gun smoke. by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Sam, 
Kitty, what do you have? Uh, I'm going out to Delmonico's for something to eat. If Marshal Dillon comes in, tell him to wait, will you? I'll send him on to Delmonico's. No, he's to wait here. It's Doc who's trying to find him. Oh. You look tired, Sam. I ought to. I've been tending bar for 12 hours steady. Well, what happened to the help you hired last night? You had the wrong idea, Kitty. Huh? I'm in business to sell whiskey, not give it away to anybody who needs a drink and can't pay for it. <laughs> Is that what he was doing? It was till I caught him at it. <laughs> ah, hello, Kitty. Sam. Oh, Marshal. Matt, you are to stay right here at the bar. What? I promised Doc if you came in, I'd keep you here. He's been looking all over town for you. Oh, I thought Doc was delivering a baby down on Salt Creek. Well, he got back about a half hour ago. Oh, what does he want me for? It's about some trouble with a man and his wife called Tebbs. Tebbs? Well, not where he delivered the baby. This was in a sod hut about a mile above the crossing. Ah, well, well what about him? Here he comes. He'll tell you. Here he is, Doc. Oh, fine. So you're a good girl, kiddies. <laughs> yes, you are. You're a good girl. I might never have found him. What's all this about these Tebbs people, Doc? Well, they're having trouble, Matt. Oh, what kind of trouble? Well, I stopped by to say hello and get acquainted and... Well, you know. Oh, sure. <laughs> but the woman, she didn't act like she wanted anybody around. And then I heard the man yell at me from inside. She tried to stop me, but I went in anyways. He was lying there in the bed, Matt, with a bad knife wound in his leg. Oh? Yes. It's festered and it's given him a fever, and I don't think he can walk with it. Uh, did he say what happened? Well, he claimed it was an accident, but he was holding a six-gun under that blanket, Matt. Well, what for? For his wife. He's scared to death of her. I think she knifed him, and I think she's waiting for a chance to finish him off. <laughs> you better get down there, Matt. Maybe too late already. Introducing one of the country's best-known jazz musicians and arrangers, Mr. Bobby Haggard. How about whistling along with him? Packs more pleasure, packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. The more perfectly packed your cigarette, the more taste and mildness are released for you. Chesterfield made by exclusive Accuray as an open, easy draw that unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobaccos. Now, Accuray ensures an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed by Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. It's a Tebbs place, all right, Mr. Dillon. That's the way Doc described it, all right, Chester. Including the wife out there hoeing in the dirt. She's letting on she don't see us. Yeah. I didn't expect we'd be very welcome here. Just wait till she finds out you're a marshal. And I'm not going to tell her, Chester. Not right off, anyway. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Ah. Uh, we were looking for a drink of water. Crick's over yonder. Yeah, but you got a well here. Water's no better than the crick. Okay, we'll use the crick. But uh, first I'd like to talk to your husband. My husband? What about? Oh, I just uh, wanted to get acquainted. He ain't here. Ah. 
Well, we go get a drink, and then we'll come back and wait for it. No. Who are you talking to, Flory? Who's out there? Nobody. Now you stay quiet. He's feeling poorly, mister. I don't want nobody bothering him. Well, we won't bother him. You stay out of there. Well, then I'm coming, too. You better wait outside, just a minute. Yes, sir. That hut can't hold more than three people anyway. Hello. Oh, I knew I heard somebody. Your wife says that you're sick, Ted. I told you to leave him alone. I told you not to be troubling him. Well, I'm only being neighborly, ma'am. If he's sick, maybe I can help. So you're a neighbor, mister? Well, my partner and I are planning a homestead nearby. As soon as we can decide on a good piece of land. Now, you get it staked out, then you'll come see us, mister. Everything will be fine, then. Now, Flory, don't be that way. Me being sick and her having to do all the chores makes her kind of edgy, mister. And being up nights, that's what's hardest on her. I ain't complaining. Yeah, I know, Flory, but I can tell. Mister, I got an idea. Said you wanted to help. Uh, sure, sure, anything I can do. Be willing to sit up with me tonight? No, Ben. Ah, you need some rest, Flory. You see, I got a... I got a fever, mister. I get to tossing them asleep. I throw off a blanket, all like that. Uh, you don't look like you've been sleeping at all. Huh. Will you do it, mister? Sit up with me? No. No, he ain't gonna sit up with you. Oh, why not, ma'am? I, I don't mind. Because I ain't going to sleep in here with no stranger about. That's why. Oh. Well, I didn't think she would. Look, uh, I'll tell you what. I'll spend the night on the ground outside, if you don't mind. We do mind. Rory, you ain't acting like a wife. You ain't acting like a wife at all. You can stay, mister. No, fine, good. Wait a minute, mister. Yeah, what? I was just wondering if maybe tomorrow if you'd be willing. I ought to get into Dodge and see the dock. There's a wagon outside. No, you don't. Oh, shut up. Well, sure we'll take you in, mister. We'll be glad to. <laughs> him in the Dodge tomorrow, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, we better. Well, why don't she want him to go? Well, I guess Doc was right, Chester. She put a knife in him, and now she's trying to finish him off. Well, if he's got a six-gun under his blanket, why don't he just shoot her? That hood take care of him, feed him. He's getting more fever every day, and he can hardly walk anyway. Well, he sure can't last much longer with him staying awake, trying to keep an eye on her all the time. Yeah. Chester, I think I'm going to go in there and tell him who I am and load him into a wagon tonight. This has gone on long enough. I reckon you better, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Where's your wife? She went around back, mister. Look, uh, Tebbs. Hmm? I'm going to take you into Dodge tonight. You are? Oh, that'll be fine. Oh, except for Flora. You want to tell me what's going on here? What do you mean? I'm not a homesteader, Tebbs. I'm a U.S. Marshal. Huh? That's right. And I'm going to take you into Dodge, Flory or no Flory. You need sleep and you need care. Oh, well... Now, you can tell me your story when you want to. No, uh... There's no story. I just got hurt a little, is all. Here, look here, Marshal. You got to understand, Flory. She don't. She. She don't mean what she says. She gets all riled up over nothing. She, well, you know how women are. What are you trying to say, Tebbs? Well, I, I'm. I'm fine right here. And Flory, she's a good nurse, Marshal. 
You mean you don't want to go to Dodge? Oh, sh- shucks, I'll be up and around in a couple of days. Don't you worry about me. All right. But I'll be back. Chester. Chester. Get your hands up and turn around, Marshal. Oh, she's got a shotgun, Mr. Dillon. And I'll use it, too. She was listening at the window. Now my hands are up, Flory. I'm taking your gun. She got my gun, too, Mr. Dillon. You're making a bad mistake, Flory. I won't have you nor nobody else meddling where you don't belong. Now get your horses and ride out of here. All right. But we'll be back. I'm going to be setting right by that door, Marshal. First thing I see or hear gets a load of buckshot. It won't be us, Flory. But we'll be close enough to hear if you do shoot somebody. I, I couldn't help it, Mr. Dillon. She come ooching around the side of the hut, and I didn't even see that cussed shotgun until it was too late. Yeah, neither did I. What are we going to do? Yeah, there's nothing we can do tonight. But tomorrow in the daylight, well, we got our rifles. We'll think up some tricks for her. <laughs> you listening to Gunsmoke? In your favorite easy chair? Or out driving? Oh, there you are. In the kitchen. Say, you want to make whatever you're doing more enjoyable? Have a Chesterfield. Enjoy Chesterfield's better taste and mildness. You see, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. A more perfectly packed cigarette gives you an open, easy draw that unlocks all the better taste and mildness of fine tobaccos. And Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, is more perfectly packed, with an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Remember, to the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Buy Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. See her around no more, Mr. Dillon. Uh, she must be inside the hut, Chester. Well, I hope she don't come charging out of there with that shotgun, please. <laughs> it would be a bad way to start the day, wouldn't it? I can't think of none worse, especially on an empty stomach. Yeah. Well, there she is. Hmm? Now, wait a minute. It's all right. She isn't armed. Come on over here, Marshal. Now, what's she up to? Yeah, it's hard to say with a woman like that. I thought you'd be back this morning. Yes, and I told you we wouldn't. We're going to take your husband into Dodge, ma'am. You're too late, Marshal. Too late? He died during the night. What? It was too much for his heart. He always did have a weak heart. Where is he, Flory? Lying there inside, Marshal. Why? Don't you believe me? I believe you, but I want to have a look at him. What for? I got him all wrapped up in his blanket, ready for burying you go dig a grave for him if you want to help so much. All right, we'll dig a grave after I've seen him. You got no respect for the dead, Marshal? It's the living that bothers me right now, Flory. I'm going to have a look at him now, Flory. You're no better than a coyote, Marshal. You don't have to watch. I'll go ahead. I don't care. Come on, 
button his shirt here. All right, what did you use, Flurry? Use? For what? I might have known he couldn't stay awake forever. He fell asleep and you stabbed him in the heart with a needle or something. That doesn't show much, does it? All right, I'll tell you. Don't matter none anyway. I I killed him. Why would you want to kill your husband, Flurry? My husband? He wasn't my husband. He killed my husband, Marshal. We never seen him before. He rode by here and started trouble. Over me it was. My husband pulled a knife, but... But he shot him. And I swore I'd kill him for it, and I did. Why didn't you explain all this to Doc Adams when he was out here? Or to me last night? And let you take him and hang him? I had to kill him myself, Marshal. It's a promise I made my husband while he was dying. I'm going to have to arrest you. You can't do nothing to me for this. You murdered a man, Flory. You're wrong, Marshal. You just admitted it. Well, I ain't doing no more talking. You take care of him and we'll go into Dodge. But I won't be in jail long. You'll see. <laughs> Ah, good morning, Chester. Good morning, Mr. Dillon. What you got there? That's a mail. Oh, did you pick it up? Yeah, I picked it up. I was down there anyway. How's Flory? She ain't said a word. Go get her, will you? Go get What for? She was right, Chester. I can't keep her in jail. But, Mr. Dillon, we just Go can't get her, will you? Yes, sir. of a jail you got, Marshal. Well, it's not strong enough to hold you. Of course it ain't. Flory, the man you killed, you told me you've never seen him before, huh? I never had. What was his name? George Bassett. What else did you know about him? He was wanted, dead or alive. He was wanted? I got a circular on him in the mail, Chester. It's there on my desk. A circular... Well, forevermore. How did you know he was wanted for it? He said so. Now, that's hard to believe. Now, he told me when he was bothering me before he killed my husband. He said one more wouldn't matter. I guess he planned to kill me, too, later. Only he hadn't figured on getting cut up, and he needed me after that. Yeah. Now, why didn't you tell me this out there, Flory? I didn't think you'd believe me, Marshal. Yeah, well, maybe you were right. I never heard of George Bassett before. You heard of him now? Yeah. Uh, there's going to be some reward money coming, Flory. Marshal? Yeah, what? You say it. Say what, Flory? Oh, please. Now, oh. that you don't want the money, that you wouldn't take it. Thank you, Marshal. Thank you for saying it right. I, I feel some cleaner for that. Goodbye. Goodbye, Flory. <laughs> Moment, our star, William Conrad. Chesterfield packs more pleasure. 
Because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. Unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobacco. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Firm and pleasing to the lips, Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. You know, on the frontier, almost anybody who had a few dollars could open a bank of his own. And by the same token, anybody who had a gun could try to rob it. And next week, a man does. And that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Helen Klebe, Lawrence Dobkin, and Stacey Harris. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Smokers, this is it. L and M filters. So good to your taste, so quick on the draw. Make today your big red letter day, your L and M red letter day. Superior taste and filter, it's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day, change to L and M today. L and M, mmm, so good to your taste. So quick on the draw. Get L and M today. Relax with L and M. So good to your taste, so quick on the draw. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gun Smoke. Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> Every man who comes to Dodge doesn't spell trouble. But sometimes a stranger rides in who, to my eye, has it written all over him. This one I first noticed walking slowly up and down the plaza, taking every detail in of the buildings, of the crowd, of the street. You might have thought he was figuring to buy the place. 
But after two days of his walking and sitting and watching, I decided that maybe that wasn't exactly what he had in mind. You looking for somebody, mister? You've been in Dodge long enough, stranger. You know who I am. You Marshal Dillon. If there's anything about this town you haven't found out, maybe I can help you. This is the first civilization I've seen in months, Marshal. Just trying to get used to it again. By the way, my name is Cole Yankton. Well, it ain't no summer name, Marshal, if that's what you're thinking. What do you do that keeps you away from the civilization, Yankton? Oh, I've been horse trading. Around among the settlers, a few peaceful Indians. Uh-huh. But you're done with that now, huh? I sold what I had. Come out pretty good, too. You know, most men who come here with a stake spend it gambling. I haven't seen you near a saloon yet. I'll look them over later. You aim to stay here long? I come here to take the Santa Fe to Wichita, Marshal. Well, it goes every day. You got something against me? No. Not yet. You guess being a lawman, you gotta be suspicious of everybody, don't you? Not everybody. There's nothing wrong with me, Marshal. Now, don't you worry about a thing. I want Yankton. Good. I'm gonna let you do the worrying. Matt, I figure this saloon's about to go broke. Oh, why is that, Kitty? Well, they've almost stopped watering the whiskey. Oh? I swear they're pouring at least half and a half these days. <laughs> I kitty, Sam's got to make it last, you know. One barrel for the whole winter? <laughs> <laughs> well, the less people drink, the less trouble they make for me. Ah, that's being selfish. Oh. Huh? I wondered how long he'd hold up. What? Who are you talking about? Ah, the man at the door over there. He's been in town two days, and this is the first time I know he's come into a saloon. Kitty, what's the matter? Nothing, Matt. Nothing. Well, you're staring at him like he was a ghost or something. A ghost? Well, what is it, Kitty? Do you know him? Um, Cole Yankton. Well, who is he? Well, what do you know about him? He's coming over here. Excuse me, Matt. No, wait a minute, Kitty. Evening, Marshal. Hello, Yankton. Uh, your girl took off. Uh-huh. She's going out the back door. She's really leaving. Yeah, it looks that way. Now, why'd she do that, Marshal? I wouldn't know, Yankton. You ain't even curious? I don't figure it's any of my business. Maybe you're right, Marshal. Maybe it ain't. Like I said, Yankton... You worry about it. Good night. Good night, Marshal. Introducing one of the country's best-known jazz musicians and arrangers, Mr. Bobby Haggard. How about whistling along with him? Packs more pleasure, packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. The more perfectly packed your cigarette, the more taste and mildness are released for you. Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, has an open, easy draw that unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobaccos. Now, Accuray ensures an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed by Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. <laughs> Mm. 
Look at him, Chester. Hmm? Sitting there half asleep in the sun. And crime is being committed all over town. Widows are being robbed. Old men are getting the throats cut. Little children are being sold into slavery. And there sits the law. Sucking on a straw while he digests his dinner. Uh, my golly, Doc, he don't look none too lively. If I had a gun, I'd shoot his heels off. I'll lend you mine. Why don't you two sit down and quit bragging? Yeah. <laughs> we better do it too, Jesse. It'll make him look less conspicuous. Ah. You know, this is one part of my job I take pleasure in, Doc. <laughs> You know something, I wouldn't hire either one of you to drive a tent peg in quicksand. Don't answer him, Chester. That's his bad conscience talking. Doc, <laughs> did you ever hear of a man doing a little thinking once in a while? Uh, oh, he's thinking. And what would you be thinking so hard about, Marshal? Well, I'll tell you, Doc. Cole Yankton over there. Oh? That's him standing right across the street. Where? Oh, yes. Yes, I know. I saw him this morning. This morning? Where? In the plaza. He was asking where he could find Kitty. Said he wanted to talk to her. Well. Now that's all right, Chester. Why shouldn't he be talking to Kitty? Well, no reason, I guess. You don't fool me, Madeline. You're wondering why as much as everybody else. Kitty knows lots of people, Doc. Oh, yes. People like Cole Yankton. Outlaws. Look. Look. There's Miss Kitty. So she's going to run right into him. You stopped her. I guess he's going to get to talk to her, all right. But he isn't, Chester. He's just kind of smiling at her. Well, that sure didn't last long. Where is he going now? He's taking his horse. Looks like he's leaving town, Matt. Yonder he goes. Well, that's good riddance. <clears throat> You can forget about him, Matt. Yeah, maybe. Why don't you ask Miss Kitty about him, Mr. Dillon? You said you was having supper with her tonight, didn't you? Yeah, that's right, Chester. I'm having supper with her. Enchiladas, Matt? Well, I'd like them better if I knew what they were using for meat, Kitty. <laughs> Haven't you ever been here before? <sighs> no, not often. Uh, yeah, for one thing, it's too long a walk. This place is hardly part of Dodge. Mm. Now, just because it's at the edge of town. I don't think you like Mexican food, Matt. <laughs> I grew up on it, Kitty. Well, the walk's good for you. Gives you an appetite. Huh? Mm-hmm. Is that why you brought me clear out here? Mm. I get tired of eating at Delmonico's in those places. Change is good for you once in a while. Yeah, sure, it's good for you. As long as it's for the better. There's nothing wrong with this food. I think it's delicious. Uh-huh. Have you tried this coffee? I wasn't talking about the coffee. Well, you take cornmeal and molasses and you fry it together until it turns to powder. Then you boil that with water and you got coffee. Is that how they make it? That's how they make it here. (laughs) Well, I like it. Well, you don't have to, you know. It's not going to cost me much. Then you ought to be grateful I made us come here. Oh, I am, Kitty. I sure am. Matt. Yeah? You haven't asked me about Cole Yankton. No, I haven't, Kitty. Why should I? I don't. I swear, I thought I'd never find you. What are you doing way out here? Uh, something wrong, Chester? Only the bank got held up. Three men, they took over $10,000. When? A while ago, I've been looking everywhere for you. Was anybody hurt, Chester? Well, there was a few shots fired, but nobody got hit, I know of. What, any idea who it was? Yes, sir. One of them, anyway. Well, who? Cole Yankton. Matt. Now, we'll talk about it later, Kitty. I brought your horse, Mr. Dillon, and we better get going or we won't never find him. <laughs> All Chester knew was that Cole Yankton and his partners had headed south out of Dodge. So we started after him. We rode blind for a few hours. I was about to give it up and wait for daylight when we ran into a cowboy who'd heard him ride past him in the dark. 
When I told him who I was, he told me the only place in the whole country where they might be hiding. And an hour later, Chester and I were crawling on our bellies up to a half-fallen shack that lay under a small bluff. They ain't even hiding in the shack. They got a fire going outside. They'd have been safe enough if it hadn't been for that cowpuncher, Chester. Yankton's the one laying on the ground, ain't he? Yeah. Quiet now. Just hold it up, Chester, and listen. Don't worry. Ain't nobody find tonight. Come on, let's get a little closer. There's only two of them, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. The other one's probably in the shack. Listen. How are they going to find it? You ain't bloodhound. Well, they don't like it, I tell you. Another thing, Yankton. What were them men doing in the bank? It was always empty at that hour. Can't find out everything in two days, can I? No, I guess not. I still give you credit for one thing, Yankton. At least that tin horn marshal never showed up. Don't give me credit. Why, he means so kid, Mr. Dillon. He means she was in on it. That gal help you out? What's her name? Her name's Kitty, and I don't want to talk about it. Hey, you talked about enough what we got to die. Look, the marshal was out of the way, wasn't he? That's what I said. And that's all you need to know. Now leave Kitty out of this. <laughs> You're awful touchy about it, ain't you? Yankton? You shut up or I'll put Chester. a bullet in you. Yes, sir. You watch the for the man in the shack. I'm going to move in on these yeah. two. Are you ready? I'm ready. I will. All right, you men are covered. Get your hands up. Shoot him. I got that fellow in the door, Mr. Dillon. I gave up, Marshal. Don't shoot. Got them all but him. All right, keep your hands up, Yankton. You're up. All right, get on your feet. No, I can't, Marshal. I'm too dizzy. What? I got hit. Marshal, I... Got him, too, I guess, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Yankton? He's bleeding all right, Chester, but he's not dead. Say, looks like an old cart of some kind over there, Mr. Dillon. If it ain't busted, maybe we can hitch it up and carry him back to Dodge. Yeah. Well, let's find that money first, and then we'll try it. All right. Mr. Dillon? Yeah. What, Chester? It's kind of bad about Miss Kitty, ain't it? Say, where are you listening to Gunsmoke? In your car? Getting ready for dinner? Oh, I see. Just relaxing in your favorite easy chair. I'd say you're in a good spot right now to really enjoy Chesterfield's better taste and mildness. You see, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. A more perfectly packed cigarette gives you an open, easy draw that unlocks all the better taste and mildness of fine tobaccos. And Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, is more perfectly packed, with an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Remember, to the touch to the taste. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield. Mild. Yet they satisfy the most.
Mac. How is he, Doc? I've done all I can for him, Matt. I... I ain't gonna make it. I never thought I would. Uh, and I don't give up, Yankton. There's always a chance. My partners... They're both dead, ain't they, Marshal? We buried them before we brought you in, mm. Yankton. Come in. Oh, well, kidding. I had to come ahead of us here. Hello, Kitty. You got a bullet in me, Kitty. I know. Out on the street there, yesterday, I... I had it in mind to ask you something, but... When I got close to you, I... I knew I couldn't. And I'm glad. Because think, things didn't work out so good. No. I'm sorry, Cole. I'm real sorry. Thank you for coming, Kitty. I won't bother you no more. He's dead. Here, I'll, I'll cover him up. Matt. No, Kitty. You, you, you don't have to explain anything. Yes, yes, I do. I want you to hear too, Doc. I'm listening. You both think I tried to help him, don't you? Well, it so looks like you did, Kitty. I oh, no. And I guess I'd have to hear you say it before I'd believe it. I stand with Matt, Kitty. Thanks, Doc. Matt. I'll tell you what, let's forget about it, Kitty, huh? No. No. I want to tell you something about Cole Yankton. He's been in California for years. That's why you never heard of him. Well, I've heard of him. I know what he's been doing. I think he came here because he thought I'd help him. But then he did a nice thing, Matt. He didn't ask me to. He didn't make me say no. Well, then I guess he wasn't so bad after all, could he? Oh, Yankton. New Orleans. I was just a girl. He was the first man I ever knew. The first grown man. Yankton was a fool, Matt. Yeah. He should have stayed with that girl. Yeah, she's all right, isn't she, Doc? In a moment, our star... William Conrad. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. Unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobacco. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Firm and pleasing to the lips, Chesterfield, mild. Yet they satisfy the most. You know, to compliment a Westerner, you, you might say, he'll do to ride the river with. Well, that means that he's courageous and honest. But next week, when a man rides the river, he dies. And that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke. Produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. 
Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin and Barney Phillips. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Smokers, this is it. L and M filters. So good to your taste, so quick on the draw. Make today your big red letter day, your L and M red letter day. Superior taste and filter, it's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day, change to L and M today. L and M, mmm, so good to your taste. So quick on the draw. Get L and M today. Relax with L and M. So good to your taste, so quick on the draw. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on gun smoke. Smoke. Brought to you by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. That's Enoch Mills' new hotel. Yeah, it will be when they get it built, Chester. I never heard of a cattle rancher going into hotel business before, Mr. Oh, Jones. Enoch Mills is a man of enterprise. Look yonder at him. <laughs> He's as proud as a new father, ain't he? <laughs> well, it isn't every day a man builds a new hotel in Dodge. Hello, Marshal. Chester. Oh, Mr. Mill? Yeah, it's gone up pretty fast, isn't it? Anyway? Well, we got most a month before it's finished. Uh-huh. How many rooms are you going to have? Fifteen. Could have more, but this is going to be a class hotel. Not some hay tent like Jim Doby's Dodge House. <laughs> I bet he's jealous. That Doby's had a monopoly in this town long enough. <laughs> You're right about him being jealous, Chester. He's already done everything he can to keep me from building. Oh, what's he done, Edith? You know, tried to buy up all the good lumber in town, for one thing. Thought he'd leave me with nothing but a lot of warpy old cottonwood. But I got on to him soon enough. I'm building with the best, Marshal. All of it. Ash, Hackberry. Yonder he comes now, isn't huh? he? He's scouting the enemy, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> 
let him scout. He'll be out of business soon enough. <laughs> Looks like a town meeting we're about to have. How are you, Marshal Chester? Hello, oh, Mr. Doby. We're coming along just fine, Doby. Of course, it's only a little bitty hotel. You'll never beat me, Nick. You're getting too old. Old? Doby, I'll eat the goose that fattens in your grave. <laughs> Not likely. Anyways, what do you know about the hotel business, Enoch? You won't last a month. Now, man. look, man. Dodge can use two hotels. There are plenty of trade here. Why, why don't you quit fighting each other? You're just scared of a little competition, Doby. You ain't slept a night since I started building. You got a ranch to run, Enoch. That's enough for one man. You shouldn't be pushing into other people's territory. Well, you ain't going to stop me, Doby. I've tried to stop you, and I'll go on trying. Eh, eh, Marshal, he's threatening me. You heard him. I'm going to fight you, Enoch. I'm going to fight you all the way. <laughs> so now you'd better start staying up nights. That man belongs in jail, Marshal. Doby's a hard one, Enoch. He'll give you a fight. But I don't think he'll do anything illegal. Oh, you don't, eh? Well, you just wait and see. And it's going to be your fault for not stopping him now. The whole blame is going to be on your shoulders, Marshal. And I ain't going to let nobody forget it. Kitty, <laughs> what are you doing here? Uh, I came by to tell you something, Matt. Uh-huh. You ever hear of a man called Gil Shank? Uh, don't tell me he's in town. I met him at the Long Branch this afternoon. He didn't say much, but a man like that stands out like a white buffalo. Uh, you can pick him, Kitty. Yeah, Gil Shank's a gunman and a crook. He isn't wanted that I know of, but uh, he sure ought to be. I didn't figure him for a drummer. Well, I think I'll let him stay around a few days. See what he's up to, maybe. Well, there are a couple of men with him, but it's hard to say if they're friends or if they just met. Yeah, they're probably friends. Gil Shank never liked traveling alone. Much. Well, they didn't look like gunmen, Matt. They're just a couple of saddle bums. Oh, well, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Uh... Thanks for telling me, anyway, Kitty. Mr. Dillon, I... oh, hello, Miss Kitty. Something to scare you, Chester? Worse than that, the new hotel's on fire. On fire? Uh -huh. On fire. And old Enoch saying Jim Doby there. Oh, the place. You, you better get down there, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> Introducing one of the country's best-known jazz musicians and arrangers, Mr. Bobby Haggard. How about whistling along with him? Packs more pleasure, packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. The more perfectly packed your cigarette, the more taste and mildness are released for you. Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, as an open, easy draw that unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobaccos. Now, Accuray ensures an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. By the time I reached the fire, a bucket brigade had been formed. And there wasn't much to do but get in line myself. Even while we worked, I could tell the fire had been set and that the wood had been soaked with kerosene. It was all over in a half hour, but not because we'd put it out. There was nothing left to burn. 
Next morning, I went back and had a talk with Enoch. And he'd already bought more lumber. And he had his workmen busy cleaning up. This ain't going to stop me, Marshal. Takes more than a little arson to stop Enoch Mills. Enoch, uh... I, uh... Guess there's no need to ask you who you think did it, is there? What? Jim Doby, of course. You know as well as I do. Yeah, but you don't have any proof of that, I got what proof I need. And if you was anything of a lawman at all, Doby would be in jail right now. Enoch, you know I can't arrest a man because you and he are enemies. Well, it don't matter. I ain't counting on you no more. I got other ways. Yes, sir. Hey, come in right there, Marshal. What? Here. You mean Gil Shank? That's right. He seen me after the fire last night, and he uh, he offered to go to work for me. What do you need a gunman for, Enoch? Yeah, that makes you sit up, don't it? You and Doby both, you bet it does. Marshal Dillon. Well, now, this is a pleasure. He knows you're working for me, Shank. I told him. Just Shank, Enoch? What do you mean? Well, is he the only one you hired? I'm alone, Marshal, if that's what you're driving at. You're making a bad mistake, Enoch. You don't need a man like this. I could take offense at that, Marshal. No? Well, why don't you let me know when you decide, huh? I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, that's telling me. I right, will take care of Jim Doby next. You won't huh? do a thing to Jim Doby. Either one of you. Well, you're protecting the criminal, Marshal. But it ain't gonna work. Shank's got a plan. You said you was gonna figure something out, Shank. You done it? Well, Enoch, what with the law being so loose around here, we gotta protect your hotel day and night. How many riders you got out at the ranch? Well, about 20. I want 15 of them. You what? I want them here in Dodge. We're going to put a guard around this building 24 hours a day. Well, I can't spare 15 men, Shank. Who's going to watch the cattle? You ain't moving cattle this time of year, are you? Of course not. Then five riders is enough. You want this hotel to go up or don't you? All right. I'll send for him. Hey. Hmm? You that Jim Doby over there? Yeah. That's him. Come to enjoy his dirty work, I guess. Shank. What, Marshal? The first sign of any of your dirty work, and I'm coming after you. Fast. Morning, Marshal. Dobby. I suppose I'm getting the blame for this. You are. Yeah. Then why ain't you arresting me? I've known you for a long time, Toby. You're pig-headed and you can be downright mean. But you don't fight this way. You make it hard to thank you, Marshal. You can thank me by laying off Enoch Mills for a while. There's going to be enough trouble without your making any. Nothing's going to happen after all, Mr. Dillon. What? I, I mean about old Enoch Mills's hotel. Been a week now, and everything is purely pawn peaceful. Well, what with 15 armed guards spelling one another day and night, it ought to be. Mm. I didn't see that fellow Gil Shank running yesterday. Oh, no, Enoch said he rode down to Tuscosa. What for? To hold up the bank? <sighs> it wouldn't surprise me. No, okay. Well, here's Mr. Botkin. No? Huh? Well, morning, Marshal. Morning, Chester. Morning, Mr. Botkin. You look like you're dressed for traveling. Well, a banker doesn't do all his work behind a desk, Marshal. I've been looking over some land up north the last couple of days. How'd you have a good trip? Fine, except for crossing the Pawnee. It was almost in flood. And how'd you make it? Well, I was lucky, Chester. Some cowboys were taking a herd across, and they gave me a hand. Swimming a herd across the Pawnee this time of year? Yes. Must have had a thousand head, Marshal. Well, uh... Who was it? I, I don't know anybody moving cattle now. They were 
were strangers to me. Uh, uh, what was the brand? I'm afraid I'm not much of a brand reader, Marshal. I, uh, you, you think you could draw it for me? Uh, come over here in the dirt, Mr. Buck. All right. Here. Here's your stick. Now, uh, what did it look like? Well, there was a circle here and a line through it, like this. It stopped just about here. Well, everybody knows that brand, Mr. Botkin. Everybody but me, I guess. Where would they be taking those cattle, Marshal? Only one place. The Greystone Indian Agency is about 20 miles beyond there. Oh, they're going to sell them to the agency, eh? They won't get top prices, but it's always a fast cash sale. Chester. Yes, sir? Go saddle three horses and tie them up behind the office, and then wait for me. I'll be back after dark. Go ahead, Enoch. You don't know what you're bringing me here this time of night for, Marshal? Well, I got everything ready, Mr. Dillon. Oh, good, Chester. You got everything ready for what? Well, I don't know exactly, Mr. Mills. You do... Oh, I think you're both crazy. Well, now, here, that's no way to talk. Nobody's done nothing to you. I suppose burning my hotel down was nothing, huh? It, it wasn't a hotel. It was only the frame of one. Chester, I'm beginning to think you and the Marshal was in on it. Hmm? Both of you. You're such big friends of that Jim Doby. You'll believe most anything, won't you, Enoch? Anything but what you tell me, Marshal Dillon. Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah, it's sure enough true. All right, I'm getting out of here now. I got nothing to say to you, and you got nothing to say to me. Don't know why I come here in the first place. Wait a minute, Enoch. Well, make it fast. I will. I was going to try to explain something to you, but I can see that it'd be a waste of time. You all through? No, I'm just getting started. Hey, no, what? All right, give me that gun, Marshal. I'm going to keep it for you, Enoch. Right here in my belt. Uh, you arresting him for something, Mr. Dillon? No, I'm not arresting him, Chester. I'm kidnapping him. <laughs> Are you listening to Gunsmoke? In your kitchen? Getting ready for Sunday supper? Maybe in your living room, relaxing? Or out driving? Say, be sure and watch the road. But remember, there's pleasure ahead when you smoke Chesterfield. When you satisfy yourself with Chesterfield's better taste and mildness. You see, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. A more perfectly packed cigarette gives you an open, easy draw that unlocks all the better taste and mildness of fine tobaccos. And Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, is more perfectly packed, with an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Remember, to the touch to the taste. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Buy Chesterfield. Mild. Yet they satisfy the most. Enoch Mills was about as mad as any man I'd ever seen. But I managed to get him on a horse, and then he and Chester and I rode quietly out of Dodge. By noon next day, we'd covered some 60 miles and were at the Greystone Indian Agency. It was run by a man called Albert Leach, who didn't seem too bright, but at least I could tell he wasn't a grafter like most. I had a talk with him, and I brought Enoch in to meet him. Come in, gentlemen, come in. Have a chair. You give me a chair, mister. I'll bash both your heads in with it. 
Now, really, Mr. Mills, how come you know my name? Uh, Marshal Dillon told me. Uh, this is Albert Leach, and he runs the agency. I don't care who he is or what he runs. If he's got anything to do with whatever it is you're up to, Marshal, he's going to end up in jail, too. Good heavens. Uh, don't worry about it, Leach. Enoch was up all night. I think I put him in a bad temper. Look, uh, Leach, I want you to tell him how many cattle you bought yesterday. 1,012 head. Mm-hmm. And you paid $15 a head. Well, then you robbed somebody. Any cow can walk's worth $20. The government never pays over 15 Mr. Mills. Which is why I never sell to the government. Uh, we haven't got much time. Have you paid for those cattle yet, Leach? No. The boss will be here any minute to collect the money. In fact, that's him riding in now. Yeah. All right, you pay him, Leach, and we'll wait in the other room. I understand, Marshal. Come on, Enoch. You're getting yourself in deeper and deeper, Marshal. But I've about decided you won't go to jail. I'm just going to lock you up in a madhouse. Quiet now, Enoch. <laughs> just listen. Matt, you got the money, mister? Are you the boss of that outfit? Enoch Mills is the boss. I run it for him. What? Be quiet. Come on, give me the money. I ain't got it. Well, that's day. Gil Shank. Well, hurry it up, mister. Now, where's the money? Oh, I'll kill him. I'll kill him with my bare hands. No, wait a minute. In it. Dirty thief, Shank. What are you doing here? Dylan. Hold it, Shank. <laughs> yeah, you killed him, Marshal. You're not hit, are you, Enoch? Yeah? No, no, I missed me. That's what he wanted my men guarding the hotel for. That rotten criminal. He had some help. Now we're going to be a long time finding him. I don't care about them. You got him. He set that fire, Enoch. He planned the whole thing. You had it figured out. Why didn't you tell me? You won't believe anything I say. Remember? I've been a fool, Marshal. Looks like I owe you an apology. Never mind me. What about Jim Doby? You've given him a bad name. I don't know, Marshal. I never should have started that hotel in the first place. I'm a cattleman. I'm no innkeeper. You mean you're not going to finish it? Oh, I'll finish it. But then you know what I'm going to do? I'll go to Jim Doby and... And I'll ask him to run it for me. You think he'll do it, Marshal? <laughs> yeah, he'll do it, Enoch. And whenever you come to town, he might even let you stay there. If you behave yourself. With our star, William Conrad. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. Unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobacco. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Firm and pleasing to the lips, Chesterfield, mild. Yet they satisfy the most. You know, on the frontier, an outlaw was called a gunman, while a peace officer was referred to as a gunfighter. But they both lived by their guns. And they usually died by them. And that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Stobkin, Vic Perrin, John Daner, Harry Bartell, and Joe Duvall. Harley Bear as Chester, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. If you're a young man of draft age or a veteran, the National Guard offers you many outstanding opportunities. 
Contact your local National Guard unit for details. Smokers, this is it. L and M filters. So good to your taste, so quick on the draw. Make today your big red letter day, your L and M red letter day. Superior taste and filter, it's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day, change to L and M today. L and M, mmm, so good to your taste. So quick on the draw. Get L and M today. Relax with L and M. So good to your taste, so quick on the draw. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on gun smoke. Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Hello, Kitty. You look a little blue. Oh, it's cold outside. Well, you sit down. Yeah. I'll have Sam fix you up a coffee grub. That'll warm you. Why do you think I came in? Well, you sure know the way to compliment a lady. <laughs> Maybe I ought to. Just... What do you think you're doing? Oh, Matt, look. He's been spoiling for trouble ever since he came in here. Uh, that's Murdoch, huh? Do you know him? No, I... Yeah. Well, answer. Nothing. You don't need the whole bar. What'd you say? I got as much right here as you. Is that so? Man, you got a knife. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Murdoch. Put it up. You again, Dylan. Just like the last time. You want more of the same? It's a little different now, Murdoch. So I see. You got a badge to hide behind. Put up the knife. That's better. This man's crazy, Marshal. I didn't do a thing to him. I didn't mean to jostle him. It's all right, son. It's over now. Go on about your business. Yes, sir, Marshal. Yes, sir. 
Yeah. What kind of a bone picker is that for the high plains? Times have changed, Murdoch. Nothing but settlers and dudes, bone pickers and track men, cow wranglers and blue coats, and lawmen. There's something you better understand, Murdoch. Hmm? When Dodge was full of you buffalo hunters, you could throw your weight around. Well, not anymore. I ain't changed, Dylan. Just stay out of trouble. I'll do as I want. He always did. What are you doing in Dodge anyway? There haven't been any buffalo around here for years. Well, maybe I came to see you, Dylan. And I thought you probably figured me for dead. Oh, no. I heard about you and your badge. Maybe it's just as well for both of us. I'm wearing it. I don't fear no man. And least of all, you. All right. Just let me give you a little warning. If you're thinking of going south for Buffalo under Indian territory, I wouldn't. I do a lot of things you wouldn't. This is orders from Washington. They don't want any more trouble with the Indians. The territory is closed to hunters. They got cavalry patrols along the line. I go where I aim to go. And I don't fear no cavalry. And I got orders to stop anyone. <laughs> Have you now? You just remember what I said. Matt, he's dangerous. There's a crazy look in his eyes. You know, Kitty, when the buffalo herds were running, Dodge was 2,000 like him and not much else. Well, who is he? Uh, he's the one the Indians call Long Arm. His name's Jace Murdoch. Oh, I've heard of him. Yeah. Almost a legend on the frontier. Been on the plains maybe 30 or more years. Beaver trapper, buffalo hunter, Indian scout. He lived with the Indians a long time. Matt, what's between you and Murdoch? A grudge? Uh, that's the kind of a thing a man doesn't like to talk about or remember, Kitty. When he takes a beating. You? I was just in from Missouri. Pretty green. Murdoch and some of his crowd were in town on a spree. But when their fun threatened to include scalping a hide freighter they didn't like, I stepped into it. Like I say, I was pretty green. They beat you, Matt? Left me for dead down by the river. You watch out for him. He's a troublemaker. Yeah. But right now, I want to find out why he's here. <laughs> Introducing one of the country's best-known jazz musicians and arrangers, Mr. Bobby Haggard. How about whistling along with him? Packs more pleasure. Packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. The more perfectly packed your cigarette, the more taste and mildness are released for you. Chesterfield made by exclusive Accuray as an open, easy draw that unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobaccos. Now, Accuray ensures an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed by Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. <laughs> I figured Murdoch was in Dodge outfitting a hunt, so I found the merchant who sold him supplies. He couldn't tell me much, except that Murdoch had an Indian with him for a skinner, and that they were camped somewhere outside town. It took me a while, but I found the camp. 
And when I came up, the Indian was alone. He was a young brave. And he was hunched over the fire, sharpening a long, curved skin and knife. It's all right. Go on. You're a long way from home, aren't you? What are you, Blackfoot? How do you know that? Ah, the scars on your wrists, the cut arms. Your people do that in mourning some close relative's death, don't they? Now, who are those for? Father, brother, mother? All right. My name's Matt Dillon. I'm a U.S. Marshal. How are you called? Well, what does Murdoch call you? When he is not angry, injured. And when he is? Dog eater. Ah. And he knows his Indian insults. What do your people call you? It means golden calf. Now, you're a breed, aren't you? I'm an Indian. Well, then what are you doing here so far from your tribe, skinning buffalo for a man like Murdoch? In the lodges at night, my people speak of the pale warrior with the long arm. Chase Murdoch, huh? When he was with us, his medicine was good. The plains were dark with buffalo. They gave the Indian all he needed. Food, clothes, beds, lodge skins. Now we do not have good medicine. The buffalo are gone. So you came looking for Murdoch, for long arm, to take him back? Yes. But he would not go, so I stay with him. And now you're going on a buffalo hunt with him into treaty territory, huh? He does not tell me where he goes. But I'll tell you. He's going to hunt among the few small herds that are left, given by the treaty to the Indian. I do not know that. Well, it's true. And if you do this, you're robbing your brothers of the little that's left to them. That's enough, Dylan. Uh, hello, Murdoch. Stand up, dog eater. Don't hit him again, Murdoch. I'll do as I please. You've got no right to come snooping, Dylan. Asking questions, trying to turn my skin against me. And the way you treat him, you'll turn him against yourself. And he may not be so friendly once you two are alone down in the Indian nations. I don't fear no Indian. Least of all him. I know him. Lived with him plenty of years. So I heard. They thought you were good medicine then, huh? Sure. I brought him the long arm. The first gun they ever seen. Gave him more meat than they ever seen, too. Sure, I was good medicine. Yeah, but you've changed some. <laughs> I'm not so romantic as I was. I can take him or leave him alone. Besides, Injun's day is done. A man don't need to walk easy with him no more. I wouldn't be too sure of that. Hmm. With this, I can be sure. Well, you still shoot a big 50, huh? Yeah. And I can load and fire as fast as another man with one of them new repeaters. And I can drop a buffalo near a mile. Or a man. He killed an engine once at 1,200 yards. Like to took off his head. You enjoy killing, don't you, Murdoch? Oh, I don't mind it. You know, 30 years on the plains have done something to you. Something crazy. Maybe you were a pioneer once, opening up the West, a loner doing what you had to do, making your own law. But your day's finished, Murdoch. You have to abide by the law now. Are you through, Dylan? I see by your outfit you're going light and fast. That must mean south. Well, I'm warning you, don't try it. I'll go where I aim to go. No cavalry will stop me. And I just hope you try all right, if that's the way you want it. You cross that line and I'll come after you.
Say, where are you listening to Gunsmoke? In your car? Getting ready for dinner? Oh, I see. Just relaxing in your favorite easy chair. I'd say you're in a good spot right now to really enjoy Chesterfield's better taste and mildness. You see, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. A more perfectly packed cigarette gives you an open, easy draw that unlocks all the better taste and mildness of fine tobaccos. And Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, is more perfectly packed. With an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Firm and pleasing to the lips. Mild, yet deeply satisfying. Remember, to the touch, to the taste. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. <laughs> I could have sent word to the colonel out at Fort Dodge and let the cavalry handle Murdoch. But this was something personal. It was a job I wanted to do myself. I couldn't touch Murdoch until he crossed the line into the Indian nation, so the next morning I just watched him drive out of town. I gave him a couple of hours, and then Chester and I started on his trail. Went straight south, across the Arkansas, into the nation's. I don't know, Mr. Dillon, it seems almost too easy. His wagon tracks in the snow going straight as a board as far as you can see over the next rise. Yeah, I know, Chester, but we better keep our eyes open. We should be getting close to him now. Well, I guess ain't nothing to worry about as long as we can see his tracks up ahead. Now, maybe not, but we'll come up on that rise easy. Just might be waiting for us on the other side. Well, I don't know, the way he ain't bothering to cover his trail, it seems like he ain't expecting us to follow him. Maybe he didn't believe you. I don't count on it. No, I... I swear this ain't the time of year for traveling, is it? Good time for buffalo hunting, though. Coats will be prime. And if I was... Mr. Dillon! Chester, you hit? No, sir, he, he didn't get me. He got my horse, but I'm pinned down. All right, I'll get you out. Mr. Dillon, look out. He's still shooting. All right, just stay flat behind a horse. Now, you pull your leg out when I lift up on the saddle, huh? Yes, sir, I will. There. Now, stay low. Mr. Dillon, where'd that shot come from? Well, I'm not sure, but I... Yeah. From over in that rim of rock there. It must have circled around. Yeah, we rode right into a trap. How's your leg? Well, it ain't broke, I don't think. But it hurts some, all right. Oh, I'm afraid I ain't going to be much use to you, Mr. Dillon. Now, don't worry about it, Chester. Well, what are we going to do? We can't just lay here in the snow. We'll freeze. That's probably what Murdoch's thinking. He sure planned it and got us pinned out here in the open. No cover anywhere is near. Mr. Dillon, my rifle's under the horse. Maybe we can... No, it wouldn't do any good anyway, Chester. It's too far. Only his buffalo gun has this range. Yes, sir. I guess... Rock. Where is it? Now he shot your horse, Mr. Dillon. There was no need for that. Yeah. He's showing us how great a hunter he is, Chester. What are we going to do without horses? Well, we'll worry about that later. Right now, there's one thing we can do. Get up to those rocks and rush him. Yeah, but how? Well, his big 50's a single shot. He's got to reload between shots. He's doing it mighty fast. Yeah, but while he is, I could be moving. Oh, Mr. Dillon, you wouldn't never make it. Why, that's 500 yards or more. Now, you got any other ideas, Chester? No, sir, I ain't bound. Darn this leg. It's all right, Chester. This isn't your fight anyway. Well, I think I'll draw a shot and see just how fast he can reload. No, no, Mr. Dillon. 
One, two, You're taking off three, of standing up like that, four, Mr. Dillon. Five. No. No. Oh. Right. All right. Now we know. Five seconds. That ain't very long. Now, that'll have to be long enough. Now, Chester. Yes, sir. Good luck, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Same to you, Chester. Hey, Murdoch! One, two, three, four, five. It's not like hunting buffalo, is it, Murdoch? One, two, three, four, five. Well, you're getting closer, Murdoch. One, two, three, four, five. Well, maybe he's caught on. Hey, Murdoch! You couldn't be out of ammunition, could you? I lay there half covered by the snow, knowing Murdoch might easily be holding me in the sights of his rifle. But I also knew I couldn't lie there much longer. I'd freeze before darkness could give me the cover I needed. Then I saw movement among the rocks. It was Golden Calf. He walked to the rim, then started down toward me. The body of Jace Murdoch, lifeless in his arms. I got up and went to meet him. And as I approached, Golden Calf stopped, and after a moment, he placed the body gently on the ground. Why did you do it, Golden Calf? I know now you spoke the truth. His medicine was not good. Not anymore. Is that the only reason you killed him? Here, now. All right, thanks, anyway. I'm going to have to take you back. But nobody will convict you for saving the life of a U.S. Marshal. Well, we're going to have to bury him. Yes. Here, wait a minute. Let me see your wrist. That's a new gash. Was Murdoch a relative of yours? He was my father. I am Golden Calf, the son of Long Oh. Well, all right, Golden Calf. Let's get started. with our star, William Conrad. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed, unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobaccos. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Firm and pleasing to the lips. Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. You know, the arrival of a Texas herd and Dodge usually meant celebrating and the general hurrahing of the town. But next week, a herd arrives with a murdered man. And that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke, 
Produced and directed by Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The special music for Gunsmoke was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Nestor Piva, Sam Edwards, and Harry Bartell. Harley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Smokers, this is it. L and M filters. So good to your taste, so quick on the draw. Make today your big red letter day, your L and M red letter day. Superior taste and filter, it's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day, change to L and M today. L and M, mmm, so good to your taste. So quick on the draw. Get L and M today. Relax with L and M. So good to your taste, so quick on the draw. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on gun smoke. Gunsmoke, brought to you by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> the marshal's office? Uh, yeah, come in, stranger. You're Marshal Dillon? I am. My name's Egan Marshal, Emmett Egan. I'm glad to know you. Uh, this is Chester Proudfoot. How do you do? Well, the purpose of my visit may surprise you, Marshal. <laughs> well, if it doesn't mean trouble, it sure will. I've just deposited $50,000 in the bank here. Huh? That's a lot of money, Egan. Well, it's taken me ever since the war to earn it. I've been up in Chicago, Marshal, running cattle auctions for a man named Swift, but I'm through with that now. No? I want to try something new. Marshal, I don't intend any insult, but if you need money, name your price. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't follow you, Egan. I want your job. What? I want to be Marshal here. <laughs> All right, say it out, Egan. I'm serious, Marshal. No tricks to this. I've been to Washington, and the War Department's endorsed my application, but they tell me there are no openings, so I came to Dodge. I thought if I can somehow persuade you to quit, maybe they'll put me on here. I think you are serious. Oh, I am. It's simple enough. I'm tired of the kind of work I was doing, and I want to try this, something exciting. Oh, I see. 
What would you advise me to do, Marshal? Go back to Chicago. You're a lot safer there. You think I'm not qualified to be a lawman? Well, you're wearing a gun. Well, I'm accustomed to authority, Marshal. I was a major under General McClellan. Took my first bullet in the Chickahominy in 62. I see. Uh, is this your first trip to the frontier, Mr. Egan? It's my first since 67. Uh-huh. Well, I still advise you to go back to Chicago. No, Marshal. All right, Mr. Egan, you want this job so bad, you can have it, as far as I'm concerned. Now, Mr. Dillon... There's I... very little money in it and absolutely no thanks. I've been a live target for every drunken bum and glory hunter in Kansas about long enough. You mean it, Marshal? Yeah. But on one condition. Yeah? That you hang around for a week, see what it's like. And then if you still want it... Oh, I'll want it all right. All right, then we'll start right now. I'm ready. What do we do first? You all set, Chester? My. Yes, sir, I guess so. All right, then follow me. That whistling man, Bobby Haggard, really started something. Tonight, the Calypso boys join in. Ready, amigos? Packs more pleasure. Packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure. Because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. The more perfectly packed your cigarette, the more taste and mildness are released for you. Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, has an open, easy draw that unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobaccos. Now, Accuray ensures an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. Why, Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. Why don't you sit down and rest a spell, Mr. Egan? No, thanks. You're going to wear yourself out walking up and down that way. Yeah. You got a match, Chester. Mm-hmm. Here, Red. Here. No, oh, thanks. <laughs> this dog sure ain't very lively today, is it? No, not very. If I only had me a knife, I could do a little whittling. Oh, what happened to your knife, Chester? Well, it was about wore out, so I traded it to a small kid I know. Her <laughs> flipper. <laughs> Why don't you get yourself another one? Mr. Dillon, I am so mean poor, I just couldn't stand the outlay of oh, my knife. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot. Hey, look there. Somebody hadn't ought to be in town. Oh, where? Who? That fella coming up the street, riding that sway back to old broodmare, see him? He looks like a farmer. <laughs> if you call a man whose wife holds a ten-yard patch of mealy potatoes a farmer, then he's one, all right. You said he shouldn't be in town. He can't be very dangerous. He's dangerous to himself. Oh, what do you mean? Why, he gets the doggone drunk every time he comes in here. He can't hardly climb back up on that old mare. And when he does, he usually falls off summers before he gets home and lays out there on the prairie all night like a dead man. It's a pure wonder he ain't been at by something. Oh. Marshal, we've been hanging around this porch for three hours. I'm beginning to feel like a bum myself. Now, that's part of the job, Egan. Keeping an eye on things, we call it. Keeping an eye on things? You and Chester both are fighting to stay awake. Are you calling it quits, Egan? Oh, no. Of course not. 
And let's go get a cup of coffee, huh? It'll be dark soon, and we can start making the rounds. What's the name of this place, Marshal? It's called the Long Branch. Oh, here comes somebody you ought to know. Good evening, ma'am. Oh, Kitty. How long have you been sitting here? Ah, uh, not long. Uh, Kitty, this is Emmett Egan. How do you do, Miss Kitty? Mr. Egan? Oh, I sit down. Uh-huh. I, uh, I hear you may be our new marshal. What? Now, how in the world... Well, Chester was in a while ago. It's true, isn't it? Well, it isn't exactly as settled yet, Miss Kitty. But you want the job. Yes. Why? Well, let's say I was bored with what I was doing. Oh, sure. That's happened to a lot of ex-soldiers. I can't stand peacetime. Uh, me in particular, I guess. Why don't you re-enlist? The cavalry keeps busy out here. I tried that, Miss Kitty. You did? Back in 67. 67? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. The Cheyenne and the Sioux were real active that year, weren't they? Yes, they were, but not where the cavalry was. Wait a minute. Uh, were you a General Hancock? That's right, Marshal. We took to the field for four months. We marched and countermarched all over this country, and then we returned to Fort Harker. Well, what was wrong with that? Well, all we did was burn one empty village, kill two young Cheyenne braves, both of whom we later found out were friendly. It took 1,100 men to do that. Oh. Mr. Dillon. Yeah, what is it, Chester? I, I don't know for sure, but I hear there's some kind of trouble down at Moss Grimmick State. Well, huh? it's about time something happened around here. Yeah. Now, don't forget, Egan. When it does, somebody usually dies. What's the trouble here, men? Where's Moss Grimmick, Chester? Well, he ain't here, Mr. Dillon. They say Leonard Fibbs there is the one who knows about it. Oh, Fibbs, a little sodbuster? Yes, sir. Uh, hey, Fibbs. Come here. What's going on here, Fibs? Inside, Marshal. Back there in the stall. Oh, what's back there? Bad, Marshal. Real bad. Don't nobody go in there. It's real bad. What is? Who's in there, Fibs? Not even you, Marshal. Not nobody. Leave him alone, I'm warning you. Oh, he ain't got good sense, Mr. Dillon. No, you stop him. It's, it's real bad in there. Yeah, something's got him scared half to death. I'm going to go take a look. You stay here, Chester. I'm going with you, Marshal. Look, Egan, I don't know what's in there. It could be a crazy man with a gun looking for blood. It could be anything. Action is what I came here for, Marshal, and you said I could hang around. All right. But you get out of the way if there's any shooting. I'm not entirely a novice with a gun, Marshal. No, but you're not a professional either. Now stay at least ten paces behind me. Right. You see anything? No. It's Marshal Dillon. Who's in here? Come on, speak up. Maybe he's hiding, waiting for you. Well, he can't see me any better than I can see him. You're taking an awful chance, Marshal. You stay where you are, Egan. What? Now, what's this? Ah. Chester, bring a lantern. All right, Egan. What is it, Marshal? Nothing we have to kill. What do you mean? You'll see when Chester brings the light. Oh, he's coming. What have you found, Mr. Dillon? Hold the lantern over here, Chester. That's your work. Oh, my goodness. Somebody's gone and hung, man. So that's it. That poor devil. Was this a lynching, Marshal? No, Egan, that's old Tom Sanders. He's been drunk for 20 years. Yeah, I guess he finally decided to break the habit. Uh, you won't get any action out of this. Uh, 
Well, they get it. It's been nearly a week. Enough excitement for you? I must admit, Marshal, it's not quite what I'd expected. Somehow I had the idea Marshal was always busy doing things. You mean gunfighting? I've told you I don't think gunfighting is necessary. Yeah, I remember. Any man accustomed to command should be able to control these Dodge City ruffians without much trouble. I only draw my gun as a last resort, Egan. And besides, you haven't seen any of these men in action yet. I still want the job, Marshal. Yeah, I know. Oh, uh, Matt? Yeah, come on in, Doc. Uh, say, Matt, you'd better get over the Texas Trail. Oh? You know those fellas Gear and Bozeman? Yeah, I know them. Well, they've got that poor little Leonard Fibbs at the bar there, and they're trying to make him pay for their drinks. He's broke, of course, so they're beating him up. They're doing it real slowly, bit by bit. I tell you, it just makes you sick to watch it. All right, Doc. Wait, Marshal. Yeah, what? Let me handle this. Look, Egan, Gear and Bozeman may be a couple of bullies, but that doesn't mean they're not dangerous. They are. Are you afraid I might be able to handle them, Marshal? Well? Okay, go ahead. Here, take my badge. Tell them you're a deputy. Thank you, Marshal. You gotta learn one way or the other. Where are you listening to Gunsmoke? In your favorite easy chair? Or... Out driving? Oh, there you are. In the kitchen. Say, you want to make whatever you're doing more enjoyable? Have a Chesterfield. Enjoy Chesterfield's better taste and mildness. You see, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. A more perfectly packed cigarette gives you an open, easy draw that unlocks all the better taste and mildness of fine tobaccos. And Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, is more perfectly packed, with an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Remember, to the touch to the taste. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Buy Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. I knew you wouldn't leave Mr. Egan all alone. Nobody will look for us coming in the back door. And let's move a little closer. Egan's facing him, Mr. Dunn. Yeah. Oh, look at poor little Bim. They got him all bloody. What makes you think you can do this to a man? Is there no law where you come from? We come from Dodge, Mr. Deputy. Where do you come from? Are you Bozeman or Gear? I'm Bozeman, Mr. Deputy. I'm the one who generally does the talking, but we both do the fighting. You're out of order, Bozeman. What's that? I said you're out of order. I will not tolerate your insolence. I'm not sure, Mr. Deputy. Are you saying you don't like us? That's enough. You and Gear will turn and face the bar while I take your guns. You're the most doggone foolish man I ever saw, Mr. Deputy. Do as I say. Why? Because you're wearing a badge? That's reason enough. Now, Mr. Deputy... That may be reason enough There'll for you. There'll be no shooting. I'm ordering you to face the bar. I guess there's no use talking to you, Mr. Deputy. I'll take him along here. He's, he's going to... Hold it, Bozeman! Oh. All right, that's enough. Now, well, go ahead, Bozeman. Try it again. Now, wait, Marshal. You knew he couldn't handle a gun. You know I can, is that it? Your gun against two of us? Quit talking, Bozeman. Don't try it, Gear. All right, then do as my deputy told you. Face the bar. Sure. Sure, Marshal. (laughs) 
Chester. Want me to lock him up, Mr. Dillon? Here are the guns, Chester. I'll be at Doc's. Maybe he can save Bozeman here from hanging. Yeah, it's getting light out, Doc. It generally does this time of morning. Yeah, but I'm not generally sitting up waiting for a man to die. He isn't going to die, Matt. Well, I saw what that bullet did to him. You feel guilty, don't you, Matt? <sighs> Wouldn't you, Doc? Yes, I guess I would. Doc? Oh, what? Well, he's conscious. Well, how do you feel, Egan? Pretty fair, Doc. I've been lying here, listening to you talk. Well, you mean you've been conscious for some time? Half hour, maybe. I wanted to get my head clear. Well, a few weeks in bed, and it'll be clear enough. I guess I was lucky. If that bullet had gone one inch to the left, you'd have died on the floor again. You were lucky, all right. <laughs> God protects fools and drunkards, isn't it? Marshal Dillon. Yeah. I heard you saying you felt guilty about this. It wasn't your fault. And I should have known what had happened. But I heard you telling Doc how it happened. You faced them the same way I did. They didn't shoot you. It's a little different with me, Egan. How? This is my profession. I've handled enough men to be professional. Egan, why do you think Bozeman did what I told him to do? Because he knew you'd shoot if he didn't? He not only knew I'd shoot, he knew I'd kill him. He knows I can handle a gun pretty well. And that part of the profession they don't teach in the Army. It takes years and years to learn. Well, I can't complain anymore about there not being enough action, can I, Marshal? Hey, your week's up today, Egan. Do you want the job? <laughs> Marshal, you ever been in California? Not for some time. I hear things are pretty active out there. I'll write you and tell you all about it. Our star, William Conrad. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. Unlocks all the pleasure of fine tobacco. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. Firm and pleasing to the lips, Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. You know, there were a lot of ways for death to come to a man on the frontier. All of them hard. But next week, a man meets death the hardest way of all. At the end of a rope. But that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke. Produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were John Daner, James Nusser, and Harry Bartell. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Smokers, this is it. L and M Filters. So good to your taste, so quick on the draw. Make today your big red letter day, your L and M red letter day. Superior taste and filter, it's the miracle tip. Make today your big red letter day. Change to L and M today. L and M. Mm.
Mmm, so good to your taste. So quick on the draw. Get L&M today. Relax with L&M. So good to your taste. So quick on the draw. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on gun smoke. by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> fellow riding in, Morgan? He's a stranger for sure, Abe. Mm. That brand on his horse, I can't even read it. Good horse, though. No. Get down, stranger. Who are you, men? Well, we're the Curry brothers. We own this ranch. How far is it to Dodge? Sixty miles, if you're riding a straight line. I want some grain for my horse. Where is it? Look, stranger, we got no grain. We're fresh out. Now, Abe, if he wants a little grain... Then he can act more polite about it. Oh, mean I've been polite enough for you? Maybe I ought to change my ways just for you. What are you, anyway? Some kid who thinks he's a man just because he's wearing a gun for the first time? Mister, I've been wearing a gun eight years, ever since I was 16. That makes you 24 and still a kid that ought to be taken out to the shed. You aim to take me out, mister? Well, somebody ought to. A lot of men have tried. I guess it's your turn now. Go ahead, you're wearing the gun. Oh, now, we won't have any fighting. You watch your temper, Abe. The kid don't mean nothing. The name's Tom Clegg. I ain't a kid. All right, Clegg. Forget it. You too, Abe. Well... Say you're sorry, mister. Say what? You heard me. Are you crazy? Maybe this will help you. Now draw. No, Abe. Abe, don't move, mister. You killed him. You killed my brother. 
Well, he hardly got his hand on his gun. Why don't you try me? Abe wasn't no gunfighter. Neither am I. Then I'll tell you what. You practice a little. I'll be in Dodge for a spell. Come see me. There is a good-looking horse, Mr. John. Oh, which one, Chester? That big bay that young fellow just getting off of there. Oh? Well, ain't he? Well, I wasn't looking at the horse, Chester. Oh, you know that fellow? Yeah, maybe. What are you people staring at? Aren't you Tom Clegg? What? Matt Dillon. At Las Cruces about eight years ago, wasn't it? Exactly eight years ago. I've changed some since then, Marshal Dillon. Yeah, I'm a Marshal. Uh, this is Chester Proudfoot, Clegg. How do you do? Hello. Oh, please. Well, Marshal, I suppose you're remembering how I didn't dare draw on that fellow in Las Cruces. You were smart not to. He'd have killed you, sure. I left there. I went out by myself. I practiced for two years, every day. I got pretty good with a gun, Marshal. Did you? That fellow's dead now. I went back and I killed him. Yeah, there wasn't much of a quarrel, Clegg. I don't need much, Marshal. Oh, I've killed a lot of men since then. But don't you worry about me. They always draw first. Are you telling me you've turned gunman, huh? I've got me a pretty fair reputation in New Mexico. And now you want to be known in Kansas. That's why you came here. I didn't say that. I know you're kind, Clegg. I ought to. I've killed enough of them. <laughs> Not me, Marshal. You ain't going to kill me. I'm too fast for you and I'm too smart. I'll show you someday. That whistling man, Bobby Haggard, really started something. Tonight, the Calypso boys join in. Ready, amigos? Packs more pleasure. Packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure. Because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better, smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. Chester. Chester, I'm coming, Mr. Dillon. What was it you wanted? You all threw out there? Well, I'm through the one I was trying to open that back door again. I guess it won't never get fixed proper less than you just build us in the Oh, Morgan Curry. All right, come on in, Morgan. Oh, Chester. Where's Abe at? It's about Abe. I come to see the marshal. Uh, is something wrong, Morgan? Marshal, you've known me and Abe a long time. I sure have. Would you say I'm a man who tells lies? You know the answer to that, Morgan. And I'll say it short. A fellow rode up to the ranch day before yesterday, and him and Abe got into a little argument, but Abe was about willing to call it off when this fellow slapped him. 
And Abe went for his gun, huh? He never had a chance, Marshal. This fellow was the fastest man I ever seen. Did you say his name, Morgan? Tom Clegg. Yeah, I thought so. He's a killer, Marshal. He made Abe draw. That's what he means about being smart. No man can take being slapped. That ain't self-defense, Marshal, and he can't claim it is. The law says he can, Marshal. Look, Marshal, I ain't a coward. You know that, but there's no use my facing him. He'd kill me easy as he did Abe. Now, what good would that do? I wish I could help you, Morgan. Well, it ain't just me, Marshal. It's all the men he's going to kill before he's through. Somebody's got to stop him. Somebody will. Someday. Now, before he kills any more men. Well, it's like poisoning a wolf. Don't you see that? Morgan, I'm a lawman. When Tom Clegg breaks the law, I'll go after him. But until he does, there's nothing I can do. I don't know if you're fast enough for him, Marshal. But you're the only man I do know who might be. I'm not hired to gun men down, Morgan. He's got to be killed. And I'll admit the world would be better off without him. You said something about his being smart. Now, he claimed that. And we'll see how smart he is. Marshal, Tom Clegg's going to die, no matter what. He's going to die. Now one's my limit, Kitty. One? Oh, you're expecting trouble. I didn't say that. One beer said it. <laughs> you know me too well, Kitty. But you're right about my expecting trouble. Well, I already knew about that. I've watched Morgan Curry following Clegg in and out of here for two days now. I don't know what Morgan has in mind, Kitty, but I'm sure he doesn't plan to shoot Clegg in the back or anything like that. Well, he isn't even carrying a gun. Yeah, I know. He just stands around at a distance and sort of keeps an eye on Clegg. It's driving him crazy. But Morgan's not carrying a gun. It's made Clegg helpless to do anything about it. Maybe he's trying to get him into a fist fight, Matt. Ah, Clegg wouldn't fight him, Kitty. He knows he'd get torn apart. Oh, uh, beats me what he's up to. Well, I wish Morgan would go home and forget about it. Maybe it's you he's trying to shame, Matt. Me? What for? Uh, for not doing anything about Clegg murdering his brother. It wasn't murder, Kitty. Abe drew first. The way I heard it, Clegg made him draw. And I don't care what the law calls self-defense. Well, I have to, Kitty. I have to care. Yeah. I know, Matt. Well, there they are. What? Clegg. He just went to the bar. Morgan will be along directly. Yeah. Well, you keep an eye on him, Kitty. Me? Keep an eye on him? I got to ride out into the country tomorrow. I'm leaving before dawn so as I can get back early in the afternoon. Well, then you better get to bed. Good night, Matt. I'll see you tomorrow, Kitty. Sure. Marshal! I want to talk to you. I'll go ahead, Clegg. Talk. It's about him. Huh? Oh, Morgan. Hey, uh, Morgan. What are you calling him for? You want me, Marshal? Yeah. Clegg here wanted to talk to me about you, Morgan. I thought maybe you ought to hear it, too. Sure, he can hear it. I want him to stop following me around, that's all. Oh, why tell me that, Clegg? Because you've got to stop him. Me stop him? He isn't breaking any law. He ain't wearing a gun. A dirty coward. There's no law that a man has to wear a gun. It's know. making me jumpy. I don't like being stared at all the time. You got a guilty conscience about something, Clegg? You shut up. Why don't you take your gun off and shut me up, Clegg? You hear him, Marshal? You see what a coward he is? I can't help you, Clegg. Lock him up, Marshal. Go on, lock him up. You heard me. <laughs> yeah, I heard you. Then do it. Not very likely. All right. You're wearing a gun. Are you a coward, too, Marshal? Uh, Morgan, come outside. I want to talk to you. Okay, Marshal. 
You're both cowards. That's what you are, cowards. Why didn't you kill him in there, Marshal? That was your chance. I'm not a gunman, Morgan. I'm a lawman. Won't you ever understand that? Maybe I'm beginning to. Look, Morgan, it's no use. I'm not going to fight Clegg. Now, you can't use the law for your own revenge. That's not what it's for. Now, why don't you forget this and go back home? Marshal, do you think I'm a coward because I won't put on a gun and let him kill me? I don't know what to think, Morgan. You seem to be doing all the thinking these days. My brother Abe was murdered, Marshal. He was murdered. I'm sorry, Morgan, but there's nothing I can do. Now, good night. <laughs> you listening to Gunsmoke? In your favorite easy chair? Or out driving? Oh, there you are. In the kitchen. Say, you want to make whatever you're doing more enjoyable? Have a Chesterfield. Enjoy Chesterfield's better taste and mildness. You see, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. A more perfectly packed cigarette gives you an open, easy draw that unlocks all the better taste and mildness of fine tobaccos. And Chesterfield, made by exclusive Accuray, is more perfectly packed, with an even distribution of tobacco from one end of your Chesterfield to the other. Firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Remember, to the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. <laughs> Everybody, Chester. Why is the town so quiet this afternoon? Everybody seen you riding in, I guess. Huh? They've been waiting for you to get back. Waiting for me? Why? I told them you'd be back early afternoon. There's trouble here this morning, Mr. Dillon. You mean a shooting? Yes, sir. Morgan? Yes, sir. It was Morgan. Yeah, so he put on a gun after all, huh? No, sir. He was unarmed. What? He ain't dead, though. At least not yet. He's up at dark. Where's Clegg? Clegg must have saw you ride in, too. He's standing across the street now, behind you there. Ah. Well, I won't keep him waiting. I hear you shot another man, Clegg. He deserved it. Did he? I warned him about following me around. It drove me half crazy. So you stopped him. He slapped me. No man can take that. No. Not even his brother Abe could. <laughs> Say, I plumb forgot about that. You told me once how smart you are, Clegg. I guess you forgot about that, too. What do you mean? Morgan was unarmed. You gonna try to put me in jail, Marshal? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna try. Now you're forgetting I also told you I'm too fast for you. Maybe you uh, are. I'm arresting you, Clegg. Keep your eyes on mine, Marshal. I want to see the look in them when it hits you. That's the best part. Now? the shots, Matt. I see Clegg still lying there. Not if he's got any friends that can move him. I doubt if he has. 
man like that. Uh, I guess not, Doc. You did it the only way possible. I was trying to arrest him, Doc. I didn't walk out there to shoot him down. How's Morgan? With two bullets in him, he's doing as well as might be expected. I don't mean in what? He's dying, Matt. Yeah. Now, well, let's go see him. Matter of fact, there's no reason at all he should have lived this long. I can't understand it. Most men would have died on the spot, shot up the way he was. Morgan? Marshal, I heard some shooting. Didn't I? Yeah. Yeah, you did. Was you in it? I was. And plagues did, huh? That's how you wanted it, wasn't it? That, that's how I wanted it. It's what I've been hanging on for. Morgan, you knew he'd shoot you when you slapped him, didn't you? I had him on edge, Marshal. I planned it that way. Yeah, I thought so. And you were willing to die just to get me to face him, huh? There wasn't no other way. I couldn't have killed him myself. Well, I can't say I admire your thinking, but you're sure not a coward. He murdered my brother. He murdered me the same way. But we got him anyway. Didn't we? Didn't we, Mother? Well, he... He was right. He won. Even if he had to die to do it. Yeah. But you know something, Doc? I feel like a hangman. You made an executioner out of me. And I don't like it. I understand that, Matt. I... But you'll forget it. You'll forget it. In time. Yeah, sure. One more thing to forget. Our star, William Conrad. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. A cigarette made better and packed better smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips. Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. On the frontier, bands of marauding Indians weren't too uncommon. And next week, during an attack, three people are killed. But not by the Indians. And that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Ray Kemper and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards, Vic Perrin, and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Take a tip from the L&M people, the people who have put the pleasure back into cigarette smoking. Take the L&M Miracle Tip, the tip that lets all the flavor of superior tobaccos come rich, come clean, come easy. Once you light up an L&M, you'll understand why we say they're so good to your taste, so quick on the draw. It's the pure white Miracle Tip that adds so much to your enjoyment. So make today your Big Red Letter Day. 
change to L and M. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on gun smoke. by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Kitty, uh, <laughs> what's your hurry? I'm late for work, Matt. I should have been at the Long Branch an hour ago. I was just over there. The place is full of nothing but loafers. Why, there isn't a dollar in the crowd. <laughs> I never saw a loafer yet. It didn't have at least a few pennies hit out somewhere. <laughs> Maybe you're right, Kitty. Of course, sometimes you have to pull his boots off to find it. <laughs> That's all in the day's work. Mr. Dillon! Uh, who's that with Chester? No, I don't know him. Look at the spread of that man's feet, Matt. It looks like a buffalo. <laughs> yeah, they are pretty big, all right. Uh, I'll see you later, Matt. <laughs> okay, good luck, Kitty. Uh, Mr. Dillon, uh, this here is Mr. Uh-huh. and Miss Jollop. Uh, how, how do you do? You do? Uh, the Jollops has bought themselves old Mather place down at the head of Salt Fork. Ah, uh-huh. well, that's about 60 miles south of here, isn't it, Mr. Jollop? Well, that's what they tell me, Marshal. Of course, we ain't never been there. We're on our way now. Well, you'll have a good neighbor down there, Miss Jollop. Bob Oren lives only about 10 or 15 miles from you. Well, uh, that's what they want to see you about, Mr. Dillon. What? Well, we met this year, Bob Oren, right here in town today, Marshal. Oh, did you? No. See, we paid good money for that place. But, uh, well, my wife and me, we about to give up going down there. All we've been hearing about that country. And we met this Oren fellow down the Santa Fe Depot today. Now, he said it was all lies. And they want you to tell them the truth, Mr. Jones. Yes. What? Uh, the truth about what? About them Indians, Marshal. Them Comanches. Now, everybody but Bob Oren. 
Everybody says that country down there is just full of them. And he lives alone. He's got no woman with him. But me, uh, I didn't come west to get captured by no Indians. I've read about that. It's bad what they do to women. I don't intend to expose my wife to nothing like that, Marshal. We want you to tell us the truth, Marshal. You're the law here, and we'll believe you. Well, that was Comanche country, yeah, but it isn't anymore. I doubt if a single Indian's been seen down there for two or three years. Uh, they're all on the reservation now. Yeah. Is that the truth, Marshal? You swear that's the truth? Well, you can go out to Fort Dodge and ask the Army. They'll tell you. No, no, he'll believe you. Well, you can believe Bob Oren. He's lived there quite a while. All right, then. Laura? <sighs> Let's get going, Will. I'll brave it. All right. Uh, I've got a ride down your way in a few weeks. Uh, <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll come by and say hello. Oh, you'll be welcome, Marshal. Pleased to see you, Marshal. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Ain't you taking a little too much responsibility for that, Mr. Dillon? Now, what do you mean, Chester? Well, how can you say every Comanche in the country is on that reservation? I think they're taking a big chance. Maybe Bob Warren ain't seen none, but that don't mean nothing, not when it comes to Indians. A chance in the weather, too, Chester. And they know it. Yeah, maybe so. But I'm glad it wasn't me told them. I thought the old Mather place was right in them cottonwoods, Mr. Jones. Yeah, it was. Well, then the jollops must have moved it. I sure don't see no house. Look closer. Yeah, there's something there. Yeah. Why, it's all tore down. It's just a heap. Mr. dillon has been burned. They've had a fire out here. Looks that way. I don't see nobody around. No. Oh, oh. Let's have a look. My. There sure ain't much left, is there? Well, there's this. It's an arrow. Uh-huh. Comanche. Oh, and there's another one, half burned. Oh, my goodness. Hey, look at there, Mr. Dillon. Somebody made a grave. It's fresh dug, too. But it's only one grave. Yeah, it's not very deep, either. Just a few inches. You gonna dig it up? I gotta find out who it is, Chester. Oh. You mean if it's Mr. Jobs, then they took her alive. That's right. Yeah, but Comanches wouldn't bury nobody, Mr. Dillon. No, they wouldn't. It's her. She's been scalped. Oh, ain't that awful? Yeah, we'll have to bury her proper, Chester. Then we'll ride over to Bob Oren's. Maybe they got him, too. Yeah, well, where's Mr. Gallup? You think they took him prisoner? I don't know, Chester, but look sharp now. We don't want him to get us. You've heard Bobby Haggard whistling it on radio and television. Right now, a country-style version. Okay, partners? Packs more pleasure. Packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better, smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure. Because it's more perfectly packed by Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most.
Let's tie him to the rail here, Chester. All right, sir. Bob Warren, pretty lucky. Doesn't look like them Indians have been anywhere near here. From the tracks of the Jollops, there was a small party. Yeah, well, I know, but that wouldn't keep him from coming over here. Only a big party will hit every ranch, Chester. Small one attacks and then rides on for miles before trying it again. Now, wait a minute. What? Well, there's footprints. Well, there's lots of footprints all over. Yeah. Come on. Home. He's got to be. Didn't you notice that saddled horse in his corral? You gonna walk right in? Oren. Hey, Oren. It's Marshal Dillon. Oren. I told you there ain't nobody here, Mr. Dillon. I'll look in the kitchen, sir. He's here, Chester. Why, it's... It's Oren. He's been scalped, too. A bullet hole in his chest. Well, them Comanches was here after all. I don't know. You don't know? Well, they scalped him, didn't they? Did you ever hear of Indians killing a man and not setting fire to his place? No, I guess I never did. There are three horses in that corral. Even drunk an Indian wouldn't leave a horse behind. Yeah, but he's been scalped. Anybody with a sharp knife can scalp a man, Chester. You don't have to be an Indian to do that. What do you mean? Outside those tracks I stopped to look at. They're made by a man wearing boots. About the biggest boots I ever saw. You thinking of Will Jallop? Those tracks aren't more than two days old, and Bob Oren hasn't been dead any longer than that. Yeah, but Jallop wouldn't come scalp him, man. The Comanche's killed his wife, Chester. We don't know what happened to him, but my guess is he's alive. The Indians don't take male prisoners his age. But that don't say he done this to Bob Oren. Chester, there are only two people who told Jallop and his wife they'd be safe out here. Oren was one of them. Jallop's wife gets killed, he escapes somehow and comes here to take his revenge. He did to Oren what the Comanches did to her. That's awful hard to believe, Mr. Dillon. Well, he wouldn't be the first man driven crazy with grief. Well, maybe... But... And if it's true, I'm the next on his list. When we get back to Dodge, I got an idea Jallop will be there waiting for me. <laughs> Hello, Kitty. Sit down. Oh, any coffee left in that pot? Sure. And here's an extra cup. Ah, thanks. You look tired. Well, we rode all night, Kitty. I haven't been to bed yet. Uh, No, Chester came in the long branch. No luck, huh? Uh, Not so far. You could be wrong about him, Matt. Jollop might be in Colorado by now. Yeah, maybe. He might have killed Bob Oren, sure. But it's kind of hard to believe he'd come to Dodge looking to scalp a gun baron U.S. Marshal. Well, I'm beginning to think maybe you're right, Kitty. Maybe I made a mistake about the whole thing. But somebody killed Oren. Yeah, they sure did. Guess I better go out there and have another look around. With all those Comanches on the warpath? I oh, know there are only three or four of them, Kitty. Some young braves who jumped reservation last week. How do you know that? I reported the whole business to Major Honeyman at Fort Dodge. He told me about it. Well, even so, isn't he doing anything about them? Yeah. He put a company of troopers in the field. Sure. All they'll do is kick up a lot of dust. Probably. Well, Kitty, I think I'll turn in for a couple of hours, I... I need some sleep. That's the best idea you had yet. When Chester comes in, will you tell him I've gone to my room, huh? Yeah, I'll tell him that. Mr. Dillon! 
How did you see Kitty Chester? Uh, yes, sir, I did. I come in just after you left. I've been trying to catch you before you got to your room here. Oh, what is it? Did you find him? Uh, no, sir. No. Uh, what I want to know is, could I get some sleep, too? Well, of course, Chester. I thought you understood that. Mm. Well, then I'll go back to the office and lay down there. All right, I'll come by later tonight when I wake up. Huh? All right, sir. I'll see you then. Yeah. that gun there on the table. This here is a mighty short barrel shotgun, Marshal. I stole it off a of barber and, and it's loaded with buckshot. I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting hours. Busted in the back window, if that's what you're wondering. No, that's not what I'm wondering, Jollop. What? I'm wondering how you got away from those Comanches. Seen them coming. Climbed up one of them big cottonwood trees. They looked. They never found me. You mean you left your wife to fight him? I left her all right. You betcha I left her. Coward. Terrible, them Indians. It was terrible. But I fixed Bob Oren for it. He told me it was safe out there. Now I'm going to fix you. I'm going to take you right down by the river, Marshal. Going to fix you there. You just make one move on the way and I'll leave you in two big pieces. Now you walk. Say, where are you listening to Gunsmoke? In your car? Getting ready for dinner? Oh, I see. Just relaxing in your favorite easy chair. Well, I'd say you're in a good spot right now to really enjoy a Chesterfield. You see, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason. A cigarette made better and packed better smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch... To the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. It is pretty down here, isn't it? All them nice cottonwood trees. My wife liked them cottonwood trees out to our place, Marshal. She liked them a whole lot. Jollop killing me isn't going to get your wife back. And she was scared, Marshal. She was more scared than me, even. And I'll never get over it. Watching them painted devils ride up. I ever see another Indian, I... I'll kill myself. I'm still shaking. You weren't shaking so much you couldn't run off and leave your wife. You betcha I left her. I couldn't stand the sight of them savages. Well, that don't matter now. See here, Marshal, got a knife in my belt. 
Good long knife, and you know just what I'm going to do after I shoot you. Wait don't a minute, you? Be quiet. Don't you tell me to be quiet. quiet I, I said, listen. What? There's something in that clump of elder on the river bank over there. I don't see nothing. They're gone. You can't see them now, but they're out there. What? Wait a minute. They'll move any minute now. Who will, Marshal? What do you say? Indians. Who? There were three of them. They were standing right against the river. Oh, no. No, not Indians. Watch. Right there. You see one of them standing up. You see him? Where? Tell me, where is he? Shoot him, Jollop. Shoot him. Yes, I will. I, I can't see him. The... <coughs> no. Give me the gun, Jollop. Hit me, Marshal. You were stolen. Let go of it. No, I... <coughs> My chest you hit me in the chest. I couldn't get your finger off the trigger. Got to die. Bleeding all over. I'm sorry, Jollop. Oh, I shot myself. I shot everybody, Marshal. I'm the third one. The third? Oh, I ain't a coward like you think. I'm scared of Indians, but I didn't run off to leave my wife to them. Not alive, I didn't. You mean you shot her before they got there? You killed her? It was terrible, Marshal. She begged me to. Begged me. Before they could get her. Ain't been right since. Not till now. Now, I know I've done wrong. Killing Bob or trying to kill you, I've done wrong. But I'm all right now, Marshal. I'm all right now. Jollop. Yeah, I think maybe you are now. In a moment, our star, William Conrad. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. A cigarette made better and packed better smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips. Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. <laughs> You know, a horse and buggy frontier doctor was about the most useful and beloved citizen in any community. But next week, Dodge learns that a man has been killed and that it was Doc Adams who killed him. And that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. America's medical schools urgently need your help. Join the National Fund for Medical Education today. Write Medical Education, Box 313, New York City. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Live modern. Change to L&M. Only with L&M. Can you enjoy the full, exciting flavor of today's finest tobaccos through the modern miracle of the pure white miracle tip? So light up, free up, let your taste come alive. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Live modern. Change to L&M. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on gun smoke.
around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first time I saw Lena Wave, I should have resigned my job and gone to Texas on the fastest horse I could find. Handling a man is one thing, but uh, trying to handle a woman is another. Especially when she weighs some 200 pounds and is muscled like a mule and twice as ornery. Lena came to Dodge on a great draft horse with dark circles around its eyes. And she was leading an old jack mule that carried her boyfriend, Emmett Fitzgerald. And Emmett was a tired, pigeon-breasted little fellow with a green look in his face. They weren't a very handsome pair, but we were mightily impressed by him the day they rode up Front Street. I swear, Mr. Dillon, that woman must wear leather underwear. I don't know why she's leading his mule. The man doesn't look stout enough to run away if he wanted to. My, I'd sure hate to have her on my tail. Well, she's wearing a six-gun and built like a buffalo. Well, she sure isn't the gentlest-looking woman I ever saw. Oh, that poor little man, Mr. Dillon. He somehow gives me the feeling he's being carried around in a bird cage. Now, quiet, Chester. They'll hear you. Yes, sir. Oh, I never thought we'd make it, Lena. You mean you never thought you'd make it? Get off that mule. Sure, Lena. Here. I'll help you tie him up, Lena. Ow! You stepped on my foot! I'm sorry. Uh, Lena! That'll learn you to be a gentleman. <laughs> you up there! Stop that! <laughs> Who are you laughing at? Why... Nobody, ma'am. That's good. Because if I got the notion you was laughing at me or my man, I'd open you up. Oh, no. Oh, my, no. No, it, it, it was just something funny I heard the other day from a fella. What? What? What did you hear that was so funny? Well, I, I, I was sitting there and he come around and... And Think the... hard, mister. You remember, Mr. Dillon, you, you... Tell her. Please. Dillon? Why, you must be the marshal here. Oh, that's right, ma'am. Well, now, marshal, I'm proud to know you. My name's Lena Wave. Shake! Well, how do you do? Do. Over here, Emmett. Sure, Lena. Marshal, it's yours, Emmett Fitzgerald. Emmett? Glad to know you, Marshal. Emmett's a gambling man. Oh, is that so? I want you to know he's honest, Marshal. Ain't you, Emmett? Surely not. Say it. I'm honest. I only caught him cheating once, Marshal. Ain't that right, Emmett? I was in bed two weeks. She liked to kill me. Well, I'm glad to know that. Uh, about your being honest, I mean... Emmett will be running a game tonight. Right over there is as good a place as any. The Texas Trail. Uh, sure, sure. Glad to have you sit in, Marshal. And you can come, too, yes. if you watch your manners. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Emmett, I'd better feed you so you can get enough strength back to kneel them cards. Come on. Sure, Lena. <laughs> Well, 
Chester's been in that game over there for two hours, Matt. He must be losing. Well, he usually does, Kitty. How anybody could concentrate with Lena hulking around, I don't know. <laughs> she does keep an eye on things, doesn't she? You know, Matt, I feel kind of sorry for her. Oh, she can take care of herself. What is that? Being so big and not very pretty. After all, she is a woman. Uh, that's not too easy to tell, Kitty. You think she's in love with Emmett? Well, now, Kitty, I tell you, I haven't worked that out yet. Uh, I, I'm sure I've been studying on it, oh, though. Oh, Matt. <laughs> Every woman needs a man of some kind. Well, she's got one. Yeah. I feel sorry for him, too. Oh, Lena will take care of him. I know. But I'll bet he'd like to take care of Lena just once. After all, he's human. I tell you, that is not my hand. I had three aces. You accuse him of the cheating, and I'll shoot you dead. Uh, excuse me, Kitty. I better go fish Chester out of that. That Emmett was dealing, wasn't he? I'll blow a hole in you, mister. Right now. All right, hold it, Lena. She's about to shoot me, Mr. Dillon. You bet I am. Lena, I don't know what it's like where you came from, but just shoot anybody around here, and you're going to go to jail. You'd put a woman in jail? For shooting, I would. For fighting? What? This is what. Well, now, here, he, he, he can put in jail for that, too, now. Now, here. This <laughs> oh, the game's closed, gentlemen, for half an hour. I need some beer, Emmett. Come on. Sure, Lena. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, man, I don't care about this thing. Well, like that, it ain't fair. Uh, here, here, Chester. <laughs> Let me help you all. Oh, come on. Oh. There. Well, are you all right? Why didn't you stop her, Mr. Dillon? She might have killed me. Well, I, I, I don't know, Chester. I never fought with a woman. Well, I have, and I don't want no more of it. Well, you can't hit her. What can you do with her? Leave her alone. That's what I'm going to do. You know, Chester, Lena could get to be quite a problem. Well, she ain't going to be my problem. I'm getting out of here. Oh, hello, Doc. Hey, you gonna have some breakfast? Oh, eh, no, I've already eaten. We'll have some coffee, though. Oh, good. They had me up real early this morning. No? Who did? A couple of men Lena Wave got mad at. Huh? She used a bottle on them. Oh, were they hurt bad? Oh, she blooded them up some. It wasn't real serious, though. All they did was try to protect themselves. After all, what man's going to fight a woman? Yeah, that's true. But one of these days, some drunk's not going to realize she is a woman, and he'll shoot her. Hmm. You wonder if it hasn't happened already? <clears throat> oh, see, I hear Chester caught it all right when he accused Emma of trying to cheat him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he found out later that it wasn't true, Doc. The other boys were just playing a joke on him. They switched his cards while he, he was under the table looking for some chips that he'd dropped. Oh, wonder all oh, that. Oh, if you ask me, a man that'll leave his hand while he crawls around on the floor deserves anything that happens to him. Well, just about everything did. Mr. Dillon? Oh, here he is. Uh, He'll uh, tell you. Uh, Mr. Dillon? Oh, say, you better come too, Doc. Huh? Uh, what's the trouble, Chester? Lena Wave. She just shot a man over at the Dodge house. What? Oh, say, we better get... This man did, Chester? He sure is, Doc. Where's Lena? She's still there. Claims it was self-defense. Did you see it? Mm, yes, sir. I was right there. <sighs> Lena was getting her room key at the desk, and this buffalo hunter come in and grabbed her. Well, he was pretty drunk. Uh, drunk? At this hour of the morning, he was drunk? Well, I guess he'd been up all night, Doc. Anyhow, he tried to kiss her. He must have been drunk. He got her gun hand behind her back, and then he pushed her up again in the desk. Oh, she was swearing at him something terrible. Well, how did she shoot him, Chester? <sighs> Well, sir, she just ooched around and squirmed herself along the desk till she'd rubbed her six-gun around on the other side. Then she just pulled it out with her free hand and shot him in the belly. She did? Oh, oh my, she's quite a woman, ain't she? She sure is. She's waiting with Emmett right inside here, Mr. Dillon. Everybody else took cover. They're scared to death of her. Yes, she... What 
are you here for, Doc? Huh? You can't do him no good. Eh, well, I, I, I just come to take a look at him. Let's see. Oh, yes, he looks dead, all right. He's dead. Why did you kill him, Lena? Well, I had to protect myself, Marshal. Nobody else would, including Emmett here. I, I figured you'd take care of him yourself, Lena. You always do. Sure. But if you was a man, you'd do it for me. Now, Lena, look how big he is. He ain't very big anymore. All it takes is a gun, Emmett. Sure, Lena. There are too many people carrying guns around here already. I'm going to take yours, Lena. What for? I killed him in self-defense. He wasn't even armed. Except for that Bowie knife. You're forgetting something, Marshal. What? I'm a woman. So? So? You mean to tell me a woman ain't got the right to protect her virtue in this town? What do you men come to, anyway? Well, by, oh, by, oh, yes, she's got a point there. Uh, ain't no judge in the world that wouldn't call it self-defense. No, you're right, Lena. I keep forgetting. You know I'm right. Emmett, we ain't had breakfast yet, and I'm hungry. Come on. Sure, Lena. You know, I've been thinking, Mr. Dillon. Oh, what about, Chester? Well, old Lena could have let that fella kiss her this morning, just a little peck anyway, and she wouldn't have had to shoot him. Yeah, she could have, but she didn't. I declare, she's enough to curdle cream. Well, I hope everybody leaves her alone from now on. Marshal Dillon? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Nate Bannister. Well, I'm glad to know you. You won't be, if what I hear is true. Oh? Jim Henry was my friend, Marshal. Is that so? Nobody's going to shoot a friend of mine and get by with it. Not even a woman. He was drunk, Nate, and he was treating her bad. And it's no call to kill him. In this country, a woman's free to protect herself any way she can. Yeah. That's what everybody I've talked to say. Well? Don't sit with me. You going to arrest her? No. Okay, then. Now, wait a minute. What? Where are you going? I'm Marshal. I'm going to kill me a woman. <laughs> We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, this Monday night on CBS Radio's Suspense, hear Jeff Chandler in Death at Skrykerud Pond. It's an exciting trial in which a young man faces death because of his decisions made as a member of a World War II underground. It's a fascinating study in suspense. And it's yours to hear this Monday night over most of these same stations at the Star's Address. Monday, Suspense. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Nate Bannister was obviously a buffalo hunter, same as his friend who had been shot that morning. He was a huge man with a heavy black beard and Eyebrows so thick it was hard to tell if he was looking at you or not. I watched him as he stood in the doorway, having just said that he was going to kill Lena Wave. And I realized that a man that primitive was capable of doing anything, even shooting a woman. And I wasn't sure how to stop it, unless I shot him first. The way I was brought up, Marshal, that's what friends is for. If somebody kill you, 
and they got to kill them. You do any killing around here, Nate, and you'll be tried for it. Maybe. If you catch me. I'll catch you. Why you got to protect women, Marshal? Just because they're so weak and puny? Is that Nate Bannister? Huh? You heard me. Why? Yes, ma'am. I'm Nate Bannister. Well, they didn't tell me you was so big. Who didn't tell you? How'd you know my name? You've been spreading it around that if the marshal don't arrest me, you'll shoot me. That true? Are you leaning away? I am. And if there's going to be any shooting, I want in on it. Now, wait a minute, Lena. I ain't going to get bushwhacked by no dirty buffalo hunter, Marshal. Bushwhack? I wouldn't do that to nobody. Especially the uh, lady. Lady? Yes, ma'am. He called me a lady, Marshal. Well, you are, ain't you? Of course I am. Yeah, what's the matter with calling you one? Nothing. I kind of like it. Just because you ain't pale and skinny like ordinary women. No. Of course I ain't. Why, I... I never seen a woman like you. Nowhere. You're kind of admirable. <laughs> Listen to him, Marshal. Ain't he a one? Oh, I mean it. I sure do. Oh. I sure do. No, you don't. I'm too big. Too big? You want to be like all them little scrawny women? They can't do nothing. They're no good. They ain't. Oh, no. A real man needs someone, uh, 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 better than that. He does? Of course he does. Like me? Yeah. Like you. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what? You was going to shoot me a minute ago. Oh, no. I didn't mean nothing by that. Hey, come on. I'll buy you beer. We'll talk about it. Well, okay. Go on, Marshal. Yeah. Don't you worry about nothing, Marshal. <sighs> uh, Chester! Yes, sir. That jug of corn whiskey's still out back. Yes, sir. It was last time I looked. Go and get it. Those two make quite a couple, Matt. Look at them. They've been sitting there most all day. Yeah, a pretty shaggy pair of lovebirds, if you ask me. How's Emmett taking all this? Well, he didn't find him till a couple of hours ago. No? What happened? Who oh, where is he? Nate ran him off. He probably had done more, but Lena wouldn't let him. You know, Matt, I think underneath she's real fond of that little Emmett. Yeah? <laughs> and she's got a strange way of showing it. Women do sometimes. Well, it doesn't matter as long as she keeps out of trouble. She leads quite a life, doesn't she? Shoots a man in the morning and falls for his best friend in the afternoon. <laughs> she might have shot both of them if Nate hadn't started sweet-talking her. Well, he made her feel like a woman, that's what. Oh, sure. Nothing wrong with that, is there? It probably saved his life. All right, mister. Now you get away from her. I'm mad at Emmett. Yeah. You heard me. I thought you'd gone home. I ain't gone home. Not without Lena, I ain't. <laughs> yes, you are. Lena and me is going to get married. I didn't say that. I ain't had time to tell you. I'm... I'm warning you, mister. <laughs> Excuse me, Kitty. Yeah. I better stop this. <laughs> Look, fella. I'm going to kiss her. Watch. No. Hold it, Emmett. Oh! <laughs> All right, Emmett. Give me that derringer. Sure, Marshal. Chester, 
Yes, sir, here I am, Mr. Dillon. Get Nate's gun before he comes to. All right, sir, I'll get it. All right, then take him over to Doc's, huh? He doesn't look too bad hurt. No, sir, he ain't. I'll take care of him. Em. You shot him. I know. You shot him over me. Well, he was stealing you, Lena. And you went and shot him. I was kind of ashamed this morning when that other fella tried to kiss you. You're a man after all, Emmett. I couldn't stand losing you, Lena. Oh, I didn't care nothing about him. You didn't? No. I was just tired of not being treated like a woman. He called me a lady and kind of lost my head. That's all. Well, Emmett kind of lost his head, too, Lena. All right, Emmett. Come on. You're going to jail. No, Marshal, please. Come on. Get going, Emmett. All right. My husband goes to jail. So do I. Your husband? Of course. We've been married ten years, Marshal. I always knew it wasn't a mistake. Well, he's still going to jail. Please, Marshal, don't take him. Of course I'll take him. He just shot a man, didn't he? He was only protecting his lawful wedded wife. You've got to let me go with him. Well, I can't leave him now. I've been waiting ten years for him to treat me like a woman. Oh, please, Marshal. Look, Lena, there's been nothing but trouble since you hit Dodge. Please, Marshal. When Nate gets patched up, he'll be gunning for Emmett here. Emmett will kill him next time. All right, all right, Lena. Look, I'll tell you what I'll do. Get out of Dodge, both of you. Right now. You mean it? If you hurry. Oh, thank you, Marshal. Hey, let's go, Emmett. Wait a minute. What? Huh? Take my arm. All right. Now, Lena. Come on. Sure, Emmett. Sure. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg with Vic Perrin and John Daner. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Mr. and Mrs. North of CBS Radio get into an arty crowd, an artful crowd, too, when mixed paints and mixed emotions make murder. Hear a collector's item, Ham and Jerry's latest thriller, leading them a merry chase mid works of art before they nab their killer. It's on most of these same stations Tuesday night. On the same evening, you have a date for thrills with John Lund as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Don't forget. George Walsh speaking. Eve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, teaches you how to laugh Sundays on the CBS Radio Network. Now, Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes, is proud to present Gun Smoke.
around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. It's easy to do your whole tribe a big favor, Mother. Just for every big and little Indian in your camp, a breakfast bowl full of Post Toasties. Post Toasties, you know, are the heat good cornflakes. They're the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Fresh as fresh can be. Say, Post Toasties are crackling crisp. Sweet kernel corn flavor, toasted. That's Post Toasties. Post Toasties are packed with nourishment, too. A bowl of Post Toasties with sugar and milk helps your big braves and little Indians start the day right. Get Post Toasties soon. And now, Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. Nice day, Matt. The wind's gone down anyway. It sure was blowing last night. Uh, where were you, Doc? Uh, out at the Caldwell place. Mrs. Caldwell's expecting. Still? Mm. There was a false alarm last night. Oh, you ought to get some sleep while you can, Doc. Yes, I know. That's right where I'm headed. Doc Adams. Oh, hello, Ruth. I've been looking for you, Doc. Uh, Matt, this is Ruth Tucker. Sheely Tucker's son. Oh, hello, Ruth. We ain't met before, Marshal. No. How's Sheely these days? Uh, he's just like ever. But it's Ma I come to get Doc for. Well, what's the matter, Ruth? You know, she swallowed a nail, Doc. And it's hurting her bad. Mm, swallowed a nail, did she? Uh, how'd she do that? I told her not to, but she was fixing the chicken house anyway. And she had some nails in her mouth. Oh, you say it's hurting her. It's her stomach. She's got a terrible pain in her stomach. Oh, that's bad. I... Uh, I'll, I'll ride out with you right away, Ruth. As soon as I get my tools, may have to operate. You know Pa, Doc. You know how he is. Oh, yes. I forgot about him. Sheely doesn't like doctors, does he? He hates them. But he ain't there now. He's been out on the prairie the last couple of days. Oh? When will he be back? I don't know for sure. But Ma said to get you anyway. She doesn't want to die. Sheely'd cause trouble if he... Found me there, wouldn't he? He sure would. He'd beat you half to death. Well, maybe I better ride out with you, Doc, just in case Sheely comes home while you're there. Good idea, Matt. I think you better. Yeah, uh, Ruth, uh, go over to the Alifraganza and tell Chester I want him to go with us, will you? Sure, Marshal. <laughs> Chester. Doc's still working on her. Well, there's no sign of Sheely anyway. Well, that's some help. What's the matter with a man like that, Mr. Dillon? Hating doctors the way he does? I don't know, Chester. Probably there weren't any doctors around when he was young. And what was good enough for his father is good enough for him. Some fool notion like that, maybe. Sheely always was a mean old cuss, except for his horses. He's always treated horses like they're human. Did you ever notice that? Uh, Sheely isn't really a bad man, Chester. He's just ignorant and prejudiced because of his ignorance. If he'd have been here, he'd let Miss Tucker die rather than have Doc operate on her. Yeah, probably. Well, that's bad. To me, it is. 
Maybe if Doc saved him someday, he might get over his ideas. Oh, Sheely's never had a sick day in his life, I know of. Oh. Doc, you all through? Huh? Oh. Yes. Yes, I'm all through, Matt. How is she, Doc? Yeah. She's dead. Dead? I guess her heart couldn't take it. I, I don't know. I, I had to operate, though. She'd have died sure if I hadn't. Oh, it isn't your fault, Doc. You did all you could. I know, but... I always feel maybe if I'd have done it better, things like this wouldn't happen. Oh, you're not to blame, Doc. You, uh, want me to tell Ruth? Yeah, I've already told him. He's in there with her. Oh, how'd he take it? Yeah, he, he didn't say a word, Matt. Well, we better be getting back to Dodge, I guess. Yeah, you must be plumb wore out, Doc. Yeah, I am. Doc. Hey. Okay. Hey. Yes, Ruth. And you too, Marshal. You're going to have to help me. Well, we'll help you, Ruth. What is it? It's about Pa. I don't know what to tell him when he comes back. Hey, that's right. I, I kind of keep forgetting about him. Just tell him the truth, Ruth. Doc tried to save your mother, but he wasn't able to. Nobody could have. You don't know Pa very well, I guess. He just won't stand for it. Well, there's nothing he can do about it now. It's all over. Not for him, it won't be. Mm, uh, what do you mean, Ruth? Uh, when Pa says a thing, he means it. And he said none of us was ever to go near a doctor. Ruth, do you agree with your Pa's thinking? No. And neither did Ma. But we didn't dare cross him when he was around anyway. I'm afraid of him, Marshal. You'll have to stay here and tell him. Yeah, well, I, I can't stay. I, I have to get over to the Caldwell place. That baby's due any time now. But you can't go. Uh, on. All right, Ruth. All right, I'll stay here till he comes back. Uh, Chester, you better ride into town in case anybody's looking for me, huh? All right, you, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, it's a funny thing. How a doctor can lose one life and maybe bring another into the world all on the very same day. Yeah. Come on, Chester. We can ride partway together. That ought to do it, Ruth. I want her buried good, Marshal. How about a, a cross? You want to put up a cross? I'll let Pa decide that. Uh, oh, my gosh, Marshal. Here he comes now. Yeah, looks like he's been riding pretty hard. Pa always rides hard, but he takes mighty good care of his horses all the same. He's never hurt one yet. I know. Oh, oh my Lord. Hello there, Marshal. How are you, Sheely? What are you doing out here? What's this? Sheely, uh, your wife died. Ruth and I just finished burying her. She died? Uh, just a few hours ago. We didn't know when you were going to get back, so we went ahead and buried her. What'd she die of? Uh, she was holding some nails in her mouth, and she swallowed one of them. Oh. Roof, take this horse into the barn and dry him off. Sure, Pa. Rub him good now. I will, Pa. Don't let him near no water yet. I won't. What are you doing out here, Marshal? I came out with Doc. With who? Doc Adams. He did everything he could to save her life, Sheila. He cut on her, didn't he? He tried to get the nail out, if that's what you mean. She'd have died from it if he hadn't. 
cutting on her. That's what killed her. Look, Sheila, your wife was dying and Doc tried to save her. That's how it happened, no matter what you think. I've got no use for doctors. They're all croakers. That's what my old man called them, croakers. I kind of figured that's where all this came from. Julie, have you ever thought that your old man might have been wrong? Not about them, he wasn't. Hey, how'd Doc get here anyway? Who told him to come? Your wife wanted him. After all the times I've told her to stay away from doctors... I guess she didn't want to die, Sheila. She wanted a chance to live. Yeah, sure. And he'd come out here and killed her. Poor defenseless woman. Doc Adams will pay for this, Marshal. I'm telling you right you now. You lay a hand on Doc and I'll run you out of the country, Sheila. Maybe it won't be a hand I'll use, Marshal. Try anything like that and you'll hang for it. I'll find you no matter where you go. He killed my wife with his bungling butchery. He's a murderer. There isn't a man in Kansas who'd believe that. Doc's a pretty valuable citizen around here, Sheila. Not to me, he ain't. It's an eye for an eye, Marshal, like it says in the good book. You even try it and I'll throw you in jail. I don't try nothing. Then you'll hang. Will I, Marshal? What goes on at your house at breakfast? Well, you can take it from me. The best thing that can go on your breakfast table is Post Toasties. Yes, sir, Post Toasties, the heap good cornflakes. Those golden crisp cornflakes are the best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. You know how to prove it? Just pour out breakfast bowlfuls of Post Toasties for your whole tribe, and then watch how they enjoy them. Post Toasties are crisp and tasty. From the first bite down to the last spoonful, that sweet kernel corn flavor makes your breakfast. So always ask for Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes. Post Toasties, heat good cornflakes. The best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. Heat good cornflakes. Post Toasties, heat good cornflakes. Remember, Post Toasties is one of the famous triple wrap. Post cereals, guaranteed fresh, or triple your money back. Now back to Gunsmoke. I left Sheely Tucker standing by his wife's grave. And I rode back to Dodge. There was no use trying to convince the man that doctors aren't bunglers and murderers. I figured he'd have to experience the truth himself somehow. And there wasn't much chance of that, the way things stood. But what really worried me was his threat to get Doc. Ordinarily, Sheely was peaceable enough, but there was no telling what he might do now. Doc stayed at the Caldwell place that night and the next day, too. I thought he'd be safe there, and I didn't worry about him till the next evening. Kitty and I were having supper at the Dodge house. Matt, for a town that lives on the cattle trade, you'd think we'd be able to eat decent steaks. (laughs) You should have had the prairie chicken, Kitty. You didn't have to walk all the way from Texas. (laughs) That steak I had got carried. It was too old to walk. (laughs) I've never eaten prairie chicken, Matt. What's it taste like? Oh, a little chicken. A lot of prairie. (laughs) If I didn't know you better, I'd say you've been drinking. If I know you, you'll order steak next time anyway. I don't give up easy, Matt. Yeah, I know. Remember it, then. Sure. You don't know much about women, do you, Matt? Well, I'm learning. (laughs) Yeah. But at the pace you've set, I'll be in my grave before you're out of first grade. Well, it took me ten years to learn how to handle a six-gun. Well, that's the nicest compliment I've had all day. (laughs) Drink your coffee. i got to get out of here. Yes, sir, Mr. Dillon. Ah, here's Doc. Ah, hello, Matt. Kitty. How's Mrs. Caldwell, Doc? Yeah, gave birth to a 12-pound boy this afternoon. Ah, that's fine. 
Yes. Uh, that's not what I came to talk about, Matt. Somebody tried to shoot me on the way back from the Caldwell place. What? what? Who was it, Doc? Yeah, I didn't see him, and since I didn't have a gun, I rode straight ahead. Uh, fast. Where did this happen? Yeah, about a mile the other side of the grove. I should have come out and ridden back with you, Doc. You should have, huh? Well, yeah, then, uh, you know something about this? Yeah. Sheely Tucker, huh? He came back after you and Chester had left, Doc. He made some threats. Yes, I might have known it. But I'm not going to be a target for Sheely every time I go on a call in the country. I'm going out and see him, Matt. We'll have this out face to face. I don't think you can change his mind, Doc. But I'll go with you. And if he admits shooting at you this afternoon, I'll bring him back to jail. Maybe I'll bring him back anyway. Well, I should hope so. People around here would be in an awful fix without Doc. Well, then there's me too, Kitty. Oh, sure, Doc. I was thinking of you. We'll ride out in the morning, Doc. Yeah, good. Somebody in the corral there, man. Yeah, it looks like Sheely. It is. Him and Ruth both. Come on. Oh, oh. Well, let's leave them here. They'll stand. Hmm. They got a horse tied down in there, Mr. Dillon. Well, he's down, Chester, but he isn't tied. No, oh, by golly, he ain't. Oh, say, look at that. Yeah, I broke his leg. Now, that's too bad. Well, here we are. Oh, uh, Doc, I I'll go first in case Sheila gets excited. Oh, all right, man. Yeah. Go ahead, I'll close it. Hello, Sheila. Roof. Hello. You bring that croaker out here to kill my horse for me, Marshal? Uh, now, Sheila... Wait a minute, Doc. I'm sorry about your horse, Sheila. What happened? That bay's the finest animal I ever owned. I was just topping him off when he fell and busted his leg. No blame it. Oh, gee, that's too bad. It sure is. Roof, go on up to the house and fetch me my rifle. Okay, Pa. A terrible thing to lose a horse like this. Sheila, if you like... I'll do the shooting. Oh, thanks. I'll kill him myself. It's my job. You know, it's a funny thing. We always shoot a horse if it breaks a leg, but we wouldn't think of shooting a man when he does. You croakers got other ways of getting rid of people. Yeah, I'll overlook that, Sheely, but I'll tell you something. I don't want to hear nothing from you. Well, you, you like that horse, don't you? Of course I do. Well, then, don't shoot him. What? Well, look, Shelly, that horse is done for anyway, so it won't hurt to let me try to fix his leg the same way I would a man. It just might work. You mean put a cast on him? I do. I never heard of putting a cast on a horse, Doc. <laughs> Neither have I. It's crazy. I don't like it. Hmm? It's up to you, Shelly. I wouldn't have let you near my wife if I'd been here. Why should I let you fool with my horse? All right. All right, Sheila. Shoot your horse, and I'm taking you back to Dodge. What for? You're going to jail for trying to kill Doc yesterday. At least that's what Doc told me. Yeah, now, Matt, I didn't exactly Shut say... up, Doc. I ain't going to jail. I can't... Yes, even... you are. Unless maybe Doc changes his mind about charging you with attempted murder. Then I couldn't put you in jail. Oh? Yeah, no... No, uh, he couldn't then. Uh, you know, Sheely, I might get so busy working on this horse, I'd, I'd plain forget about everything else. I might even save the animal to boot. Well, make up your mind, Sheely. I gotta get back to Dodge. Well, all right. But you better make it work, Doc. I said I'd try. That's the best I can do. Ever. No matter who the patient is. Okay, Doc, you try. Try real hard, will you? I always do, Sheely. Real hard. Mm -hmm. 
Chester and Ruth made a fast trip into Dodge for a plaster of Paris and some muslin to go under it. And when they got back, Doc went to work. An hour later, he had a heavy cast on the horse's leg. And after giving Sheely some final instructions, he was finished. He promised to come back in a couple of weeks and put a lighter cast on, and then we left. Sheely didn't say much, but I knew if anything went wrong with that horse, he'd be after Doc again. However, six weeks went by before anything happened. Doc and I were hiding out in his office with a game of chess we'd started a few days earlier. Yeah, doggone rook of you sitting there, Matt. If, if I move my bishop, you'll be right in on that queen. That's the only move you got, Doc. All right. There you are, Matt. See what you can do with it. <laughs> a couple more of those and I'll get that queen. Doc. Well... Hello, Sheely. Doc, I've been looking everywhere for you, blast you. Why'd you put a sign on your door saying you were out? How come you're wearing a gun, Sheely? Man, it'd be a fool not to wear a gun in this town, Marshal. He'd be a worse fool to try to use it. Don't rile me. I'm in a bad enough temper already. What's wrong, Sheely? Uh, how's your horse? My horse is tied up right outside, Doc. What? Yeah, I took that second cast off myself. Then I rode him in here. Of course, I took it easy with him, Doc, real easy. And he ain't even limping. Well, what do you know? <laughs> By heaven, it works. Oh, that's fine, but uh, what are you so heated up about, Sheely? Well, you'd be heated up too, Marshal. If you'd been carrying a rotten tooth in your jaw as long as I have. You mean you're looking for a doctor, Sheely? Uh, I'm man enough to admit it, Marshal. Uh, well, now, Sheely, uh, you just sit down right over there and I'll see what I can do. Okay, Doc. Hey, this is the one right here. Uh, try to get it out, will you? Uh, I'll try, Sheely. That's the best I can ever do. Ever. That's good enough for me, Doc. Just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gunsmoke. Say, exciting things happen to breakfast when there are sugar crinkles at every place. Sure, new sugar crinkles make breakfast more fun than a circus. You know why? Sugar crinkles is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Not too sweet, the way some sugar-coated cereals seem to be, and not like others that aren't sweet enough. Sugar crinkles... Every golden crisp nugget of them is just right sweet. So try starting your day off just right with new sugar crinkles. And don't forget, when you're listening to the radio or watching television, sugar crinkles make great snacks. From the bowl or from the pack, for your breakfast or a snack, sugar crinkles are more fun than a circus. Try sugar crinkles soon. They're the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. So better get several packages. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards and Tom Tully. Harley Bear is Chester, Georgia Ellis is Kitty, and tonight Paul Fries played Doc. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Listen next week at this time when Gunsmoke will be brought to you by Sugar Crinkles. The sugar rice treat that's just right. Gun 
smoke. Brought to you by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Smoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. <laughs> Chester. Mr. Dillon? Are you going hunting? No. I saw all kinds of wild turkey about a mile down the Arkansas yesterday. I ain't going hunting, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> What's the gun and all the shells for, then? Well, shotguns was made for more than shooting birds with. Yeah, that's true. Well, Mr. Dillon, you ever hear me talk about Live Oak County? Uh, South Texas? Sure I have. According to you, it's a hideout for bandits. Yes, it is. And they've got a saying down there that if the law ever did catch any of them, there ain't enough good men around to act as a jury to try the bad ones. <laughs> well, that's very interesting, Chester, but you're a long way from Live Oak County now. Well, part of it's moved up here. What? Aza Ledbetter. He's in Dodge. Aza Ledbetter? Is he an outlaw? No, sir. But I seen him at the Long Branch, and there's only one thing he's here for, Mr. Dillon. Well, what? To kill me. Chester, are you going to tell me why Asa Ledbetter is here to kill you? It don't matter why, Mr. Dillon. Okay. I'm going to go in there and talk to him. I'd assume you didn't. I don't like people getting killed in Dodge, Chester. Even you. Now, you wait here, huh? Hello? Oh, say, you're the marshal. Your name Asa Ledbetter? How'd you know that? Chester told me. Chester? Yeah, Chester Proudfoot. <laughs> well, okay, marshal, he got my name right, but I don't recall his. What? I never heard no Chester Proudfoot. Glad to meet you, though. Buy a drink? Oh, thank you. Say, there was a fella in here a while ago, I remember, because he was staring at me so hard. He heard me say my name, too. I was talking to a cowboy about finding work around here. Where are you from, Ledbetter? Texas. What part? Amarillo. Ever been in South Texas? No, never have. Marshal, what's this all about? Now, Chester thinks that you came here to kill him. Now, just look here, Marshal. I don't know this Chester fellow. Never even heard of him. I don't go around murdering people. I hope that's true, Lenny. Of course it is. And I don't like nobody dragging down my good name, Marshal. Nobody he is. <laughs> so long. You just asked anybody from Amarillo about me, Marshal. They can tell you. Chester? I 
you like a darn fool standing out here. Are you sure you haven't got Asa Ledbetter mixed up with somebody else? Not hardly. Uh, he claims he never heard of you. Ah, he's been looking for me for years. Why, Chester? It don't matter why, Mr. Dillon. If I'm dead, all that matters is I'm dead. Why don't you take a few days off, huh? Go fishing or something. You don't believe me, do you? I didn't say that, Chester. Well, you'll be sorry, Mr. Dillon. You'll be real sorry. That whistling man, Bobby Haggart, really started something. Tonight, the Calypso Boys join in. Ready, amigos? Packs more pleasure. Packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure. Because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better, smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. Kitty, that was a real good dinner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and thank you. Thank me. Well, I, I thought you were paying for it. You're the one who needs a vacation, not Chester. Oh, but you're a rich woman, Kitty. <laughs> Let's talk about Chester. Does he really think Asa Ledbetter's after him? Well, that's what he says. It's not like Chester to make up a thing like that. No, no, no. You stay here. No, I'm going with you. It's a couple of drunken cowboys. Uh, you going after him? It's Chester, Matt, down there by the alley. Come on. Come on with his arm. Looks like he's been hurt. Yeah. He shot me, Mr. Dillon. He shot me. One of those cowboys? No, Asa Ledbetter. What? I seen them cussed cowboys coming, so I ducked in the alley here. And Ledbetter was down at the end of it, just waiting for me. I think he just hired them fellas to set up a commotion so he could get a shot at Here, him. let me see that arm. Bullet went right in here, Mr. Dillon. It didn't break nothing, though. Ah, Chester, you've been hurt worse than us a dozen times. Now, look, if you ducked in the alley, you were probably facing the street, weren't you? Yes, I was. All right, then Ledbetter wouldn't have been behind you. The bullet entered from in front. It was him, I tell you. Or the wild bullet from those cowboys. You think I'm lying? Well, I think you're worrying yourself into seeing things. I'm going up to Doc's, if I can make Now, it. wait a minute, Chester. Where's Ledbetter staying? Well, he, he told me the Dodge house, Matt. All right, I'll go talk to him. Sure, you go talk to him. How many times do I have to be shot around here before anybody believes me? been in your room here? Oh, I 
Been taking a nap, Marshal. Up until them drunks out there woke me up. Now, Chester says you tried to shoot him a few minutes ago. He's... Now, Marshal, I'm getting sick and tired of this Chester. What's he trying to do, anyway? He's pretty certain about it. Bound and determined to get me into trouble? I'd doggone if I know why. There must be some reason. Well, sure, and if there is, I don't know it. I'll be glad when I find me a job and get shut of this town. Never did hear nothing good about Dodge anyway. We try to keep it peaceful. Oh, sure, but it's like you say. Probably ain't enough good men left to act as jury to try the bad ones. Uh Uh-huh. Now, just where do they say that, Lippert? Oh. (laughs) I don't know. You heard it before, ain't you? Yeah, yeah, I've heard it before. It's a saying down in South Texas in Live Oak County. Well, that may be, Marshal. And I heard it in Amarillo. Now, ain't that possible? Yeah, I guess it is. Marshal, listen here. If I come here to kill a man, what did I be waiting around for? A change of weather? It don't make sense, does it? No. No, it doesn't make sense. Any part of it. Look, Doc. Well, it's just a scratch, man. A scratch? I suppose if I come in here scalped, you'd say the barber just give me too tight a haircut. Now, nah, just a be brave, boy. Yes, there we are. In a week, you'll never know you got hit. Well, it's a mercy it wasn't my gun arm. Chester, I told you Asa Ledbetter was in his room the whole time. You mean he told you? I asked the desk clerk on the way out. Then he was lying, too. Chester, how long since you've had a good night's sleep? Now, Doc, don't you start that. Well, you admit you didn't actually see Ledbetter in that alley. But next time you'll see him all right, won't you? Whether he's there or not. <laughs> Have you finished doctoring my wound? Oh, now, wait a minute. Getting mad won't help you. Well, maybe it will. Well, where are you going now? Who cares where out I'm going? Uh, he'll get over it, Doc. Yeah, I hope so. The only thing I can figure is that he's got this lead butter mixed up with somebody else. Yeah. But it'd certainly help if he'd say why he thinks he's after him. Because... Matt? Yeah, what is it? Though? Come over here to the window. Huh? What's going on? Look, down in the street. Well, I'd say he's a lead better. And Chester's standing there about to shoot him. Yeah, I'd better hurry, Doc. I'm just getting plumb good and tired of you. Then why don't you do something about it? Yes, sir. You stay out of this, Mr. Dillon. I don't like gunfighting, no matter who starts it. I didn't start it. He come here to shoot me. Marshal, he is crazy. He ought to be locked up. Sure, I'm crazy. I should have called y'all before. Now, you gonna fight or not? No, I ain't gonna fight. You scared? I've got no quarrel with you. Are you scared? Leave him alone, Chester. No. Then tell me what this is all about. No. Now, Chester, why don't you just go off and and get drunk or something? Chester. Now will you draw? Now will you? Oh, Marshal, I ain't going to take much more of him. I said, are you All right, Chester, that's enough. Now you come with me. You're a dirty coward. You come with me, I said. You're with him, ain't you? You and Doc and everybody. Maybe you are crazy, Chester. Sure. Oh, sure. Well, where are you going? I'm going to get me a drink. Alone. <laughs> Say, where are you listening to Gunsmoke? In your car? 
Getting ready for dinner? Oh, I see. Just relaxing in your favorite easy chair. Well, I'd say you're in a good spot right now to really enjoy a Chesterfield. You see, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason. A cigarette made better and packed better smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild, yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild. Yet they satisfy the most. That you, Doc? Oh, man. Why, it's three o'clock in the morning, man. Yeah. You've been on a call. Well, I haven't been romancing the ladies. Yeah. Oh, um, is Chester asleep? Yeah, he's asleep. But not in the office. Well, why not? Where is he? I locked him in a cell out back. You locked him in his... What? He got drunk, Doc. By sundown, he was as drunk as I ever saw him. Well, maybe he needed his mad. Maybe it'll bring him out all this. Well, something's got to. Yes, it does. Well, I'm going to go to bed. <clears throat> you better go, too. Yeah, I am, Doc. I think I'll use Chester's bed in the office tonight. Well, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, good night, Doc. Shotgun. All right, now get off that bed and get over to the window. Go on. Better. I'm going to sit down here and light the lamp now. But you just stand steady. The shotgun's right across my knees. Now, Chester, you and me, we're going... Marshal, what you doing here? Well, I was trying to get some sleep. Well, you don't sleep here. It's Chester's bed, all right. Where is he? Now, he's around. Somewhere. Where are you going? Stand still. Marshal, stand still. I mean it. Well, I was just going to close the back door here. You left it open. I want it open. All right. I'll open it wide. Here, Marshal, no call for it. All right, where's Chester at? I don't know where he is, Ledbetter. You're lying. Yeah, I'm lying. He got drunk this afternoon. You brought him over here. I thought you put him to bed, but since you didn't think but one place he'd be, right out there in a the cell behind you. You walk right past him on your way in, Ledbetter. Get out of that doorway, Marshal. No. I'll shoot you if you don't. You'll shoot Chester if I do. Now move, I, I say. I can't oblige you, Ledbetter. I'm I'll sorry. I'll kill you, Marshal. Don't shoot again, Chester. Mr. Dillon? Is he dead? Yeah. 
Yeah. You hit him in the head with the first shot, Chester. Pure luck. I heard you kick that door. It woke me up. So I wonder anything could wake you up tonight. Well, I don't feel so good, but I ain't drunk no more. Hey, you got me locked in here. Yeah, I thought of that, but I forgot to take your gun away from you. That was mighty careless of you, Mr. Dillon. Well, it doesn't matter now. You knew I had it. You were going to let him shoot at you so as he'd wake me up and I'd have a chance at him. I guess I was kindly wrong about you being against me. You know, it might have helped things if you'd have told me why Ledbetter was after you, Chester. I just couldn't, Mr. Dillon. Oh, why? It had to do with a lady. Oh. She's dead now. But I didn't want nobody talking about her. Saying her name. Nobody. Can you understand that? It'll be daylight soon, Chester. Let's go brew up some coffee, huh? Thank you, Mr. Yellen. Thank you. In a moment, our star, William Conrad. Vacation coming up soon. Here's how to pack more pleasure. Make sure you have a couple of cartons of Chesterfields in your suitcase or in your car's glove compartment. A touch tells you Chesterfields are firm, packed full. Your taste tells you they satisfy the most. So when you do your vacation shopping, ask your dealer for Chesterfields. Buy the carton. You know, the early frontier years were lusty and brawling. And men happily fought each other as a matter of course. But next week, it's the man who refuses to fight that causes all the trouble. And that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke. Produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston. With music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast was Lawrence Dobkin as Asa Ledbetter, Harley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Live modern. Change to L&M. Yes, have an L&M. No other cigarette you can buy, plain or filter, gives you the full, exciting flavor you get through the pure white L&M Miracle Tip. Through the modern Miracle Tip, L&M tastes richer, smokes cleaner, draws easier. So light up, free up, let your taste come alive. Live modern, smoke L&M. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gun Smoke. Smoke. Brought to you by Chesterfield. Chesterfield packs more pleasure.
because it's more perfectly packed, thanks to Accuray. They satisfy the most. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad, the transcribed story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. Morning, Kitty. Well, you're out early today. I'm a working man. I have to keep regular hours. Oh, then what were you doing at the Long Branch at 2 o'clock this morning? Uh, well, sometimes it's a regular 24 hours, <laughs> just like you. Well, at least I make good money at it. <laughs> Kitty, would you really like to see me settle down and run a saloon? You might get to like it. All right, I'll do it. When? But I'm about 50. <laughs> I thought so. Good morning, Miss Kitty. Oh, hello, Chester. Here's a letter for you, Mr. Jones. Oh, thanks, Chester. Uh, the envelope says it's from Judge Rambo over in Wichita. Mm hmm. Anything important? Yeah, it's a court order for eviction. Yeah. Seems Brandon Teak didn't file legally on his land over by Wagon Mount. Did you say Brandon Teak? How do you know him, Kitty? Everybody knew him, Ron Abilene. Yeah, he had a pretty bad reputation then, I guess. Doesn't he still? Well, I haven't seen him for some time, but uh, he's married now, and he's trying to prove up some land. Well, I don't envy you trying to put him off it. Brandon Teak never shoved very easy, that I recall. Well, uh, we'll ride out there this afternoon, Chester. Be sure your gun's loaded, Matt. Yeah, well, maybe I won't need it, Kitty. Want to bet? Uh, no, I guess not. You ask me, Teak's gone to build himself a mighty nice place out here, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's doing fine. Hello, Teak. Uh, hello, Marshal. Chester. How are you, Teak? What brings you out this way? Well, uh... Here, you, you might as well read it yourself. What's this? Court order. Immediate eviction. What's this all about, Marshal? I got my deed to this place. Yeah, but you failed to register it at the land office, Teak. Nobody told me about that. I'm sorry. You'll be a whole lot sorry you try to put me off this land, Marshal. Brandon, who are you talking to? Uh, uh, you stay inside, sir. It ain't nothing. Then it won't hurt if I come out. Uh, uh, this is my wife, Marshal Dillon and Chester Proudfoot. How do you do, Mr. Ma'am. Is there trouble, Brandon? They say we got no legal right to this place, Sarah. I didn't register the deed or some fool thing. Oh, no. Oh, no. don't you worry. Ain't nobody gonna move us off, law or no law. It's a court order, Teak. I ain't wore a gun since I got married, Marshal, but I can sure go put one on. We're going to have a child, Marshal. Most any day now. And we ain't moving. We ain't starting over again. Oh, if we have to, we can do it. 
I'd rather die and see you go to fighting again, Brandon. Now you think on it. It's a hard thing for a man to swallow, but I can't go get her. I ain't putting on my gun. Now, why don't you go in and tell her that? When will I tell her we got to get off the place? Oh, there's no hurry. What about that immediate eviction? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I'll be responsible for that. Well, I guess I ought to be, be grateful to you. No, no, Teague, not to me. <laughs> well, goodbye. Goodbye, Marshal. Chester. Bye, Teague. When are you going to put them off, Mr. Dillon? I'm going over to Wichita, Chester. I'll find out there. You've heard Bobby Haggard whistling it on radio and television. Right now, a country-style version. Okay, partners? more pleasure, packs more pleasure. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. It stands to reason a cigarette made better and packed better smokes better, tastes better, and Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips, mild yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield, mild, yet they satisfy the most. Judge. Uh, Marshal Dillon, what are you doing in Wichita? Well, I came to see you. Oh, that's so? It's about that court order you sent me, Judge. Which court order, Marshal? The one to evict Brandon Teak off his land near Wagon Mount. Oh, that. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, I remember. Uh, what's the trouble? Is he putting up a fight? No, he isn't. Well, he sure must have changed. I remember Teak around here. He was a wild one. Well, he's married now, Judge. As a matter of fact, they're expecting a child any day. A child? Mm-hmm. So, uh, I told him that uh, they could take their time about moving. Take their time? Yeah. That order was to evict them at once, Marshal. Yeah, I know that, Judge. There's no room for sentiment in the law, Marshal Dillon. What's right is right, and what's legal is legal. Look, Judge, Teak's been on that land for over a year. How come this business about failing to register his deed just came up? It was only recently brought to my attention. And who brought it to your attention? Uh, Lee Sprague. Not that it makes any difference. Lee Sprague, huh? He owns a lot of land around Wagon Mound, doesn't he? And he's filed on this. There's nothing irregular about it, Marshal, if that's what you're thinking. Well, legally, I'm sure everything's correct, Judge. You can't argue with facts, Marshal. Now stop being a sentimental fool and, and, and go do your duty. Brandon takes a changed man, Judge. He's done more than prove up that land. He's proved himself up, too. Homestead Act, 1862, paragraph 12. After one year, if the deed to such land is not duly recorded at the nearest government office... Oh, never office, mind, Judge. I know how it reads. Well, then start acting like it. I can hold even a United States Marshal in contempt of court, you know. Yeah. Yeah, sure you can. you got a lot of power, Judge. But there's only one thing wrong. And what's that? You never learned how to use it. Oh, 
Marshal Dillon. I want to talk to you, Sprague. Come in. Thank you. How'd you know I was in Dodge today? I found out. It's about Brandon Teak, Sprague. Something wrong? No, not legally. Uh, <laughs> Judge Rambo made that pretty clear. Want to tell me what's bothering you, Marshal? Yeah, sure. I think Brandon Teak deserves that land more than you do. Marshal, I'm in the land and cattle business, and I'm making out mighty well. No man can accuse me of ever doing anything illegal or dishonest. But everybody knows I practice sharp, and I'll go on practicing sharp, too. Even against a man like Teak, who's hung up his gun and settled down and tried to make a life for him and his family? What do you mean, his family? Uh, there's a child coming any day now. Then hmm. yeah. he's better off in town, Marshal. What? My wife stayed in the country. That's why I lost her. Looks to me I'm doing Teak a favor. You got an awful easy conscience, Sprague. No use arguing, Marshal. You got your order. Now go put them off. No, Sprague, I'm not going to do it. What? I couldn't hold my head up if I had any part of the kind of law you and Judge Rambo want. You mean that? I do. I ain't gonna let you stand in my way, Marshal. You're in for trouble. Brandon Teak and his missus both talking that fellow, Mr. Dillon. You recognize him, Chester? No, sir, I don't. He's a stranger to me. Ah. Looks like they're all head up over something, don't they? Yeah. Miss Teak hadn't ought to be standing out in the heat of the day this way. Will that Marshal Dillon settle this, Haley? He's got nothing to do with it no more. Ma'am. How do, Marshal? What's the trouble here, Teak? You told me there was no hurry about our leaving, Marshal. Ah, uh, wait a minute. Where'd you get that badge, mister? Who are you? I'm Jim Haley, Marshal. Deputy Sheriff from Wichita. Wichita? Well, how'd you get here? I took the Santa Fe to Dodge, then I rented me a horse. Answer me, Haley. Judge Rambo sent me. I guess he felt the law needed a little enforcing down this way. He's got a court order, Marshal, just like the one you had. It's plumb legal. And I want you people to pack up and be out of here by tomorrow. Just a minute, Haley. I can take care of him, Marshal. No, Brandon, there'll be no fighting. Now, sir, You I... ain't gonna do nothing except move, Teak, and right now. No! no. Woman, you let go my arm! Uh, uh, oh, Sarah! Uh, now, now, wait a minute, Marshal. She shouldn't have grabbed my arm like that. I was only trying to do... Get his gun, Chester. Yes, sir. Is she hurt, Teak? You all right, Sarah? I'll be all right. She only grabbed his arm. He's gone and hurt her, Marshal, flinging her off like that. Chester. Yes, sir. Jump on your horse and ride for Dodge, huh? Tell Doc to get out here fast. <laughs> Never coming out of that house. Yeah. It's been a long time, hasn't it? She, uh, she shouldn't have grabbed me. I, uh, I didn't mean to hurt her. Haley, why don't you keep quiet? Nobody wants to hear from you. Look, Mr. Dillon, there's Doc. Huh? You don't look none too happy. Well, Doc, the baby's dead, man. It's too bad. Well, I didn't do it. I, I only pushed her a little. I told I... you to shut up, Haley. There wasn't a chance of saving the baby. It's her I've been working on. And she's going to be all right now, man. Yeah. Well, good for that, anyway. Hey. Doc, tell you, Marshal. Hey, yeah, Tick. I'm sorry to hear it. Uh, 
I, I'm sorry, too, but you, you can't blame me for Haley, it. Haley, I just now promised my wife I wouldn't kill you. Don't make me break it. Come on, Haley. I'm taking you to Dodge with me. Hey, now, look here. Ain't you forgetting I'm a lawman, too, Marshal? I'd like to forget it. It doesn't make me very proud of being one. I come here to do a job, and I'm going to do it. I promised her I wouldn't kill you now, Haley, but you come back here, and I promise you I will. A man can only take so much. I'll be back. No, you won't. I'm throwing you in jail for a while. Jail? Teak, as soon as your wife's better, you come see me, huh? I don't know what I can do, but things aren't going on this way. <laughs> Where are you listening to Gunsmoke? In your kitchen? Getting ready for Sunday supper? Maybe in your living room, relaxing? Or... Out driving? Say, be sure and watch the road. But remember, there's pleasure ahead when you smoke Chesterfield. When you satisfy yourself with Chesterfield's better taste and mildness. It stands to reason. A cigarette made better and packed better... Smokes better, tastes better. And Chesterfield is more perfectly packed by Accuray. This electronic miracle removes human error in cigarette manufacture. So Accuray Chesterfield is firm and pleasing to the lips. Mild, yet deeply satisfying. Yes, Chesterfield gives you something no other cigarette can give you. Chesterfield packs more pleasure because Chesterfield's more perfectly packed. To the touch, to the taste, Chesterfield packs more pleasure because it's more perfectly packed. By Chesterfield. Mild, yet they satisfy the most. <laughs> Hello, Chester. Hello, Doc. Where's Matt, Chester? In the office, talking to Lee Sprague. Sprague? It's a little late to be talking to him, isn't it? I'd say so. You sure Brandon Teeth's coming to Dodge today, Doc? That's what he told me. There's a neighbor woman staying with his wife. Not that she really needs anybody now. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It's only been a week, but she's a strong woman. Mm. Well, here we are. Huh? Yeah, oh, my God, he did come. Hello, Doc. Chester. Oh, hello, hello Teak. How's the patient? Uh, she's pretty good, Doc. Being awful brave about it, but I know how she feels. Only time will cure that. I guess so. Yeah, Mr. Dillon's in the office, Teak. He wanted you to go right on in when you got here. Okay. Oh, hello, Teak. Come on in. You know Lee Sprague? Yeah, I know him. Hello, Teak. Uh, Sprague and I were over at the land office this morning. I think we got everything straightened out. What do you mean? Here. Take a look at this. What is it? That's a deed to the land you're on, Teak, and this time it's legally registered. Yeah, sure. In your name. That's right. You help him with this, Marshal? Well, I wanted to be sure that there weren't any loopholes, Teak. You know, if it wasn't for my wife, you people would have to shoot me off that place. Teak, I want to tell you something. Ain't you said enough, Sprague? No. Now, listen. I'm a greedy man, Teak, and I'll take anything I can get legally. But Marshal Dillon here has been talking pretty hard to me lately. Sure, and I've been listening to him, too. I guess I'd have gone right on, and I could have... I heard about your baby. Why should that matter to you? I lost my son, Teak. But I lost my wife, too. Are taking my land gonna help you? You tell him, Marshal. 
He's not taking your land, Teak. That deed's in his name, ain't it? Didn't you go along to be sure he didn't make any mistakes? There aren't any mistakes this time. Sprague can deed that land to anybody he wants to now. All clear. And it's yours. I'm not giving it to you. It's yours anyway. I'll, I'll tell Sarah. And I'll, I'll tell her she was right all along about, about not fighting. Yeah. Well, I... What about you, Marshal? Ain't there going to be trouble you jailing a deputy sheriff? <laughs> well, as soon as he gets back to Wichita, I suppose there might be some trouble, yeah. <laughs> but don't you worry about that, Teak. I've always wanted to see California anyway. moment our star, William Conrad. What's your idea of vacation pleasure? Mountains? Seashore? Lake? Wherever you go, here's an idea for your smoking pleasure. Take along a couple of cartons of Chesterfields. Chesterfields are firm, packed full, give you full-time flavor that's bound to make whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Vacation bound, buy Chesterfields, buy the carton mild, yet they satisfy the most. You know, on the frontier, a horse thief was often caught and hung because someone else's brand was on the animal he'd stolen. But next week, a man is hung because his horse has no brand at all. But that was the West. Good night. Gunsmoke, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Our story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Vic Perrin, Helen Cleeb, Paul Dubov, and Will Wright. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Live modern. Smoke L and M. Only with L&M can you enjoy the full, exciting flavor of today's finest tobaccos through the modern miracle of the pure white miracle tip. So light up, free up, let your taste come alive. Live modern. Smoke L&M. Live modern. Change to L&M. Join us again next week for another specially transcribed story on Gun Smoke. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. (laughs) 
Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man. Matt Dillon, the United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful. And a little lonely. <laughs> saddle, Mr. Dillon. I swear I'm so hungry I could eat a whole hog. Yeah? But with all the hog you got this morning's cooking on that stick right there, Chester. Is it done? Well, that depends on how hungry you are. It's done. <laughs> Thank you. E. <laughs> That's hot, ain't it? <laughs> sure will be good to get back to Dodd tonight and sleep in the bed again, won't I? You know something, Chester? Civilization's made you soft. Well, maybe so. But I get mighty tired of using my back for a mattress and my belly for a covering. <laughs> Obviously, you were born for greater things than rooting around on the prairie and living in the rain. It ain't been raining, Mr. Dillon. Uh, no, no, it hasn't, Chester. But it will. Sooner or later, it's bound to rain. Yes, sir. Wish we'd brought some more bacon. Say, Mr. Dillon, don't old man Granby live around here somewhere? Uh-huh. Well, maybe we could buy a little from him. According to what I've always heard, old Granby wouldn't lend anybody anything. Yeah. You really think he is a rich miser, like they say? Oh, I don't know, Chester. You know, sometimes a man's entirely different from his reputation. I only met Granby once or twice. He seemed like a nice enough old fellow. Mm. It's the same. I wouldn't want to live out here all alone with nothing but a few horses for company. Yeah, well, he's used to it. Yeah, but even if he does have a lot of money hid away somewhere, there's no place to spend it out here. Granby's pretty old for the pleasures Dodge has to offer, Chester. Oh, my gene, I hope I ain't never that old. <laughs> you know, at the rate you're burning yourself out, you never will be, so don't worry about it. Uh, Mr. Dillon, I live mighty quiet for a young fellow who's... Free and still full of blood and stuff? Sure. Oh, I do. Uh, look over yonder. Huh? Over there, that string of dust laying right on the ground there. Ain't that funny? Yeah, I've been watching that. Not on the ground, though. There's a dry wash that runs along there. I think somebody's driving the stock down it. Mm. Maybe it's old man Granby. Yeah, maybe. Why don't we go over and say hello, huh? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. If it is, old man Granby, maybe we might could just ask him by a little dab of bacon, reckon? Well, there's no harm in that. Oh. That looks like horses down there. Yes, sir. I can see their heads now. But I don't see nobody driving them. Yeah, it'll be long in a minute. Right, let's wait here. Yonder he comes. Now, that's not old Granby. Well, let's ride down and say hello anyway. Huh? That's Granby's brand on those horses. You must have hired him a hand. Yeah, maybe. Hello. Hello. You working for Granby? I ain't working for nobody, mister. Oh? And where is he? Where is who? Granby. I don't know no Granby. Those are his horses you're driving. They are? Yeah. I ain't driving them. What do you mean? They got ahead of me in the wash there, that's all. Oh, I see. You a cowboy? Yeah, sure. I'm a cowboy. Somehow you don't look like one. You don't ride like one, either. 
You're asking the questions, mister. And no decent cowboy would run another man's horses down a dry wash just because he didn't want to get up on the bank and ride around them. I told you, they got in front of him is all. How come you're not carrying a gun? Does a man have to carry a gun? No. But I'll bet you're the only man within a thousand miles of here who isn't carrying one. Well, maybe I got a better conscience than the rest of you. Maybe. Now look, mister, you've run those horses about five miles off of old Granby's place. You want to give us a hand, we'll run them back. I'm in a hurry. It won't take long. The old man might be a couple of days fighting them if we don't. You worry about him. I got to get in to die. We'll ride in with you afterwards. I ain't going to do it. It'd look a lot better if you did. I, um... I'd like to, mister, but I can't. I'm leaving now. So long. Well, forevermore, Mr. Dillon, you just gonna let him go? Wait a minute, Chester. I'm gonna let him hear what lead sounds like. No, don't shoot! Don't shoot me! All right, then ride back here. Don't kill me, mister. I'm not gonna kill you. Unless you try to run away. Why would I try to run away? You just did, Chester. Yes, sir. Ride down the bank and head those horses off. Start them back up the wash. We'll be out of here by the time they're back. All right, sir, Mr. Dillon. You stay right close to me, fellow. Don't you try anything smart. When we get to Granby's, if he says it's okay, then you can go wherever you like. I don't know Granby. I've never been there. And we'll show you the way. Come on, let's go. Another visit with Joe and Daphne Forsythe. Joe. Joe. Joe, stop reading that paper and talk to me. I'm listening. Go ahead. Well, I was talking to Mrs. Snyder today. You know, she's the one whose boy had 31% less cavities. Uh Uh-huh. Well, she thinks that we should buy bigger savings bonds. Uh Uh-huh. She says that when people can afford it, it makes more sense. Oh, she says there are a lot of different denominations. They start at $25, but then there are a 50, a 100, 200, and even $500 bonds. Is that so? And then with the ones we've already bought through the payroll savings plan, we'd have quite a nest egg. Uh-huh. Are you listening to me? Uh-huh. Did you know that the total accumulated compounded semi-annual interest of the Series E savings bond will amount to 93 and a third percent of the original purchasing price? Uh-huh. I thought so. Joe, what did I say? Uh, you said that United States savings bonds are a safe, easy way of investing. I did. That they help guard our country's freedom. And? They're the best investment in America's future. I said something else, too. Oh, yeah. You said that the total accumulated compounded semi-annual interest of the Series E savings bond will amount to 93 and one-third percent of the original purchase price. Well, now, how did you do that? Husband's trade secret. Granby sure can find his horses all right now, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, but I want this cowboy here to meet him. Now we'll see if he's in the house. I'll wait for you. Get off a horse, fellow. Go on. That's better. All right, come on. We'll take a look. What are you waiting for? Nothing. You go ahead, Chess. It looks like I'm going to have to herd this man in. Yes, sir. You've been kind of balky ever since we ran into you, haven't you? I just don't like being dragged around. I never did. Well, I just want you to meet old Granby. He'll be grateful for your help and run his horses back here. I know what you think, mister. 
You'd think I was stealing them horses. Well, I never heard of the old man. I was never near this place. So you told me, but you're here now. I ain't afraid of you or nobody. Now let's go into the house. Come on. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, Chester? Old, old Granby, he, he's in there. Well, what's wrong? Right in the room there, Mr. Dillon. He's he just hanging there. What? Somebody's went and hung him right in his own house. I don't want to see him no more. You you go take a look at him. Pull your gun and hold it on this man, Chester. If he makes some move, shoot him. Yes, sir. Now, you just stand right there real quiet like. I ain't going to do nothing. You sure ain't. Just because I happen to be in the country don't mean I killed nobody. Yeah. Mr. Dillon will decide about that. Who is this Mr. Dillon, anyway? He's a United States Marshal. That's who he is. Uh, a marshal. A marshal. Looks like you run into the wrong people, fella. Here, I'll hold your gun, Chester, and you'll search him. All right, sir. Here. Turn around. All right, take it easy. Now, the house is all torn up. You must have been looking for old Granby's money. I was never in that house. There ain't nothing on him. Not a thing. All right, Chester. Here's your gun. There, catch it. Thank you. What's your name, fellow? Trimble. Joe Trimble. Where are you from? Up north. Up north where? All over. What are you doing down here? Making a change. Sure. And some cowboy you ran into told you about Granby being rich. So you came here and you kicked the old man around and then you hung him and then you tried to find the money. That's a lie. This is the first time I was ever near the place. I'm sure you did it, Trimble, but I wish I had more evidence. The court of law just might not convict you the way things stand. You're going to let me go? No, I'm not going to let you go. I'm arresting you, and you're going to stand trial, and I'm going to do my best to see you hung. I didn't do it, I tell you. And I'll go free, too. You'll see. Now, there's something mighty wrong about you, Trimble, and I can't figure it at all. But I'm sure going to find out. <laughs> Another visit with Joe and Daphne Forsythe. Hey, honey, I'm home. Daphne. Drop dead. Uh-oh, what's the matter, honey? Don't you speak to me, you you Don Juan. Don Juan? Daphne, I'm no Don Juan. No hobble espanol. Very funny. Ha, ha, ha. Well, it was no prize winner, but... No. Neither are you, you, you Lothario. I've often wondered, what's a Lothario? I don't know, but that's what the wives on TV always call their husbands. I guess it applies. Do you want me to go out and come in again? As far as I'm concerned, you can go for a long walk, preferably on a short pier. Well, oh, come on, Daphne, what's wrong? Your good friend Harry called, and he spilled the beans. Which beans? He said, quote, tell Joe he was right about those blondes. They're great, unquote. Blondes? That's what he said, <laughs> well? He didn't say blondes. He said bonds. Savings bonds. What? Sure. I buy them on the payroll savings plan. And I told Harry he ought to do it, too. Savings bonds have a guaranteed interest that pays back $4 for every three, which is a pretty good investment. That's a pretty good story, too. It's true, so help me. That's why Harry's so happy. Savings bonds are great. Well, maybe you're right. You wouldn't really fool around with blondes, would you? You're too faithful and sweet and kind and... Fast talking. We let Joe Trimble dig a grave up behind the house, and then we laid old Granby in it and covered him with dirt. I was pretty sure now that the old man had never had an extra dollar in his life and that he'd been killed for no reason at all. Now, in any way, Trimble had done a pretty thorough job of looking for the money, and he'd found nothing. On the ride into Dodge, I tried to figure out just what he was, but he didn't seem to fit anywhere. He wasn't a cowboy or a hunter or a 
gambler, or even just a drifter. Well, after we got him locked up in jail that night, Doc and I went over to the Long Branch for a drink with Kitty. And I was telling him about it. Now, how old is this fella, man? Well, around 25, I guess, Doc. Oh, well, then he couldn't be running away from home. <laughs> oh, he's a little old for that, Kitty. Yeah, well, anyways, he'll hang him. Well, I hope the judge agrees with you, Doc. And why shouldn't he? All I got so far is circumstantial evidence. Well, then you should have shot him out on the prairie. Well, it's a good thing you're not a lawman. Well, Doc. maybe if I were, there'd be fewer killings around here. <laughs> I doubt it. You going up to Hayes for the trial, Matt? Yeah, I have to. That'll take a week, I suppose. Oh, Bob, why? Nothing. Only you've just been away for ten days. <laughs> oh, I gotta earn a living, Kitty. Well, you could make more money gambling. Right here in Dodge. Oh, now, Kitty, don't start that again, will you? Good evening, Marshal. Miss Kitty, Doc. Major. I'd like a word with you, Marshal. Uh, Sure, Major, sure. Excuse us. Uh, We'll go to the bar there. I'll be back, Kitty. No hurry, Matt. Doc's got a lot of money. (laughs) I'll buy you a drink any time, Kitty. Well, that's the best offer today, Doc. Let's go, Major. I had to come to Dodge on other business, Marshal, but I wanted to pass the word to you that we're looking for a man. Oh, the army, you mean? Yes, a deserter. No? Not from Fort Dodge. Oh, where was he stationed, Major? He was with the 7th Cavalry at Fort Lincoln. Up in Dakota, huh? Mm-hmm. For some reason, they think he headed south. Now, I don't have much of a description of him, just that he was a private. About 25, curly blonde hair, a scar on his left hand. Well, that fits. What was his name? He enlisted as Joe Gould, but he's known to have used the name Trimble. Well, he's right here in Dodge, Major. He what? I got him locked up in jail. Well, that's fine, Marshal. But how did you know that... I think he murdered an old man who lives about a day's ride north of here, and I'm going to have him tried for it. That won't be necessary now, Marshal. I'll take over custody of him. Then he'd be tried at Fort Lincoln for desertion. I want him tried for murder. And I gotta be there to present the evidence. Well, you could go up to Fort Lincoln. No, Dakota's out of my territory, Major. Besides, this is a civil crime. The Army wants that man, Marshal. I'm sorry, Major. He's gonna be tried in the Hayes first. He's, he's still a soldier. Even if he did desert. Well, if the judge lets him off, you can have him. But not otherwise. Major, he tortured and hung an innocent old man. And I'm going to do my best to see him punished for it. I'll have to take this up with my superiors. Well, you better hurry. I'm going to haze with him tomorrow. I hope you won't regret this, Marshal. I won't, Major. Not if Trimble was properly punished, I won't. I didn't wait till morning, but started out for haze with Joe Trimble that night. The trial lasted a week. In spite of all the arguments I made, the judge finally decided that there wasn't enough real evidence to convict him. I even tried to make Trimble confess, but he was too smart for that, so there was nothing to do but bring him back and turn him over to the Army. I sent word to Fort Dodge, and the next morning, the Major himself appeared to take him into custody. Well, Marshal, looks as though you didn't have much of a civil case after all. Now, he killed old Granby. I know he did, but the law's a law, Major. Yes. And in the Army, orders are orders. But I'm sorry your judge didn't convict him after all. How's that, sir? Now, Chester. Yes, <laughs> sir. Uh, bring Trimble out, will you? Yes, sir. I will. Well, I'll give the Army credit for one thing, Major. What's that? Trimble and I rode back some 80 miles yesterday, and when we got here, he wanted to sit up and play cards with Chester. Well, there may be some bad men in the cavalry, Marshal, but they're all tough. Hey, Mr. Dillon. Alley's yours, Major. Private Trimble, sir. You're under military arrest, Private, and not privileged to salute. Besides, you enlisted as Private Gould, not Trimble. Yes, sir. Report to the guard outside. Yes, sir. Now, just a minute, Trimble. You know that you're mighty lucky, don't you? You should have died for what you'd done. (laughs) I told you I'd go free, Marshal. It'll catch up with you someday, Trimble. It always does, somehow. That's all I wanted to say. 
Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Marshal. I'll be getting along. Uh, Major, mm -hmm. you said you were sorry that the judge didn't convict him. Why have you changed your mind? Marshal, now he won't even be tried. Not for some months, anyway. Right. You mean that the Seventh doesn't want him anymore? Oh, they want him all right. My new orders are to send him right up to the Dakotas. Oh? Uh -huh. Seems that the Seventh Cavalry needs every man available. They're leaving Fort Lincoln soon on an expedition against the Sioux in the northern Cheyenne. The Sioux, huh? I wonder if old Sitting Bull is still the chief medicine man with him. I'm sure he is. But at any rate, the Seventh will be heading into Montana territory. Yeah. Not if they're after Sitting Bull's tribe, they will. He's always had a large camp over on the Little Bighorn. Yes, I know. Um, by the way, who's in command of the Seventh Cavalry now? An officer I served under a couple of years. I never did care for him much. A Colonel George Custer. and directed by Norman MacDonald stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Sound patterns were composed by Ray Kemper and Bill James. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear as Chester, Howard McNear as Doc, and Georgia Ellis as Kitty. George Walsh speaking. Join us again next week for another story of the western frontier of America in the 1870s on Gunsmoke. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Sugar Crinkles, the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet, is proud to present Gunsmoke. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke.
Gunsmoke, the story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Take it easy, Mom. You know your young folks are going to eat when you give them sugar crinkles for breakfast. Yes, boys and girls love sugar crinkles. And no wonder, it's the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Makes breakfast more fun than a circus. Now, the reason sugar crinkles suit young folks to a tea is this. Some sugar-coated cereals they've tried seem too sweet. Others don't seem sweet enough. But when they dip their first spoonful of sugar crinkles, mmm, they've discovered a sugar-coated cereal that's just right sweet. And say, those young folks of yours love to dip into the pack and eat sugar crinkles as a snack, too. So better get several packages. And now... Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. I got a horse to saddle, Mr. Dillon. I'm so hungry I could eat a whole hog. Well, all the hog you got this morning is cooking on that stick right there, Chester. Is it done? <laughs> that depends on how hungry you are. It's done. <laughs> sure will be good to get back to Dodge tonight and sleep in a bed again. Well, civilization's made you soft, Chester. Mm-hmm. Maybe so, but I get mighty tired of using my back for a mattress and my belly for a covering. <laughs> Obviously, Chester, you were born for greater things than rooting around on the prairie and living in the rain. It hasn't been raining, Mr. Dillon. No, no, it hasn't. But it will, Chester. Sooner or later, it'll rain. Yes, sir. Wish we brought some more bacon. Say, don't old man Granby live around here? Maybe we could borrow a little from him. Well, according to what I've always heard, old Granby wouldn't loan anybody anything. Mm. You really think he's a rich miser, like to say? Oh, I don't know, Chester. Sometimes a man's entirely different from his reputation. I only met Granby once or twice. He seemed like a nice enough old fellow, though. Well, I wouldn't want to live out here all alone with nothing but a few horses for company. Oh, he's used to it. Well, even if he does have a lot of money hid away, there's no place to spend it out here. Granby's pretty old for the pleasures Dodge has to offer, Chester. Well, I hope I am never that old. At the rate you're burning yourself out, Chester, you never will be, so don't worry about it. Oh, now, Mr. Dillon, I live mighty quiet for a young fellow who's free and still full of blood. <laughs> sure. Hey... Look over there. No? Huh? That string of dust laying right on the ground there. Yeah, I've been watching it, Chester. It's not on the ground, though. There's a dry wash runs along there. Somebody's driving stock down it. Maybe it's old man Granby. That may be. Let's go say hello, huh? All right, sure. If it is old man Granby, we... Might just ask him about a little bacon, huh? Well, we can ask. There's no harm in that. Oh. Oh. Now, that's horses down there, Chester. Yes, sir. I can see their heads now. I don't see anybody driving them. Now, he'll be along in a minute. Now, let's wait here. Here he comes. Yeah. Hello! He stopped. That's not old Granby. Let's ride down and say hello anyway. Oh. Now that's Granby's brand on those horses, though. He must have hired him a hand. Yeah, maybe. Oh. 
Hello. Hello. Are you working for Granby? I ain't working for nobody, mister. Oh? And where is he? Where is who? Granby. I don't know no Granby. Well, those are his horses you're driving. Oh, they are? Yeah. I ain't driving them. What do you mean? They got ahead of me in the wash here, that's all. I see. You a cowboy? Yeah, sure. I'm a cowboy. Well, how you don't look like one. You don't ride like one, either. You're asking the questions, mister. No decent cowboy would run another man's horses down a dry wash just because he didn't want to get up on the bank and ride around them. I told you, they got in front of me, is all. How come you're not carrying a gun? Does a man have to carry a gun? No. I'll bet you're the only man within a thousand miles of here who isn't carrying one. Maybe I got a better conscience than the rest of you. Maybe. Look, mister, you've run those horses about five miles off of old Granby's place. You want to give us a hand, we'll run them back. I'm in a hurry. It won't take long. The old man might be a couple of days finding them if we don't. You worry about him. I got to get in to Dodge. We'll ride in with you. Afterwards. I ain't going to do it. Look a lot better if you did. I, uh, I'd like to, mister, but I can't wait. I'm leaving now. So long. You going to let him go, mister? Wait Hill? a minute, Chester. I'll let him hear what lead sounds like. Now, don't shoot. Don't shoot me. All right, then ride back here. Don't kill me, mister. I'm not going to kill you. Unless you try to run away. Why would I try to run away? You just did. Chester. Yes, sir? Ride down the bank and have those horses off. Start them back up the wash. We'll be out of here by the time they're back. All right, Mr. Dillon. You stay right close to me, fella. And don't try anything smart. When we get to Granby's, if he says it's okay, then you can go wherever you like. I don't know Granby. Never been there. Well, we'll show you the way. Come on, let's get up on the bank. <laughs> Old man Granby can find his horses all right now, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. But I want this cowboy here to meet him. We'll see if he's in the house. I'll wait for you. Get off that horse, fella. Go on. That's better. Come on. We'll take a look. Well, what are you waiting for? Nothing. You go ahead, Chester. Yes, sir, Mr. John. Looks like I'll have to herd this man in. You've been kind of balky ever since we ran into you, mister. I don't like being dragged around. I never did. I just want you to meet old Granby. He'll be grateful for you. Up and run his horses back here. I know what you think, mister. You think I was stealing them horses. Well, I never heard of the old man. I was never near this place. Yeah, so you told me. But you're here now. I ain't afraid of you or nobody. Then let's go into the house. Come on. Mr. Dillon? Yeah, what is it, sir? Old man Granby, he... He's in there. Well, what's wrong? Right in the room there, Mr. Dillon. He's hanging there. What? Somebody's gone and hung him right in his own house. I, I don't want to see him anymore. You go take a look. Pull your gun and hold it on this man, Chester. If he makes a move, shoot him. Yes. Now, you just stand there real quiet like. I ain't gonna do nothing. You sure ain't. 
Just because I happen to be in the country don't mean I killed nobody. Mr. Dillon will decide about that. Who is this Mr. Dillon, anyway? He's a United States Marshal, that's who. A Marshal? Looks like you run into the wrong people, fella. I'll hold your gun, Chester. Search it. All right, you. Here. Get around. All right. Turn around. The house is all torn up. He must have been looking for old Granby's money. I was never in that house. There's nothing on him. Not a thing. All right, Chester. Here's your gun. Catch it. Thank you. All right, now, what's your name, fella? Tremble. Joe Tremble. Where are you from? Up north. Up north where? All over. What are you doing down here, Tremble? Making a change. Yeah, sure. And some cowboy you ran into told you about Granby being rich. So you came here and kicked the old man around and hung him. And then tried to find the money. That's a lie. This is the first time I was ever near the place. I'm sure you did it, Trumbull, but I wish I had more evidence. A court of law just might not convict you the way things stand. You gonna let me go? No. I'm arresting you. And you're gonna stand trial. And I'll do my best to see you hung. I didn't do it, I tell you. And I'll go free, too. You'll see. There's something mighty wrong about you, Trumbull, and I can't figure it at all. But I'll sure find out. Mother, it does your heart good, I know, when your young folks eat all of their breakfast cereal. That's why I'm so happy to tell you about new Sugar Crinkles. Sugar Crinkles, you know, is the sugar rice treat that's just right sweet. Crisp golden nuggets of sugar-coated rice. They make breakfast more fun than a circus. Why, young folks love Sugar Crinkles so much, they disappear like magic. Now, you've had experience with sugar-coated cereals that seem too sweet to you, and others that just don't seem sweet enough to the youngsters. Well, what a wonderful surprise sugar crinkles will be to your whole family. For new sugar crinkles really are just right sweet. Remember, sugar crinkles make great snacks, too. And there's even more good news about sugar crinkles. Right now, there's a full-size package of Charms, that wonderful fruit-flavored candy, in every special package of sugar crinkles your dealer has. Ten delicious fruit-flavored Charms free of extra cost to you. So hurry. Get sugar crinkles soon as you can. Now back to gun smoke. Let Joe Tremble dig a grave up behind the house. Then we laid old Granby in it and covered him with dirt. I was pretty sure now that the old man had never had an extra dollar in his life and that he'd been killed for no reason at all. Anyway, Tremble had done a pretty thorough job looking for the money and he'd found nothing. On the ride into Dodge, I tried to figure out just what he was. But he didn't seem to fit anywhere. He wasn't a cowboy or a hunter or a gambler or even just a drifter. After we got him locked up in jail that night, Doc and I went over to the Texas Trail for a drink with Kitty. And I was telling him about it. Now then, uh, this fella Trimble... uh... How old is he? Oh, around 25, I guess, Doc. Mm -hmm. Then he couldn't be running away from home. (laughs) No, he's a little old for that, Kitty. Well, anyway, they'll hang him. Well, I hope the judge agrees with you, Doc. Why shouldn't he? All I got so far is circumstantial evidence. But then you should have shot him out on the prairie. (laughs) 
It's a good thing you're not a lawman. Well, maybe if I were, there'd be fewer killings around here. Uh, I, I doubt that, Doc. You going up to Hayes for the trial, Matt? Yeah, I'll have to, Kitty. That'll take a week, I suppose. Oh, Bob. Why, yes. Nothing, only you've just been away for ten days. Oh, I have to earn a living, Kitty. You could make more money gambling right here in Dodge. Oh, now, Kitty, don't start that. Good evening, Marshal. Oh, Major. Ah, it's Kitty, Good Doc. evening, Major. Oh, I do, Major. I'd like a word with you, Marshal. Uh, sure, Major. So we can go over to the bar then. All right. Uh, I'll be back, Kitty, Doc. Uh, no hurry, Matt. Doc's got a lot of money. Oh, I, now I'll buy you one drink, Kitty. Just one drink, and that's all. Well, it's a start, Doc. <laughs> Let's go, Major. I had to come to Dodge on other business, Marshal. But I wanted to pass the word to you that we're looking for a man. Oh? The Army? Yes, a deserter. Oh? Not from Fort Dodge. Where was he stationed, Major? He was with the 7th Cavalry at Fort Lincoln. Oh, up in the Dakotas. Yeah, and for some reason they think he headed south. Now, I don't have much of a description of him, just that he was a private, about... Four twenty-five, curly blonde hair, and uh, he had a scar on his left hand. Yeah, that fits. What's his name, Major? He enlisted as Joe Gould, but he's known to have used the name Trimble. Uh huh. Well, he's right here in Dodge. What? I got him locked up in jail. <laughs> well, uh, that's fine, Marshal. But how did you know? I think he murdered an old man who lived a day's ride north of here. I'm going to have him tried for it. Now, that won't be necessary now, Marshal. I'll take over custody of him. No, no. Hmm? Then he'd be tried at Fort Lincoln for desertion. I want him tried for murder. And i got to be there to present the evidence. You could go up to Fort Lincoln. No, the Dakotas are out of my territory, Major. Besides, this is a civil crime. The Army wants that man, Marshal. I'm sorry, Major. He's going to be tried in Hayes first. He is still a soldier, even if he did desert. Well, if the judge lets him off, you can have him. But not otherwise. Major, he tortured and hung an innocent old man, and I'm going to do my best to see him punished for it. Well, I'll have to take this up with my superiors, Marshal. Uh, you better hurry. I'm going to haze with him tomorrow. I hope you won't regret this, Marshal. I won't, Major. Not if Tremble is properly punished. I won't. <laughs> I didn't wait till morning, but started out for Hayes with Joe Trumbull that night. The trial lasted a week, and in spite of all the arguments I made, a judge finally decided that there wasn't enough real evidence to convict him. I even tried to make Trumbull confess, but he was too smart for that. So there was nothing to do but bring him back, turn him over to the army. I sent word to Fort Dodge, and the next morning, the Major himself appeared to take him into custody. Well, Marshal, it looks as though you didn't have much of a civil case after all. Ah, he killed old Granby. I know he did, Major. But after all, the law's the law. Yes, and in the Army, orders are orders. I'm just sorry your judge didn't convict him after all. Now, is that so? Uh, Chester. Yes, sir? Bring Tremble out, huh? All right, you. Major, I'll give the Army credit for one thing. Mm -hmm. What's that? Tremble and I rode back some 80 miles yesterday, and when we got here, he (laughs) wanted to sit up and play cards with Chester. Uh, There may be some bad men in the cavalry, Marshal, but they're all tough. Here he is, Mr. Dillon. Well, he's yours, Major. Private Trimble, sir. You're under military arrest, Private. Not privileged to salute. Besides, you enlisted as Private Gould, not Trimble. Yes, sir. Report to the guard outside. Yes, sir. Uh, Just a minute, Trimble. You uh, know that you're mighty lucky, don't you? You should have died for what you've done. I told you I'd go free, Marshal. It'll catch up with you someday, Trumbull. It always does somehow. 
That's all I wanted to say. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Marshal. I'll be getting along. Oh, uh, Major, hmm? uh, you said that uh, you were sorry that the judge didn't convict him. Why have you changed your mind? Well, I have orders from General Terry to return him to the Dakotas, to Fort Lincoln. Well, he'll be tried there, but he won't be hung for just desertion. Now, oddly enough, Marshal, he won't even be tried. For some months, anyway. He won't? No. It seems that the 7th Cavalry needs every man available. They're leaving Fort Lincoln on an expedition against the Sioux in the northern Cheyenne. Oh, the Sioux, huh? Yeah. I wonder if old Sitting Bull is still the chief medicine man with him. Sitting Bull? Yeah. No, I never heard of him. But I expect the 7th will be heading into Montana territory. Well, if they're after Sitting Bull's tribe, they will. He's always had a large camp over on the Little Bighorn. That's so? Yeah. Oh, by the way, who's in command of the 7th Cavalry now? Oh, an officer I served under a couple of years. I never did care for him. A General Custer. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's adventure on Gunsmoke. You know, what you are tomorrow depends on what you eat today. So, Mother, be sure the big and little Indians at your house always eat a good breakfast. And tell me, what could be better for breakfast than Post Toasties? Post Toasties, you know, are the heap good cornflakes. The best thing that's happened to corn since the Indians discovered it. But all of the talking in the world couldn't tell you how downright delicious Post Toasties are. You have to taste those crackling crisp flakes. Yes, you have to taste that sweet kernel corn flavor toasted. Then you'll know how perfectly wonderful breakfast can be. Put Post Toasties on your shopping list right now, Mother. Just watch how your whole tribe goes for them. Remember, Post Toasties are the heat good cornflakes. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Sam Edwards and John Daner. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Ken Peters speaking. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Listen next week at this time when Gunsmoke will be brought to you by Post Toasties, the heat good cornflakes. Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour.